Order members, and we'll uh, return to the consideration stage of the Welfare Reform Bill. And uh, I call Mr. Peter Robinson. Mr. Speaker, I'm very grateful, and maybe should point out at the beginning that I rise to speak as uh, leader of the, the party, as opposed to speaking uh, in my capacity as First Minister. Uh, my uh, colleague and good friend, uh, the Minister for Social Development, will deal with the, uh, all of the executive uh, issues in relation to the bill. Uh, I think it is important at this uh, stage to register the fact that uh, the Assembly has much to be thankful for that we have reached the point when this bill can be brought uh, before members, uh, hopefully for uh, approval. Uh, since the Ulster Unionist Party and the Conservative Party uh, went forward in the 2010 election uh, on a policy of cutting expenditure in Northern Ireland as elsewhere, uh, and as they jointly went forward with a manifesto commitment that uh, they would uh, take an axe to uh, welfare uh, in the United Kingdom as a whole, it left those of us uh, in government here and those of us in the Assembly with a conundrum. Uh, the desire to ensure that uh, we did the very best that we could for those who are in need and uh, genuinely require support uh, on welfare issues, and at the same time uh, be able to provide the public services that are necessary in the context of the budget that was constrained by the Ulster Unionist Party and Tory commitment to cut uh, public spending. So that was the conundrum that we faced, uh, and uh, it was recognised, I, I think, uh, at an early stage, that if we were to uh, go off on our own, set up our own welfare system, that that would be massively costly uh, and would take money away from areas where it really could be beneficial. Uh, I don't want to go into what happened over that uh, two-year period, though if I were to do so, it would be uh, much to the, the praise of my uh, colleagues uh, uh, in terms of how they handled the, the matter. Sufficient to say that uh, when we got to the tail end of last year, there were some serious negotiations taking place as to how we would take this matter forward. Uh, in that uh, context, I think it is worth pointing out that at the end of last year there were two agreements. The one that is publicly known and uh, people can quote back to you and you will find it if you Google will be the Stormont House Agreement. But there was a second agreement, and that uh, agreement was the Stormont Castle Agreement, an agreement reached by the five executive parties dealing with a wide range of financial issues, uh, including a commitment to agree a budget, uh, including issues relating to the reduction of uh, the size of the public uh, service uh, payroll, and dealing with matters like corporation tax and, importantly, issues relating to welfare reform. All five parties signed up to that. Not only did they sign up to that Stormont Castle Agreement, but they then took the Stormont Castle Agreement and the leaders went down to meet with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and they sold the agreement to the Secretary of State as the way forward, which included, incidentally, a pitch for further uh, funds and uh, more flexibility. So, Whereas after the Stormont House Agreement, there were some parties who reserved their positions in some way, there was no reserving of positions in relation to the Stormont Castle Agreement amongst the five executive parties. All of them agreed to the specifics of welfare reform. And we did that after very detailed discussions about which each element of change would be made and how much it would be cost, costed. Now, I will, yes, happily. Uh, would the member just clarify, uh, when he refers to the Stormont Castle Agreement, how does that compare on welfare with the agreement that the First Minister told uh, us all about several months ago that he had previously reached with the Deputy First Minister? Could he shed some light on that? And could he shed some light on the claim from Sinn Féin that the agreement now reached amounts to I think the figure is £565 million pounds over six years. Is that correct? Well, uncharacteristically, the, the member is uh, being mischievous 
Uh, I'm not uh, in the, the business of rubbing anybody's nose in it, scoring party points on these issues. The architecture is exactly the same. It is a GB system plus enhancements. That's what we proposed back 18 months to two years ago. That is the outcome of uh, the agreement that we now have. In the agreement that we offered back 18 months to two years ago, uh, we had a sum of money in addition to removing bedroom tax that we were prepared to look at in terms of how we could uh, have enhancements. What the Stormont Castle Agreement did was define how that money should be spent and it looked at the individual uh, areas where improvements could be, uh, could be made. In terms of the, the overall figure, uh, I haven't got the paper in front of me, but there's no particular secrecy uh, about the, the amounts. Uh, though there is a, a, a caution, I think, that anybody looking at the figures uh, should, uh, should have, in that, unlike many other areas of government spending, uh, welfare payments depend on those who are applying so it's a demand-led cost, and therefore you can never be too accurate in terms of what the, the cost may, may be. Uh, in relation to what DSD had indicated previously would be the cost, uh, it went up from, uh, I think, 13 million to 87 million to 114 million in the next financial year. It then moved to 250 million and over 370 million in the, the following year after that would have been the penalties that we would have had from moving away uh, from the, the GB system. Uh, we have what roughly comes out at a cost of uh, an average of about 90 million pounds a year over that six year period. But many of us are hopeful that that will be reduced to an average of 70 million because in my view, the bedroom tax issue will have to be resolved at a UK level uh, and therefore there would be a saving of over £20 million to Northern Ireland uh, if that were to, to come about. Uh, I offer those figures only in terms of uh, openness. They don't particularly relate to the uh, issue that I want to uh, address, which arises out of uh, the comments made by uh, Mr Beggs. Uh, regrettably, the member obviously thought he was on such weak ground that he wasn't prepared to, to give way. I mean, there are conventions that are generally recognised uh, in debating chambers that a, a member would give way to someone on the, the front bench, but he chose not to because he recognised that uh, he would have a difficulty in responding to any point that was made to him. It was noticeable that when my friend, the member for uh, East Antrim, Mr Wilson, asked him to give way on a different issue later on, he was happy to do that, but he wasn't willing to give way on this issue because uh, he recognised the weakness of his case. Uh, and I have to say it is particularly disturbing that we have someone who has uh, the responsibility as a deputy speaker in this house who clearly doesn't understand, and that's the best interpretation I can put on it, who doesn't understand the, the rules of the house in relation to petitions of concern. Uh, I'll come to that uh, in a moment, but I think it's perhaps important in the context of this group of amendments that we understand uh, the, the nature of what the issues were that were discussed yesterday at the Implementation uh, Leaders Group in terms of what would uh, be the, the outcome of today's debate. Uh, when we uh, agreed uh, at Stormont Castle uh, a range of issues in relation to uh, welfare and the cost that would be uh, imposed, the Finance Minister then quite rightly went off and prepared his budget based on that, a budget which was accepted by the, the Executive and which is now going through its various processes uh, in the House. So we have now set in stone, as it were, what the expenditure will be on each area of government. Uh, and in terms of uh, welfare issues, it is uh, already set up in the, the, the budget as what the cost will be for us uh, in the next financial year. Therefore, any changes that any member brings forward by way of uh, an amendment that have a cost attached to it will either not be fully implemented because of the lack of funds to do so, or else it will take money away from welfare payments elsewhere. Or indeed, maybe somebody wants to take money out of the health service or the education service or elsewhere. If they, if they stand up and put forward an amendment which costs money, as some of these in this set of amendments do, then they have a duty to tell us how much it is going to, to cost, because presumably nobody would be so rash as to bring forward a, an amendment on an issue like this without having it costed. I'm sure they've gone to the officials within the department and said, look, 
here's the amendment that uh, we want to, to push. What would the cost be if that were to be implemented, and how would it be paid for? So I, I hope that uh, someone from the Ulster Unionist benches, uh, or indeed from the SDLP benches, who have, uh, um, I, I, I will give away, just let me finish the, the sentence, who have put down these amendments, will be able at a later stage to sell it, tell us precisely how much their amendment is going to cost and how it is going to be paid for. I'll give way to the member. I thank the member for giving way. And the member has outlined that the Stormont Castle Agreement uh, detailed how the top-up payments would be spent, what areas of welfare it would cover. To the best of my knowledge, that has not been made public. So when members come forward with amendments, um, we may well be coming forward with amendments that are, are top-ups. Uh, that are proposed in the Stormont Castle Agreement, but without sight of them, um, we can't make that judgment. So, will the Stormont Castle Agreement be published? Well, can I, say the I, I completely forgive him. Uh, I don't expect him to be held by any of the agreements reached by five parties around the table that he wasn't a party to. Uh, and of course, uh, he and other members who were not party to that agreement will want to put forward uh, amendments uh, and improve the, uh, the agreement. Indeed, I have to say, that I'm not simply saying that we did an agreement back there at the end of last year and therefore nothing but that agreement can go through this House. Because uh, if there are improvements that can be made, then it was up to each of the parties to bring whatever improvement they thought could be made to the implementation body that was set up with all of the leaders present in it and see if they could get agreement from the other leaders around the table. And that was done. And Surprisingly, it was done by the Ulster Unionist Party. The Ulster Unionist Party had six amendments that they wanted to make to this bill. And unlike the remarks made by the member for East Antrim, Mr. Beggs, and uh, I, I'll perhaps give him the benefit of the doubt and say that perhaps somebody wrote his speech. I noticed he was reading, so I suspect somebody wrote his speech and he was reading out the research of somebody else because if he had actually read beforehand what he was going to say, he would know that it was inaccurate. Because as a Deputy Speaker, I'm sure he read the petition of concern that went into the uh, Speaker's office. I'm sure he saw that the two Ulster Unionist amendments, Amendment 34 and Amendment 35, were not included in the petition of concern. Yet he told the House that we had a petition of concern to block all amendments which wasn't the case. We had agreed at the... Well, I'll give the member a bit more to, to answer and then I'll, I'll give way to him. Uh, at, the, at the meeting yesterday of the implementation group, the leader of his party came forward with six amendments, agreed during the course of that meeting, in the full spirit of what I would have expected from him and from the Ulster Unionist Party, that they would uh, have the two amendments brought forward, which the rest of the group, the other four parties, had agreed with, and that we would go through the lobbies in support, indeed, if it's necessary to go through the lobbies and it isn't agreed uh, on a voice uh, call, and that we would support those two amendments. And the other four amendments that they have put down, he considered, and I think he's right in considering, that they were probing amendments, uh, a strategy very often used uh, in other debating chambers where members want to pin the minister down to put something on Hansard as to how initially it's going to be handled. And these were probing amendments where the minister was quite happy and during yesterday's meeting made it clear that he was prepared to give the satisfactory explanation. Uh, and on that basis, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party indicated that they would withdraw their motion or not move their motion depending on where it uh, was situated in a, a group. So all of the issues raised by the Ulster Unionist Party were dealt with. And I just cannot understand how a petition of concern going down affects that in any way. Because a petition of concern okay. put down, which included an amendment which was going to be withdrawn or not moved, would have no impact. If you don't have a vote on it, the petition of concern isn't relevant. So the two issues where there was five-party agreement on the change are not included in the petition of concern, and therefore the comments that he made are totally inaccurate. I'll give way to the Honourable Member. The, the Member seems to be making a big, big issue that instead of making 50 petitions of concern and, and blocking them into the, the business case, he only actually made 48. 
The point I was making was that it was a ridiculous number of petitions of concern which is preventing this House from coming to a decision and a conclusion. And I, if he had been in and listening to much of what I was saying in the course of my uh, speech, I was always balancing that there is a cost and there is a benefit, and I was pointing out that we cannot deliver everything that some people would wish. Would the member not accept that? Except that that uh, was uh, what the member was doing. I was here, listen to the, the member berate these benches for being undemocratic, uh, for putting down peti a petition of concern against all the amendments. Read the Hansard uh, and the member will see it. But let's explore his argument. His argument is that somehow the Assembly should be free to decide for itself, each member, as to what the outcome should be in any amendment. If we did that, if we carry that to its logical conclusion, we wouldn't have an agreement, because my colleagues are asked to go through the, the lobbies on things that, in short, they would prefer not to go through the lobbies on, not on this bill so much, but on, on other aspects of the Stormont House agreement. And the whole thing about an agreement is that you agree to give a bit in one area to take a lot in another. That's what an agreement uh, is about. So if you put forward the proposition that somehow you have a Stormont House agreement, and then you have a free-for-all in the Assembly, you won't have an agreement. And who told us that best of all? Who was the one that spelt that out for us all? None other than the leader of his party. Because he will remember, and if he doesn't remember, I'm going to remind him about it. Because his leader came out, berated Sinn Féin and the SDLP and everybody else, and said, this isn't a case of renegotiating these matters. If you start to try and renegotiate, then it's going to unravel. Does a member remember what his leader said? Because that's what exactly would happen if we then put the, the agreement out for a free-for-all in this assembly. What we are here to do is to honour the agreement that we reached with the other parties at Stormont Castle uh, and later endorsed uh, at Stormont uh, House. So I, I trust that the, the member will be man enough to admit that he was inaccurate in the remarks that he, he made that it was nonsensical of them to put forward the free-for-all uh, argument because you simply wouldn't have an agreement. And I remind them that the consequences of not having this agreement are twofold. Number one, it was tied in directly to the devolution of corporation tax. We had to get the budget resolved and we had to get welfare reform resolved. The member and his party would, uh, if one was to listen to some of them on television, claim to be the, uh, in the vanguard, the promoters of corporation tax. Mind you, I can recall the leader of their party standing up and telling us that we had to move on to Plan B, that corporation tax wasn't uh, uh, coming as a power to the devolved institution. But that's what we were told. And here, very clearly, anybody who would vote against the budget, anybody who would vote against welfare reform, is voting against the introduction uh, of uh, corporation tax setting powers. Uh, to Northern Ireland. The second impact, of course, that it would have uh, if uh, members can cast their mind back to the period before we had uh, the Stormont House negotiations. This assembly was going down. Make no mistake about it, the disagreements were such that they could not be resolved. The financial costs of welfare would have been at such a level that we could not have sustained an executive because it would have been taking such a significant sum of money away from key frontline services. So while some members might want to sit back, and I perhaps direct myself more at the SDLP than I do at others, might want to sit back and uh, a la carte go through the Stormont House Agreement and say, we'll have a bit of that, not so much of that, and maybe a bit more of that would be, would be nice. Uh, that isn't the way you honourably implement uh, an agreement. Uh, and of course, if you're a smaller party and your votes aren't required to get a majority from both sections of our community in the, uh, the, the lobbies, then you can have that luxury of uh, pretending to be in opposition when you know that nothing will come from your words of, of opposition. But the truth of it is this, that if people genuinely want to move forward in Northern Ireland, then it is important that this legislation goes through. It's important that parties uphold the agreements that all of us reached at Stormont Castle uh, and that we move forward on that basis. Because if I ever have to sit down to negotiate again 
I will look at the people that I'm negotiating with on the basis of did they deliver on the last occasion? Were they prepared to implement the last uh, agreement that uh, we, we reached? Uh, and I really trust that members take that seriously, uh, even if they have their fling today by putting forward uh, amendments. I hope when the final votes are taken that we will have all members going through the lobbies in support of this legislation uh, and hopefully therefore bolstering uh, the position that we have with this uh, assembly. I, I, I just, if I can say to the, the SDLP, in terms of this set of uh, amendments, I think that the, the Minister made a very powerful argument yesterday that uh, in terms of data protection, in terms of the flexibility that departmental guidance gives rather than having the rigid uh, legislation uh, that he has to, to work around is a much better way to go forward. It doesn't uh, obviate the need for them to stand up and to argue their case and to, to press the, the minister as to whether he's going to deal with very, uh, various issues. And I say to the, the, the member who's now talking to his colleague that uh, I have no difficulty uh, in supporting the kind of committee, though it isn't a matter for this legislation. You don't set up an assembly committee through a DSD legislation. So I have no difficulty in having the continuing monitoring uh, and observation of how the welfare reform proposals are working out, and that will inform any future decisions that we have to, to take. But that's a matter for this assembly, not a matter for this debate or this legislation. So I, I hope when my colleague indicates, as he no doubt will, that the various amendments that are down in this category can be better dealt with in a different manner, that uh, members will accept that and will keep to the agreements that they have reached, be honourable members of the Assembly and stick to the deal that they have done. Thank you. And I call Mr Ali Gatwood. Um, uh, thank you, Mr um, Deputy uh, Speaker. Um, could I just uh, start by actually touching on the last point of um, the DUP leader's contribution, and it will be my first point in my contribution. And uh, it is this, and we've had this conversation with the Minister, and it remains our approach uh, in this chamber today, and it is this, that based upon some of the conversations we had with the Minister, um, and uh, subject to him saying uh, what I think he is minded to say in respect of some of the amendments, it may be that we won't move some of the amendments. There may be a second category of amendments where if the Minister shows some better authority over the course of the next number of hours, either to accept our amendments or to indicate what might come forward at further consideration stage or otherwise, we might move amendments. But there will be a third category of uh, amendments, uh, Mr Speaker, and could I, in passing, uh, congratulate you on your uh, on your nomination, I'm probably the last member in the House to do so, but um, uh, I do congratulate you, uh, dis dis despite my concerns about how that all happened. But putting that aside, you have demonstrated thus far good authority in your role and your commitment to uh, uphold the standards of the previous Speaker. Uh, but there will be a third category of amendments where I would anticipate that we'll not be in agreement, not be in agreement with uh, uh, the Minister's words or uh, reassurances if there are any forthcoming. And that's how we'll adopt. That's the approach that we will adopt. And the reason why we will adopt that approach, Mr. Speaker, is that we are paid and elected to be members of a legislative assembly. That was denied to many generations of Democrats in this part of Ireland over many a long year denied to them, and we're all the worse that the fact of the, to the, because of the fact that a democratic chamber did not exist here in order to answer the needs of our people. But today we are members of a legislative assembly. We are not members of a limp assembly, of a limp assembly. And that difference has to inform this debate, that we are MLAs, and I hope that all of us in this chamber live up to that standard uh, today because we need to guard it jealously because what we have secured in the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement and other agreements were one, 
through hard democratic struggle and negotiation, and that we should value them at all times, not least given the circumstances around welfare and the ambitions of the Tory government and the ambitions of the next Tory government if they are uh, re-elected. So this, we have to send out a message today to our people that this is not a theatre, that this is not a talking shop, that this is not a limp assembly, but this is a legislative assembly, and that nobody has the right to usurp that authority from any party or from any member. Uh, when I heard that the DUP, Mr Speaker, had tabled the petitions of concern, I, I wondered if this was uh, Northern Ireland's gubu moment. You will remember, other members will remember that phrase in terms of another legislature or another politics on this island. But I concluded it wasn't a gubu moment. It was just unbelievable and unprecedented what the DUP had chosen to do. Because whilst the uh, First Minister, the DUP leader, is correct to say that not every amendment was petitioned, virtually every amendment was petitioned. And it is unprecedented in the life of this Assembly that that sort of weapon has been deployed against that scale and volume of amendments. Utterly, well, they're, they're from the back benches, from a secondary position, thanks for giving it to us. Right? That's how they view the legislative authority of, that, of this Assembly. Thanks for giving to the backbench DUP member the power to not just block one or two amendments, but to block virtually all of the amendments. What is the state of Northern Ireland regional democracy that a party thinks, thanks for giving it to us, the power to ride a coach and horses through amendment after amendment? That's why it's unprecedented. Though I note what the uh, First Minister, the DUP leader, um, said in, uh, in his last remarks about where this debate might yet go, and I, I travel in a little bit more hope as a consequence. But never before in the life of this chamber has there been such a swinging attempt to close down and shut down what might be good law for the people of this part of the world uh, when it comes to a, I will, when it comes to uh, uh, petitions of concern. Would the member agree with me that it's not the power that you have that is the measure of a party, it's how you use it? And even if the likes of us, uh, First Minister, DUP leader, are, are reduced, as you indicated, and that, uh, what did you refer this to, uh, um, a free-for-all uh, and words of that nature, um, at least we're trying to live up to the democratic authority given by the people to this assembly when it was endorsed in the Good Friday Agreement, rather than using a weapon to deploy relentlessly against amendment after amendment after amendment. Would the member, give way? Yes. Uh, would the member, uh, would the member agree with me that given the DUP's propensity for dotting I's and crossing T's, would he care to speculate uh, what would have happened had the shoe been on the other foot? I would like to think it would have been different. Um, uh, yeah, well, actually, could I just confirm? Because it seems to have been missed. It seems to have been missed. Um, it was my decision in relation to the driving license. I know that you've visited all that misery <coughs> upon my, my, my successor, but it was actually my decision because I don't believe that, in the context that we were in that time in this part of the world, that when it comes to the issue of flags, that a flag the size of that on a UK named driving license. Uh, was a proportionate response in the difficult politics that we expect at that time. But put, 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 putting that aside, putting that aside the, the unbelievable part of what the DUP have done in respect of the petition of concern is that we have spent two years, and in this all members are right, we have spent two years getting to this point, and we owe it to those who have rep made representations to us, who have lobbied us, who have argued for mitigation, who have travelled this long journey with us. We have 
we, we, it is unbelievable to them, I think, that a swinge in use of petitions of concern would be deployed in the way that it has. Um, I, may, I normally don't play the man. I normally try to play the ball. I see that the DUP's leader's speech was very much about playing the man. But if I were to make a comment in that regard, if I were to make a comment in that regard, it is that some time last night, uh, Peter Robinson threw his toys out of the plan, out of the pram, and didn't even keep hold of his rattle. That's what happened uh, around six or seven o'clock last night. Let me make this absolutely clear. Even in the comments of the, of, uh, the DUP leader, it seems to me that he is, uh, and he mightn't agree with this, it seems to me that he's beginning to pull back from some of the contentions that he has made heretofore, because he said that there were people, parties, who, quote, reserved their position in some ways in respect of uh, the Stormont negotiations. And I think he is right. Because let me make it absolutely clear on behalf of the SDLP, the notion, the notion that when it comes to all of the Stormont negotiations, that the only amendments that can come to this floor are amendments agreed up in room 106 in that corner of this building is ludicrous and unacceptable and that we will not live to that principle. Yeah. I'm coming to the bill. I'm sure you are. Uh, and actually, I mean, I recognise, and, and you, you will recognise, I give you some latitude, you were responding to previous comments, and that's fair enough. Where we are today in this assembly, you know, we have agreed certain procedures. That may change in the future. But every petition of concern, every amendment was legitimate, it was compatible, and it complied with uh, the arrangements we have agreed at this point in time. So, you know, I think in terms of the bill, it is time that we were discussing the detail of that, and that, for me, is about the present and the future. So, possibly enough has been said about the past. Uh, well, could I just make this closing remark in respect to that, that contribution? And it is on the past. Um, members of this House will know that when it came to the storm negotiations and when it came to its outcome, among many points of dispute that we had with the outcome was in respect to proposals on the past. And the most acute of all those was the proposal about how we should deal with issues around themes, policies and practices of the past. And we do not agree with Stormont House in respect of that, because in our view, the vested interest both within terror organisations and with state organisations prevailed in Stormont House to ensure that very little is going to happen in terms of a proper interrogation of themes, policies and practices from the past, which are part of the narrative of the present and the future. That's our view. And the notion that, uh, that we can go to victims and survivors individually or organisationally and say to them that if we can't get uh, a group of four people up in that room agree to amendments in respect to that issue before it comes to the chamber, we'll just have to swallow. Well, we will not be saying that to victims and survivors individually or organisationally, yes. What the leader of my party said and listen to what he has just said and his leader is sitting behind him. Can I ask the member, is he in the business of implementing the Stormont House Agreement and does he distance himself then from what my leader said in relation to what his leader agreed to in relation to the Stormont Castle proposals? So, and, and the answer to that is the answer that we've given every time and it is this, that we will implement as fully and faithfully as I can that which is strong in the Stormont negotiations and we will try to correct and rectify that which is less strong. And that, on that basis, that, can we return, please, yeah. to the consideration <laughs> stage of the welfare reform? Um, so, so uh, uh, there was somebody once said, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, he demanded the right to dissent because there was much to dissent from. It seems that that maxim has been forgotten in our politics, even though generations who serve this community, who serve this community well, demanded the right to dissent because there was much to dissent from, and were far the better, were far, were far the, the better uh, for it. Um, could I also uh, uh, say, um, in response to the comments made by the representative of the Alliance Party, and this does take us back, Mr. Speaker, 
uh, to the amendments. Uh, uh, Mr. Dixon. I've already invited you twice now to move on, and I don't want to have to do it for a third time. But, but this is, I am coming back to the core of the amendments, uh, because our amendments, and I think it's probably best to explain this to the House, uh, try to develop thinking and practice around three themes, uh, some of which were touched upon by the, the, the leader of the DUP in his concluding remarks. One, if you talk to people in the welfare world, uh, and I would concur with many of them, they believe that if the Tories are re-elected, universal credit will fall flat at its face because George Osborne as Chancellor will come in and say, why have we spent all this time, money, failure on IT in order to deliver a universal credit system that doesn't do what it's meant to do? And for the Tories and the high Tories in government in London, what it is meant to do is reduce welfare baselines and increase penalties. And that informs our amendments, Mr uh, Speaker. It is about trying to protect the claimant on their journey through the system so that they are maxim, maxed out in terms of their benefit entitlement and that when it comes to penalties, um, they are minimised in that journey and that all of that is subject to appropriate oversight. And that is the themes that run through all of this. And we should be warning ourselves, cautioning ourselves, Mr Speaker, that when it comes to the amendments in Group 1 and thereafter, and, and this is where I am now going to talk directly to those amendments, we should caution ourselves that unlike Mr Dixon's, whose opening remarks was that this was all scaremongering. Scaremongering is what he referred to as much of this. Well, I'd refer Mr Dixon and anybody else who has the time to go and just spend a little bit of time reviewing the evidence that has emerged in respect of the rollout of universal credit, not over the last two years or the last 18 months or the last 12 months, but over the last five weeks through you, Mr Speaker, over the last five weeks, where a select committee of the House of Commons has been taking evidence in respect of what's happening in terms of welfare reform. And anybody who reads any of that would have to conclude that those who say to this House and say to welfare claimants and say to welfare organisations that this is scaremongering should today hang their head in shame and go and read the Hansard record of what is happening in the Select Committee in London. This is what it's saying. Matthew Oakley. Now, who is Matthew Oakley? Well, he's actually the independent reviewer for sanctions appointed by DWP. He's their man. And their man says um, to the Select Committee in the opening week of January of this year that it would be wise for the government to undertake a general stock take of the system in view of the extent to which it has changed over the past two parliaments. Their own insider is telling people, would you go off and have another look at it? Because the weight of evidence coming from people working within the welfare offices who are beginning to talk about how pressure has been applied to them to reach targets in order to impose penalties, and the fallout in terms of people who are disappearing out of the welfare system because the journey is too difficult for them and the penalties are too harsh to the point that nobody knows where they're going, and so on and so forth. That's not scaremongering. That, Mr Dixon, is evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee, not just from individuals within the welfare system, not just from an insider who's uh, been employed by DWP to give best advice, even from those who are managing people in, in, in terms of work programmes. They're all saying it. So, so I will in a second, Mr Wilson. So the point is that if that's what a select committee is hearing in Westminster every week over the last number of weeks, should we not take time this week in order to apply our minds to anticipate the harshness of what will follow if the Tories are re-elected in terms of further penalties, further punitive, further collapse of the benefit a cap, and so on and so forth. I'll give way to Mr Wilson. Would he also accept that the other side of that evidence is that people who had languished on long-term unemployment 
and all of the consequences that that has for their income, their families and everything else, that 50% of them are now being placed in work. That's the positive side of the changes. And I don't dispute that. Um, I, I was, um, I was uh, uh, um, by, by implicitly being criticised by um, one of the Sinn Féin members this morning for being the minister that brought in some welfare reform. Yes, that's right. And I went off and I read the debate over, over lunchtime. I'd urge you to read that debate as well and see everything that I put down in respect of my commentary, both in terms of that welfare bill in June 2010 and the statement I made to the House in November 2010. In respect, in respect well, let me deal with it. Um, uh, because we don't dispute, Mr. Wilson, that there is a need to simplify the welfare system to intensify working with claimants in order to try to maximise their skills and job opportunities. They don't get any dispute from that. But don't you pretend to me that that's what London is doing. Six years on, universal credit reputation in tatters. The integration of the six working age benefits into universal credit is far behind schedule, with tens of millions of pounds of IT investment already written off and much more to come. The National Audit Office verdict has been damning, describing weak management, ineffective control and poor governance, with both ministers and civil servants coming in for severe criticisms. External experts, many of whom support the principles behind universal credit, are unsure of whether the system can ever be made to work even several years later. That's one commentary um, from an expert in terms of welfare reform, and I could and I won't read out multiple ones because you wanted me to get back to the bill. So the question is, if that's the narrative, if this is a, if this is a crash that the Tories fail to recognise, except I think the Chancellor, we owe it to everybody to take time today to try to get some more of this, some more of this right. And if we don't, um, then we will repent in leisure. Uh, as we see the full scale of what um, London intends to, uh, intends to propose. Um, uh, could I turn then to the amendments? I don't intend to make uh, uh, many comments about the amendments, Mr. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, uh, uh, except to, to, to highlight a number of things. I'd, I'd say to the Minister, and, and I've had this conversation with him already, that we have tried to build into. Uh, could I just say to also to Mr. Mr. Robinson, um, uh, it was left le to me. You, you wouldn't have known the scale of amendments that the bill would have on this table this morning, this afternoon. But we actually were quite measured in it, in that we recognised um, that uh, uh, there was cost consequences in relation to amendments from <coughs> us and from other people. To the point that if you actually look at our amendments when it comes to the cost consequences, there's very few of them that have significant cost consequences in our view. And we tried to craft it in a different way based upon maximising support to the claimant, minimising penalties and maximising oversight on the far side of the claimant journey. So if we could just go to, uh, to that point, that's why we have put in, I will in a second, that's why we've put in a reference to um, uh, 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 department having regard, due regard for the claimant's skills, experience, caring responsibilities in physical and mental health. And that issue about mental health is a theme that's tracked through three or four of our amendments. And we would say to the Minister, if you accept that uh, the profile <coughs> of mental health in the North is as acute as it is, one in ten of our people one in ten of our people are on disability benefit. It's one in five in Britain. Um, if you are going to protect those people and also protect those in the welfare system who are conducting the interviews and making the assessments, then one way of protecting everybody is to say to them, you have a statutory responsibility to look at the issues of skills, experience, care responsibilities, and physical and mental ill health to say it to your own staff, for Mr. O'Reilly to say it to his staff, and I know a lot of these staff. I shouldn't have mentioned, I apologise, I shouldn't mention the official, um, but I mentioned it positively. 
Um, but I, I apologise, I would draw that name. Um, but the point is that the head of the Social Security Agency, who shall remain unknown for, unnamed for now, the, uh, I know these staff because I was in that seat once. Right? Only for a year. And, and when I heard uh, people beaten up on Social Security Agency staff because they were off on uh, sick stress, right? I, I remember what I said to some of the people who came out with that claim at that time. These people on the front line with people in need, some of whom are going to be belligerent uh, and they needed our protection. Um, but they need to be protected so that not through our system, but if the heavy hand of DWP starts coming, looking over here about setting targets, about penalties and punishments on the claimant, we need to protect our staff from the heavy hand from London. If you want evidence to corroborate that argument, who would have thought a number of years ago that when it came to welfare reform, London would suddenly decide that we're going to impose all these penalties to a point that Theresa Villiers was unable to answer the question of why this, the penalties were 87 million at that time. If you want corroboration, go and look at the questions Mark Durkin uh, 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 offered to a Treasury Minister at the uh, committee that's dealing with the Corporation Tax Bill in London last week where the minister would not commit himself to say that they would not use the heavy hand of London again in order to ensure that in the context of devolution of corporation tax, we didn't have a balanced, balanced budget and a sustainable basis for the budget. Go and read what a London Treasury minister said or did not say to Mark Durkin in a House committee just a week ago. So let's not be naive. If London can, London will try to impose its will on our system. And the best way of ensuring that they don't is to put into our law the protections of our staff and the protections of our claimants that would, be, would in our view, arise from having due regard for the claimant's skills, experience, caring responsibilities and physical and mental health. When we were negotiating, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the police ombudsman, uh, and we're trying to convince Morris Hayes to go for a maximum position in relation to the police ombudsman. It seems a long time ago now. We made the point, it wasn't me, it was Seamus Mallon, I was just in the margins, at a meeting in, uh, in September of whatever year it was in Cambridge at the British Irish Association Conference, where we said a good system of police complaints was a sword against those who were on the wrong side of good practice and a shield for those who were on the right side of good practice. It's the exact same now. It's the exact same <clears throat> now. We can protect our claimants and we can protect our staff uh, in the event that London con should come seeking. I will in a second. But over and above all that, over and above all that, if there has been experience in the rollout of universal credit, that when it comes to the assessments around those, uh, around assessments, including mental health, then without giving any increased priority to due regard to mental health, then there should be recognition of that as an issue affecting a lot of our claimants in order to ensure that our staff in the SSA do all that they do when they come to the assessments to make sure that that matter is taken into account. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I wonder could he just explain to the House this uh, narrative that if we place something in legislation, it puts uh, some onus or responsibility or obligation on the United Kingdom government not to touch us. It's a nonsense. If we put something in legislation, the only people who are under an obligation will be the executive here in Northern Ireland. Nobody else. So how do you send uh, Mr. Robinson a message to London that it's hands off our welfare system? Let me, let me, uh, oh, right. Uh, like, I was in the Social Security Agency, and one of my uh, observations around my one year 
or sorry, DSD, one of my observations was that too often, too often, I had the sense that DSD was more an outreach for DWP than it was actually the DSD department of the Northern Ireland Executive. Don't, let's not be naive about this. DWP is uh, the shadow over all of uh, DSD in the SSA. And whilst I have the immense respect for our staff and its leadership and its management, including the child services, uh, where there were some extremely committed uh, uh, people, let's, let's be very clear. We know to our cost of how London tries to impose its will and will not face up to the particular circumstances here in Northern Ireland. Is not that what the penalties are about? Is not that what the failure to, uh, for them to enter into negotiations down in Stormont was about? It was, you will stand and deliver. And on the far side of the election, there will be more stand and deliver if the Tories get re-elected. So why do we why do we build maximum protections into our law? Because we need to legislate in order to ensure that we do it right here and legislate in order to send a message to London that we're not going to do it in the way that they might choose. If you take the, the, the logic of uh, Mr. Robinson's argument, um, we should just put everything in guidance. You know, any, any advice that we're given to the Social Security Agency, the child support, sector and all the rest, but just put it in uh, guidance. We put it in the, maximum, the pace of maximum protection, which is the primary law, and not the primary law and the regulations, and if the Minister can reassure us on some of that matter later on, then, then, then we might be minded not to move um, some, of our, uh, some of our amendments. Could it also deal with um, the thinking behind Amendment 13, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Speaker? Uh, which is the amendment that tries to move, to, to broaden the provisions in respect of uh, domestic violence and to instance motivated by hate. That, this issue of instance motivated by hate is a, a one uh, that has immense public profile. It had, has had it over the last number of days. Uh, look at the disgraceful attack on the King's Mill Memorial and other instances. And it has been a narrative over the last uh, period of time. And indeed, indeed, if you go and speak, and I say this now without, without um, trying to open up another debate, but uh, if you speak to people uh, from uh, the, Rainbow, Ra the Rainbow Project, they will say that because of recent publicity, around certain issues uh, when it comes to discrimination or alleged discrimination, there's been an increased instance of attacks on people uh, from the LGBT community. Um, so this issue of hate in our society is something that I think we just need to try to broaden our thinking on, and that is the purpose of the amendment. Uh, we tried to draft words. I know that Sinn Féin at one stage tried to draft words in respect of how uh, that provision might work, and it's very difficult. That's why we've said to the Minister, uh, bring forward regulations in order to capture more than domestic violence, and in that regard, be informed by the police and the prosecuting authorities as to what is the right shape in, in regulations when it comes to uh, the issue of hate and how it is managed through uh, the welfare, uh, the welfare um, system. Um, could I then just uh, quickly move on and uh, deal with uh, Amendment 53? Um, it, it, it seems to me that uh, this is a moment in our history when you can send out messages of deep authority when it comes to uh, sectors of our community that, for various reasons, are vulnerable. It's true in terms of the provision that we have proposed on hate, and it is true in terms of the provisions in New Clause uh, uh, 53. 
which is the impact of regulations on victims and survivors. Again, a, a clause that we uh, struggled with defining in the best possible way, because this issue about victims and survivors is a contentious one, and there, there's matters of dispute in terms of definition. That's why we left it in the way that it is drafted, that uh, uh, in consultation with the Victims Commission, uh, provisions could be brought forward. Because I, I believe that there is no dispute in this chamber that when it comes to victims and survivors, there is a requirement to try to legislate or provide for in the best possible way. Let us take the opportunity to do that on the face of, that, of the Bill and in that way send out uh, a message to all those sectors uh, that, for whatever reasons, feel or are vulnerable, that in terms of welfare we are going to um, uh, provide, uh, provide uh, protections. Um, I understand that uh, Mr Ramsey is going to speak in terms of Amendment 17, uh, bringing forward an independent living fund uh, uh, structure. The Minister will know that in Scotland uh, that they have an equivalent fund, that they have gathered uh, 5.5 million of their own monies, devolved monies, in addition to any monies from uh, London uh, uh, on a cross-departmental basis <coughs> in order to try to shape and work up uh, an equivalent of an independent living fund. And in that regard, I'd ask the Minister in his reply to confirm or not uh, the current provisions, do they run out in 18 months? And what is or is not going to happen on the far side of that uh, in terms of the independent uh, living fund? And in that regard, Mr Speaker, I think I'll bring my remarks to a close. <clears throat> and I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. This um, debate, and particularly the spectrum that uh, it has taken since 2012-13 to get to this point, is commentary in itself on the dysfunctional arrangements of this place that a matter such as this, uh, costing us money in the meantime, should have been and could have been dragged out in all of those ways even surprises me. And then we come to this debate today and from the First Minister's intervention we discover that whereas the House has been asked to debate at consideration stage a bill, that it is far from the whole story that there are other secret aspects, it seems, yet to be revealed. Uh, how and when, further consideration stage, regulations further down the road, who knows? But one thing we do now know, uh, others may well have known it more fully than I, uh, there was the Stormont Castle Agreement. And Mr. Agnew asked the First Minister, would he now publish the Stormont Castle Agreement? He didn't get an answer. So here we are debating the minutia of the Welfare Reform Bill. Certainly. The reason the member didn't get an answer. If you have an agreement, which is a five-party agreement, no one party can decide for itself that it's going to publish it. I am very happy that it is published, but you need the agreement of all five parties. The, Im the import of that is that it was a secret agreement between the parties that they were going to keep secret. And to break the secrecy, we now have to get the consent of all the participants to the secret pact. So, you know, well, there's the challenge. To each of the five parties, I'll give way and turn to each one of them uh, if they wish to say that on the public record uh, to the First Minister, they have no objection to the publication of the secret Stormont Castle deal. 
I wait. I, I'm inferring, perhaps I infer too much, that the First Minister was giving his consent to the publication. Right? So there's one, four, yes? For open and transparent government? That, that's two, that's two. And uh, I, I, I'm listening. I would like this on the record, if it were possible. Yes. Man's party is delighted. We are fully supportive of open and transparent here, here. government. Here, here. Three. We're doing very well. Yes, I'll certainly give way. <laughs> Can I remind the members to address their remarks through the chair. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. While I appreciate the uh, point that is being made and helpfully led off by the First Minister, we are attempting to run into a farce here again. This is a serious bill which requires a serious debate. Mm -hmm. I, I agree entirely, and I started on the point. If we're to have serious debate, then how can we have serious debate if there is secrecy around some overarching deal which impacts on the bill itself? I think Mrs Kelly. So I, our party has no difficulty uh, we're struggling to understand what was the secret deal. But one secret deal we would be interested in, Mr Alistair, is the secret deal between Sinn Féin and the DUP, which has led to the departure of several senior members of Sinn Féin. Uh, well, uh, perhaps we'll come to that. So uh, I must say, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I am pleased that we've got to the point of four of the secret conspirators in the Stormont Castle deal agreeing to lifting the veil of secrecy. It is noticeable uh, that all I am getting from the Sinn Féin benches are blank stares. Uh, it seems that there is a reticence about a, a taking off the wrappers from the secret deal. I wait, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I think the silence, the silence is very compelling. Uh, I'll give way to Mr. Mr. O'Dowd if that's his request. Uh, Mr. Allister is looking for secret documents. It, here's it here. There is it there. Read it, discuss it, debate it. That's your secret deal there. If Mr. O'Dowd is saying, and I think what he was holding up was the bill, if, what he, was, if he was saying that the welfare reform bill is the secret deal, is this not the welfare reform bill that was published two and a half years ago? So how could it be the secret deal to which the First Minister was referring? So perhaps maybe the First Minister needs now to explain to the House something more about the secret deal. Uh, or is uh, Mr O'Dowd simply trying to avoid the issue? He certainly cannot say that the bill is the secret deal. And if the bill is what he calls the secret deal, then there was no deal, because it predates Storm and Castle Agreement, so-called, by years. So what is one to make of this? Uh, what are the general public to make of it? What are we as MLAs to make of it? Four parties say there was a secret deal which they're happy now to make a uh, unsecret, and one party says there wasn't even a deal. And is that the truth? That there's a hope, an expectation, but really, in truth, welfare reform is not sorted at all. Is that why it is cloaked in such mystery? Is that why it's information tomorrow? It's down the road in regulation. Is that because, in truth, there isn't a deal? Is that why the First Minister wasn't really able to deal with the question of whether or not Sinn Féin are right when they say the cheque that's going to have to be written out of the block grant is £565 million over six years? Is that why the First Minister wasn't able to be explicit and say whether that's right or not? Because this deal hasn't maybe even yet really been pulled together. And it really is a very 
discomforting situation to find the First Minister, supported by three other parties, agreeing there was a deal called Stormont Castle Agreement, and one of the supposed participating parties apparently denying that. So where do we stand in terms of this bill? And why is this House being asked to legislate in the dark? Are those unreasonable questions to ask? I would have thought not. And is that the reason why we had the petitions of concern? When I was reading the First Amendment again this morning, where it talks about regulation shall provide in circumstances where one member of a couple does not accept a claimant commitment within a prescribed peri period that the claim may be considered as a claim by the other member of the couple as a single person. I must have to say I had the mischievous thought. I did have the mischievous thought that maybe the petition of concern was all about one member of the couple giving cover to the other member of the couple because they couldn't quite agree. And the more this debate has unfolded, the more startling it would appear to be in that regard. And then there are multiple issues which have yet to have any, any light shed on them. We've been told by some in the media about this $565 million. We've been told that there is going to be no cap applied to uh, large numbers of people and benefits. And we know that there are 6,600 people in excess of 26,000 a year on benefits. We know that's a bill of 200 and 3.5 million pounds. These are the minister's figures. We know the average received by families in excess of the cap is 30 and a half thousand pounds, which equates to someone going out to work and earning something like 40, 45,000 pounds. And yet we know that there are 6,600 families in Northern Ireland receiving on average benefits of that magnitude. Now, welfare reform, in its essence, whatever one thinks about it, good, bad or indifferent, one of its motivations was to encourage people into work. And one does have to ask, if we're in a society and a situation where we're paying thousands of families in excess of an average of over £30,000 a year on benefits, then how do we ever hope to rebalance this economy? And yet it seems there are those in this House, and their primary goal is to sustain that, to keep those people at the level to which they've become accustomed, and to do it out of the block grant. And that is the really concerning part of this, where this welfare reform is going. I want to finish this point. That we're going, apparently, to sustain out of the money that's there for schools, for health, for all of that. We're going to sustain something that Sinn Féin boasts will be $565 million over the next few years. And they seem to say we're going to do it in perpetuity. And they seem to say we're going to do it for new claimants as well as old. And yet, time and time again, we're told this executive has an economic-driven vision to rebalance this economy. I think there's a collision course there which just hasn't been reconciled. Yes, I'll give way. The member accept that even in the UK legislation or the GB legislation that there are exemptions to the cap anyway for those people, for example, who um, have got severe disabilities, etc. So the, the, the idea that somehow or other there should still be people in Northern Ireland beyond the cap is, and, and this is some defect in the bill. Um, it's only reflecting, or it's partly reflecting, what happens in the legislation for the United Kingdom as a whole. That in GB, not everyone will be capped at £26,000 because there are component benefits which don't count 
towards the cap. But likewise, yes, there are 6,600 uh, families in Northern Ireland above the present cap, 12,000 if it drops to £23,000. The number of those uh, that will be subject to cap and the number who won't be subject to cap, uh, we've yet really to hear the detail of. But one thing is certain, it appears, though it's not in the face of this bill, because the cap's in this bill, it appears that the agreement is that a number of those people will be exempted from the cap. Now, that must be coming in regulations, but this House isn't being told about that. Or is the Minister going to tell us that in Northern Ireland the cap is going to apply per se? I don't think he is. Yeah. Except that again, that's not. I, mean, I know the member is trying to build a case, as he always does, that there is something that there is something wrong with everything that goes through this house. But would he accept that, in most occasions, primary legislation goes through this house and regulations follow? That's the normal process of the legislative of, of legislation here or indeed at Westminster. The difference being here that we're at consideration stage and there has been no light shed upon what the regulations will contain. You know, I, I do sit on the DSD committee no later than yesterday. We had the officials before us and they said, none of this has yet been agreed. This is all still to be thrashed out and agreed at executive level. So we're going into consideration stage debate and the officials or no one else, and least of all the MLAs, have any notion what the regulations are going to say. Yes, it's a natural process to have subordinate legislation under primary legislation. But it is unnatural, it is unnatural, I suggest, that when you're uh, uh, legislating through the primary legislation, that there's such a blank canvas about what will actually be in the regulations. And it takes one back to the question and the burning issue of just what is being put upon the Northern Ireland taxpayer, the Northern Ireland dependent on the block grant in terms of how much of it is going to be soaked up in meeting what were the demands of Sinn Féin. Because it's not so very long ago, the First Minister and other ministers told us there is no more money We've done the best we can, and now it seems there's an unspecified futuristic amount of money. And the only thing we know about it is where it's going to come from. And where it's going to come from is out of where it can least afford to come from, the block grant. And that is what is frightening about this unspecified these unspecified arrangements in relation to welfare reform. So in that context, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, there is, it's interesting to debate all of these amendments, but really, we're doing it largely in the dark. And I think the House is owed a more straightforward approach. And I trust when the Minister comes to speak that he will. But of course, I suspect he won't, because he can't, because nothing in truth has been agreed with Sinn Féin, who say there isn't even a Storm and Castle agreement. Call, call Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, for the opportunity to speak in relation to the Welfare Reform Bill. Um, when this Assembly was reconstituted in May 2007, I doubt if many could have forecast that with all the pressures that may have been bearing down on the political agreement at that time from various forces, including armed forces on the outside of the agreement, political division uh, within certain political elements, uh, both inside and outside the Assembly, that the one matter that would bring the Assembly to the verge of collapse would be welfare reform. I doubt if any member or political observer at the time would have forecast that. But that is the case. Coupled with British government economic policy, the matter that brought this executive 
and this Assembly closest to collapse was welfare reform. And that's the context upon which this debate is taking place and the Stormont House Agreement, which led to today's debate and led to the continuation of the elected institutions moving forward. And members should not forget that, because the agreement which was reached uh, in Stormont House and the political agreement that flowed from that covers a number of areas, but the most important element of it was this. After two years of a breakdown of political relationships across this chamber, across the executive table, and indeed in society, trust was reformed among the political parties. Political parties reached a position where, through word and deed, they were going to ensure that the matters of concern to them and to society would be dealt with in a mature political fashion, through agreement, through legislation, and through a commitment to work more closely together than they had been previously. Because it's quite clear that the reputation of this Assembly pre-Christmas 2014 was in tatters, both in terms of our ability to work together, our ability to bring forward legislation, and most important of all, the primary reason as to why this institution was established in the first place, to deliver on the ground and to make changes, positive changes in people's lives. And the reason, therefore, that it is vitally important that political parties who signed up to the five-party agreement honour that agreement, they need to reflect back as to why they entered those negotiations in the first place and why those negotiations were necessary in the first place. And the bill we have before us today for consideration stage and the amendments under Group 1, which I am currently speak to, all flow from that. You cannot draw a curtain down on your mind on the 23rd of December and say, well, the negotiations that led up to the agreement, the agreement are all history and have nothing to do with the implementation of the agreement. The intervention. And just to deal with the issue raised by Mr. Alistair, um, our party would be quite happy for the five-party agreement made on the 19th of December to be made public. And furthermore, um, the, the agreement that was signed by four parties, one of which was not our party, which didn't, it didn't include Sinn Féin, it was deficient in a number of areas, and we also believe um, it, should be made pub it should be published. Uh, thank the member for that intervention. Uh, and I'll, 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 uh, yes. Could I welcome um, uh, the, the clearance from wherever it came from? Uh, I noticed Ms. Rianne pulled rank on Mr. O'Dowd, uh, but one does welcome that, and one looks forward now uh, to the agreement which a few minutes ago was supposed to be this, which patently wasn't, uh, now seeing what actually it is. Well, um, I don't mind rank being pulled on me at all. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and I will. Towards the end of my contribution, I will return to your, your comments, and nothing which Ms. Rianne has said contradicts what I have said. Uh, and, I, and I will elaborate on that, I will elaborate on that further uh, towards the end of my contribution. But to returning to the, the part of my contribution uh, where I am. So when, when the agreement was reached, there's three stages of an agreement. There's a negotiation. There's the agreement and there's the implementation of the agreement, all of which are vital for success. We're now at the implementation stage of the agreement. And as part of the implementation stage of the agreement, it was agreed among all political parties to work together to bring forward a welfare reform bill, which was built upon the Stormont House, Stormont Castle Agreement, Mr. Alistair, uh, to bring that forward, to work together through the party leaders' meetings and to bring forward amendments to that agreement. Because what the 2012 draft bill will be built upon and the final act will be built upon will be that agreement. So it's somewhat disingenuous for political parties to circumvent that process. I have, I have afforded some latitude yes. to the Speaker, but could I ask him to actually address yes. the amendments? I, I will, uh, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, in terms of the amendments. And I'm, I'm principally talking around 
uh, a number of the SDLP amendments and indeed the UUP amendments, uh, in particular those which would have been clarified through the group leaders' meetings. Uh, for instance, I refer to Amendment 4 and I also refer to Amendment 17, which I, I will talk to you in more detail uh, as we go forward. But parties who then bring forward these amendments, I ask myself the question, is the intent of the amendments, whether it be 4 or 17 or 8, whichever it may be, is the intentions of the amendment to improve the bill and the final act, or is the intentions of the amendment to grandstand and raise expectations or attempt to get political capital on political opponents? Because, as Ms. Ryan said, during the negotiations, political parties, in particular those who are bringing forward amendments today, signed up to a lesser bill than we have before us. So, th there was a number of secret agreements during the Stormont House and Stormont Castle discussions, and I particularly refer to the agreement which was signed up to by four of the parties on the 17th of December, because when I read through that agreement, neither Amendment 17, uh, Amendment 12, Amendment 13, Amendment 11, Amendment 9, Amendment 4, none of those amendments are reflected in the four-party agreement that was signed up to. None of those amendments are reflected in that agreement. None of those amendments were appear to be of such importance that when the four parties signed up to that agreement and insisted that that was the final deal, uh, none of those amendments are there. So I left myself asking the question, if those amendments are of such vital importance to the sponsoring parties, and some of them I think have to say carry merit, carry significant merit, but however, when political parties enter into a five-party agreement, when political parties enter into an agreement on the way forward for this assembly, the executive and our society, then I have to expect them to live up to it because we have to ensure that this assembly delivers to the most vulnerable in our society. We have to ensure that the, well, the final welfare act uh, and the regulations that flow from that act and the regulations and the act which will give um, a body to the Stormont House, uh, the Stormont Castle Agreement will all be there. But when parties divert from that, then I think there's a significant danger and a lack of trust flowing forward. And just in referring to some of the comments made during uh, earlier parts of, of the debate, uh, Deputy Speaker, one of the, the comments was, which was made by Mr. Atwood, and, and it stuck with me when he was talking about the relationship between the executive, the Westminster government, and future welfare reform legislation. He stated that you will be asked to stand and deliver. Well, surely that's the purpose of ensuring that the regulations which are coming uh, from the DSD minister are uh, scrutinised. And I, I, I note the comment of the chair of the Social Development Committee um, when, he, when he stated during his contribution that they stand ready to continue their scrutiny of this entire matter. So this isn't the final act in this uh, saga. It's not the final part of the play. The curtain's not about to fall once this piece of legislation is passed. There's further role for the Assembly. There's further roles for the, or for the DSD committee. And there is further role for the executive as well. So many of the amendments, particularly in Group 1, particularly in Group 1, which may be commendable, do not require to be placed in legislation. Legislation is not, primary legislation is not the answer to all the ailments in society. We can deal with any of these matters through the issue of regulations. And indeed, some of the amendments, if passed, will actually make it more difficult in future times to make change. And I refer to placing into legislation uh, by monthly payments, which in principle is a very good thing. A very good thing. But if you place that in legislation and you want to move to weekly payments, you have to bring legislation back into this House to get it changed. So that's just one example of where the intent may be good, but the outworkings of it actually make it more difficult for both the Department of Social Development and uh, those delivering uh, welfare uh, to the most vulnerable in our society to make the changes required. So I also want, I said I would return to Amendment 17 uh, in, in the booklet, because this is where the all-party working group, or the, the leaders' working group, comes into play. And this is where, the, the, after the agreement and the agreement on the implementation of the agreement was vitally important. 
Amendment 17 again refers to a, a worthy issue of an 18, uh, within 18 months' commencement of this Act, a fund to replace the Independent Living Fund following consultation with the Department of Employment and Learning and the Department of Health and Social Services and Public Safety will come into play. It appears to me during um, contributions from Mr Beggs and interjections from Ms Kelly during her contribution that there has been no discussion with either DSD or Health in relation to this matter. Whereas if this amendment had been brought to the group leaders meeting for agreement, then that would have been the ideal place for such discussions to take place and for the various elements to bring forward an amendment which actually delivers positive outcomes for the people on the ground, rather than an amendment which I suspect which may be well intentioned but also has a political intention around it. The people are, are, are somewhat seen to be going further than others were prepared to go to. But the fact of the matter is, if the proper, reason, the proper mechanisms had been used, which were agreed as part of the Stormont House Agreement, then that issue could have been resolved, in my opinion, not to, to satisfy the need for amendments, but the need to ensure that people in need receive the benefits they deserve. In conclusion, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I, I am. Well, I, I, want, I don't want Mr. Alistair to think he's got one over him. I wouldn't sleep easy tonight with, with that thought in my mind. Mr. Alistair refers to that we're, 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 we are making legislation in the dark. The only legislation before this House today is the bill and amendments which are being brought forward either by private members or amendments which are being sponsored by the Minister himself. So you're not making anything in the dark. The regulations which will flow from this matter, which will be also scrutinised by this Assembly and the bodies of this Assembly, will not be made in the dark. What we have agreed to in a five-party agreement, which we have all been open about, is that we have assured, we have assured that the most vulnerable in our society will be protected. What we have agreed to is that uh, we have a different welfare bill than that which was passed by Westminster two, three years ago, and that we also have agreed to, and this in my opening comments, Principal Deputy Speaker, was that the Stormont House Agreement was about political parties agreeing to work with each other in deed and word. And I think some of the amendments brought forward here today break that deed and word. And in conclusion, Dolores Kelly at the end of her speech said, the STLP have done what they said they would do. They haven't. They have done the exact opposite of what they said they would do. They have failed to live up to the five-party agreement. They have failed to faithfully implement the Stormont House Agreement. And I think by doing so, they have ignored the facts which brought us to those negotiations. The fact that party politics has its place but when it comes to destabilising the institutions, you have went too far. Thank you. Yes. Right, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I rise to support Amendment 17. Amendment 17, uh, and I'm hoping that the Minister at some stage can give us some clarity and around this. And, and I'll go into a wee bit of detail. And before I do, I want to declare I chair the All Party Group on Learning Disability, and I chair the All Party Group on Disability. And this is an issue that has been affecting so many families and carers in Northern Ireland for some time now. We know in Britain that the UK government have brought to a closure the Independent Living Fund and has devolved it to some of the, the more regional councils. And we do know, as Alex Atwood has said, in Scotland, for example, last year the Scottish Assembly agreed to a new autonomy, moving on from the Independent Living Fund and working on it to ensure more people have access to it. And I want to make the point on, on, on why we, we table why we tabled this. Later on this year, the Independent Living Fund, as we know it, will come to a closure. Now, there's many hundreds, upon, hundreds of people, families in Northern Ireland, carers in Northern Ireland, who have disabled children, many of them with complex and profound disabilities. And because of the Independent Living Fund and because of direct payments, they have a choice and they have a lifestyle to remain at home. And that's fundamental in going forward. So Independent Living Funds, 
given that sense of independence as a citizen of the town, to enable carers and what's happening with independent living fund, it enables people to employ a personal assistant, for example. It enables people to employ carers where there is clearly more profound needs. But it also enables people to employ people who end up taking the disabled person to their own home for respite to give the parents or, or, or the care some type of, of respite. So we need to know, and I have to say, and we had a number of events highlighting and promoting the Independent Living Fund, and, and I have to say Jim Wells is not here as Health Minister. I met with the Health Minister a number of weeks ago, along with a number of carers and parents. It was a very good meeting. Uh, and usually occasion, I have to say in Jim's absence, we wish Jim very well and his wife Grace. I know she's on the road to recovery. We hope that that continues. Unfortunately, at the same time, because I was at a funeral this morning, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, a gentleman from our own city, Martin McCrossan, uh, died very suddenly in the same ward as Grace. So we extend our own sympathy to Sharon, uh, her daughters Charlene and Christine, at such a traumatic time. Martin was the epitome of what every decent person could be in the city, from positivity to cheer, providing tours in the city. But I want to use that occasion when it was there. Certainly, we want to see progress made, and we want to hear what the DSD minister is going to tell us today in terms of, of access to direct payments to enable these families. At the present time, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we have 600, just over 660 families and carers receiving uh, the Independent Living Fund, which enables them to have some type of lifestyle to bring in carers. So the, the reason we're bringing this forward and say directly to the Minister, we want to know what's happening. We want to know, is there going to be a direct contact with health? I know the transfer of power from DSD is going to take place in terms of ensuring health is, is going to be using these powers, but we also want to know that we do know that there's many hundreds of others across Northern Ireland who at the present time just cannot access these monies. And the reason why they cannot access the monies is because they don't have the capacity nor the skills to deal with direct payments. They don't have the skills to employ people where others are using accountancy, firms to help them process payments and, and, and and national insurance and tax, all the other, which, which is crucial for families across Northern Ireland. This is a, a very important amendment. Amendment 17 is a very important amendment because it's reflecting what's happening across Northern Ireland at this time. It does the duty of the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister to monitor the inclusion of dis disabled people across Northern Ireland. And I'm sorry that the First Minister is not here now. But this is key in a principle to give a bit of peace of mind, give a comfort and give a reassurance to families. Because I'll tell you what would happen if we didn't do it. The health budget would come to a crisis and the circumstances where if these families had to, if they weren't up to receiving those payments, they put their children or family members or carers under care, on the residential homes or on the hospitals. And you can imagine the cost then to the hospital if we weren't providing that level of support to families who are in crisis at the best of time. You know, there but for the grace of God, we talk about our own families and bringing them up. But when you have families, and some of them in cases where there's multi, but where, where there's a number of people within the household who have disabilities, who have learning disabilities, and depend on this. I, I have talked to people who are absolutely stressed out at the present time, worrying what's happening with the outcome of the Independent Living Fund, because they do know that it will place them under that much pressure. They might have no alternative but to consider the option of placing their loved one in a care home or a residential home. So, so I say to the Minister, and reflecting on all of those, uh, we have come a long way from a period where disabled people had to live in segregated institutions, and that's important, and we are modernising and we're doing things much better. But we can't go back to that situation 
If we don't have clear plans, definitive time frames on when the independent lobbying fund and I came on when I when I said I didn't meet John Wells. John Wells, I have to say as Health Minister, was very encouraging to the families that, that we met. I think it has he, he is hoping to make some determination on the four options available that was subject to the consultation. And one of the options has, has to be to enable an increase in those who, act, who can access these monies. Because there's many in our communities that have previously said, I know some of the members are shaking their head as they're probably dealing with them themselves. They, they realise that the constituencies, they're struggling, company tends, company terms with a multitude of problems. So, and the impact on family life, the impact on the disabled person themselves is immense. And we would be, somebody used the word shame earlier on, we would be shameless if we didn't, under this legislation now, look at exploring, taking the opportunity to try and devise a method to ensure that the result of this discussion over the next few days, that Minister Story is going to say to me, Pat, you're absolutely right, and this is what actions we're going to take. And if those actions are definitive, they're clear, then there will be no need for us to press, to press the, the motion at all. Yeah. The member, and, and I've, I've deliberately wanted to intervene at this stage. I could have on many other occasions, but I think it's better to wait until I, I give a, a response at the end of this. But given the nature of what the member has said, and given, because the member in many, if not in all of the issues that he brings to this House, brings it with a sense of conviction and understanding what the issues are. And I will give a commitment in this House that, yes, the consultation, the public consultation ended on the 30th of November, and the Health Minister, I understand, is to announce early in this 2015 his uh, way forward. But what I will do is that following on from uh, today's debate, and we uh, concur with the comments and we uh, pass on our best wishes to uh, Minister Wells, his uh, good wife Grace, and we're glad of the progress that she has made. And we also send our sympathy to the Macrossan family uh, on uh, the very sad and tragic death uh, in the city. And I know that that is a loss that is felt by many. Uh, across the city, but I will undertake to have uh, urgent discussions with the Health Minister. I will convey the concerns that have been relayed by the member, and I will give an assurance on record to the House that that is something I will take as a priority. I, I thank the Minister for his intervention. Um, the Minister now and, and other members would appreciate why we tabled this amendment, to get some clarity to get definitive commitments, as the Minister very kindly has done. Uh, and, and I make the, the point again, I, I am only reflecting the opinions, the concerns, the worries, the fears, the trepidation of many parents across Northern Ireland and their carers. I, I, I do, with a sense of relief, do hope uh, that, that Minister Story, along with Minister Wells, can, within a, within a very short time frame, give some clarity into the options available uh, whether it's setting up an, another trust fund to administer the money with less overhead costs, well, that's fine. And that's what, that's what disabled families want as well. They don't want a heavy burden of secretarial administration costs. They want the money available to go direct to the, those people who need them. Direct to those people who need them. So, so, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am content at the present time in terms of the Minister's response. I think it is important that we are, and at every time, we have to look after people in our community who are less well off, those who are marginalised, those who are most vulnerable. And if we cannot do that, then we forget about entering politics, because we're about trying to change, improve the quality of life, but also give peace of mind to many carers and parents across Northern Ireland. And I thank you. Call Mr. Stephen Ignew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Democratic People's Republic of Korea, otherwise known as North Korea, Democratic Republic of Congo, Democratic Unionist Party. <laughs> Why is it that those who are least democratic feel the need to shout their democratic principles most loudly? 49 petitions of concern are binding the hands and feet of this assembly 
today and on this bill. This Assembly is the body charged with legislating in Northern Ireland, and the members democratically elected to it have been bound by these petitions to concerned, and indeed bound by the Stormont House Agreement, which was made behind closed doors um, without uh, public scrutiny. I am an MLA, a member of the Legislative Assembly. This is the body that should be legislating for welfare reform in Northern Ireland, in full public view and with democratic accountability. The, I have to question the Stormont House Agreement. We have seen some detail of it, but have we seen the full agreement? Do we know what was, what was agreed behind closed doors? For example, Principal Deputy Speaker, is it a coincidence on the day that Sinn Féin sign up to the Tory welfare cuts that they launch the Irish language consultation? Is that a coincidence or is that part of the Stormont House Agreement? And I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, the, the, the time will only tell on, on that front. John O'Dowd in his contribution said that this is not the final act. This is not the final curtain. And I thought he was going to sing. I thought he was going to sing my way. Um, thankfully for us all, he, he, he didn't, and he couldn't, because this isn't his way. Um, it's not the way of Sinn Féin. This is the Tory way. This is the Tory welfare bill translated into Northern Ireland legislation. It's a mirror of that legislation, um, and it's a mirror of the principles of the Tory party who set out at the beginning uh, of their term in government that they would make £18 billion worth of welfare cuts. That is what we are proposing to translate into legislation today if we do not amend it. And as we know, the vast majority of amendments uh, brought forward by members ha have been petitioned to concerned. Um, there are no amendments from the DUP. There are no amendments from Sinn Féin. There are no amendments from Alliance, which would suggest to me that those parties are happy to implement the welfare cuts as laid out by the British government. I'll give away. Uh, the, the member just now said that the other parties that haven't tabled amendments seem content to implement the welfare cuts as ruled out by the Conservative Lib Dem government. That, that was essentially what he said. Is he then dismissing all of the concessions and flexibilities that my honourable friend, the former minister, negotiated over the course of the past two and a half years? I'm talking about the bill that is here before us today. I've read in the press the agreements. I've, 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 I've been assured, I've been heard assurances from the, 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 the minister's predecessor um, uh, referred to now. I've, I've, I've been told that the Stormont House agreement, that one of the agreements is that there'll be no one in Northern Ireland worse off. But at the same time, I hear parties saying, we will implement the, the, the cap on benefits. Um, and you can't have it both ways. Either 6,600 6, people will be worse off or they won't. But I'm being told both by different parties to the Stormont House Agreement. So what I'm being asked to do is, is trust. Trust the parties who are signatories to the Stormont House Agreement. Trust that either there will be a cap on benefits or no one will be worse off. I'm not sure who I'm supposed to trust in that scenario. Um, so all I can really make a decision on and make a me propose amendments to, as I've, I've sought to do today, it's the Welfare Reform Bill that has been brought to the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay. Can I ask the member that would he recall that when he held a number of bilaterals with my own party during the deliberation of the bill by the Social De uh, Development Committee, that the member was prepared to agree to sign a potential concern against the bedroom tax, but the member wasn't prepared to agree to any other mitigating measure. And in fact, since that time, which is two years, you haven't brought forward one single amendment. I'm just, it seems to be a bit of a contradiction. It's take, actually taking it two years to get a conscience around some of these matters. Um, I thank the member for his intervention. Um, there's a certain amount of revisionism, um, but that, that, that shouldn't be surprising. Um, the, 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 the reality is that, yes, I would be willing to sign a petition of concern to block something that will harm the most vulnerable in our society. Um, what happened since those conversations were had um, was we were told the Welfare Reform Bill wasn't coming back to the Assembly. 
So no, I didn't when I had so many other issues as the leader of a party, as the sole member of my party, spend time uh, on a welfare reform bill that I was being told by Sinn Féin would never see the light of day because they were not going to implement to Tory cuts. Maybe I shouldn't have trusted them. But I, I took that, the, them at their word. And then the Stormont House Agreement happened, and the Welfare Reform Bill was to be back on the table virtually immediately. So yes, I had, I had, been, I had prepared amendments. I have 26 amendments tabled today. And I have been genuine um, in, in seeking to reform, reform the Welfare Reform Bill, the amend the Welfare Reform Bill, to make it better than, than the current draft. I'd be surprised to learn at Sinn Féin's Ardèche in 2013, Martin McGuinness said, and I quote, Let me be clear, Sinn Féin will resist this onslaught on the most vulnerable. We will not tolerate the introduction of a bedroom tax. We will deploy a petition of concern in this clause if it is brought to the floor of the Assembly. And therefore, will you be surprised to learn that Sinn Féin have not signed the petition of concern tabled by ourselves and signed last night by yourself? Again, I, I thank the member for her, her intervention, and I, can, I, I, I will trust her on this occasion that that, that is indeed a quote um, from the Sinn Féin Ar Ar Ardèche, um, and I thank her for reading it into the record. We now have introduced to, uh, today to, to the public um, the, the, the Storm and Castle Agreement. Um, I asked the, the leader of the DUP, um, or I put it to the leader of the DUP that uh, proposals of how this welfare reform, uh, these welfare reform proposals will be topped up, what they, those would look like, and that there should be full public scrutiny. And I'm pleased that we, we, we've been given um, that commitment by, by, by various parties. I think, I think now the five parties have each given that commitment to publish that. And I look forward to seeing the detail because I am left in a situation, again, where I, I, I face contradictions, um, but I've been asked to trust, because the top-up in the budget was £70 million. In various uh, estimates of what the welfare cuts would mean to Northern Ireland, each figure has been above that. So we had NICFA. Their estimates were uh, welfare, reform bill, welfare reform cuts would... Uh, uh, result in 250 million loss of benefits to the people of Northern Ireland. Um, some people didn't accept that figure. I believe the, the, the last minister figure he gave to me, um, he, he, he said it would be 115 million per year, still some way above the 70 million. The first minister, um, when he was speaking as first minister, I, I think uh, not as DUP party leader, <laughs> said that eventually the cost of not implementing welfare reform, in other words, the additional benefit we would have to pay out, would come to one billion a year. But today, as DUP leader, he said that the average would be 70 million a year, and that's exactly what we've budgeted for, so nobody need to worry. Um, I, I've heard so many different figures. I look forward to uh, seeing the detail of the Storm and Castle Agreement to see what figures have been used, how they've been calculated, and how this top-up um, system is going to work. But I, I come back to what I said earlier, that these things should go through this assembly. Whether well, it's been asked to, be, to trust the DSD minister and his officials to get it right through le legislation, or been asked to trust the, the, the parties, uh, her party too, the Storm at Castle Agreement. Um, I believe this is too big an issue of public importance not to put it through the, the, the democratic processes of, of this assembly. With that in mind, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll, I'll come to the, the amendments I have tabled today, um, every one of which has been uh, petitioned of concern, and I assume the intent of the DUP is, is, is to block them. But for the benefit of those who do observe this chamber um, and who want to see what their, their MLAs are proposing, um, I, I will go through why I have uh, put forward each of the amendments. Amendments 10, 37 and 57 
Um, I propose that the work capability assessments uh, should be provided um, by, by GPs or those employed by the Health and Social Care Trust. And this is about learning from the mistakes of others. We have seen this outsourced in GB, and we have seen the disastrous results. We have seen, indeed, uh, ATOS relinquish um, its contract due to a poor record, having to pay compensation to government, uh, having been accused of failures in quality, and, indeed, having faced 600,000 appeals at a cost of £600 million per year, with 40 per cent of those uh, appeals being successful. That was 40 per cent of people put through the added trauma of having to appeal their benefits uh, assessment which, uh, uh, in relation to benefits which they were later deemed to be in entitled to. If my son in school gets four out of ten of his questions wrong, I am disappointed. When a company paid such exorbitant sums of money uh, to administer uh, these work capability assessments, um, I am more than disappointed. I am horrified uh, at the trauma um, that, that people have been put through uh, due to the failures of, of this company. Um, previously, these assessments were done, undertaken uh, by internal uh, department medical staff. And as I said when the question was raised, uh, I think it was by Mr. Beggs, um, around cost, one way or another we pay for these uh, medical experts, um, if the term can be used. Um, so whether they are employed by the, through the public uh, agencies or private, um, we will bear the cost, the taxpayer will bear the cost. Um, so I, I, I would propose that we have seen the record of outsourcing in GB, and if we want to have, uh, and, and with outsourcing, you lose control, you lose accountability, and already the uh, public has lost trust in the processes. And I think we need to take action to uh, restore that trust. Um, amendment 44 is, is about payments pending appeal, and I've just outlined um, the, the, le the number of appeals which are being successful, therefore the number of initial decisions that are being got wrong. Um, uh, and my argument is very much that we shouldn't be making people, in some cases, destitute are certainly uh, struggling financially um, while they are awaiting appeal, and it went, especially when we know in many cases um, they, they, they will be entitled to these benefits um, and that their appeals will be successful. And I'll, I'll just read out um, the details of one case study uh, whereby somebody's benefits were stopped pending appeal um, after such an assessment. It was Jessica, a 23-year-old woman with mental health problems who was 22 weeks pregnant. Jessica had walked two miles to the food bank, reported that since her benefits were stopped, she had not eaten a proper cooked meal for two weeks and was reliant on her sister's children's leftovers. That is what we're condemning people to if we do not allow, give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, during the process of the appeal, rather than giving the system the benefit of the doubt. Um, because it's certainly my contention that when people apply for benefits, the vast majority uh, do so genuinely. But we know that 40% uh, of assessments are got wrong. Um, and I don't think we should punish the, 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 the people on the end of, of those mistakes. Uh, Amendment 45, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I, I do not uh, propose uh, to move. Um, I think it, it, it may require um, some thought in advance of further consideration stage. Uh, amendments 38 and 39. Um, sorry? 
Amendment 45 would be interested to know what by he would need to give it some further thought. It's sure. an amendment that would be interested just in exploring, but I appreciate he doesn't plan to move. Sure. No, I, I think that's fair. Um, I, I, I think the intent, um, and it, it, it was outlined, and I can't recall now who previously in the debate, um, again, it may have been Mr. Beggs. The, the, the intent is about preventing that uh, blunt clawback, clawback when there is an overpayment of, of the department simply uh, extracting money for people who are on very low incomes um, after an overpayment that was the fault of, of the system rather than the fault of the individual. So very clearly, when it's not a fraudulent claim, but an overpayment uh, by the Social Security Agency. And I have seen circumstances, uh, I go back to, to my time working with the homeless, um, where mistakes were made um, and, and that clawback uh, was, 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 was quite uh, excessive and indeed led to significant financial difficulties um, for those in the receiving end. Um, I think I suppose my concern is I, I don't believe people should be punished for the mistakes of the Social Security Agency, um, but equally um, I would accept, uh, as the point was made earlier, that should a, a, a significant overpayment be made, that it, it is unreasonable um, that the public purse be out of money um, uh, in, in such circumstances. I appreciate him just elaborating on that point. Um, the, the, it's more around the principle of it. I think that people can have sympathy where an overpayment's been made, um, not the fault of the individual, but if you're not entitled to a benefit, well then you shouldn't receive it. If you were to apply that same principle to, for example, the payment of income tax or indeed corporation tax, um, would the argument still prevail that because you didn't take enough income tax off an individual, that they should be given a, a buy ball, so to speak. Uh, and there's where I think we just need to be careful in uh, compromising around the principle of this issue. And, and, and I think, I, I suspect we're in agreement. The, 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 it, it wasn't so much the principle of whether that money should be paid back, but how. Um, and, and I am concerned uh, whereby the department ha would have power to simply withdraw money from people's accounts. Um, so it, it's about how rather than if uh, money should be, be, be paid back. But as I say, in that regard, the, the amendment uh, may need further thought. Um, amendments 38 and 39, again, is very much uh, an issue of disability. And it's for how long should someone be disabled before uh, or how long should the disability persist um, b before a, a, a payment um, is made? The principle of personal independence payments or disability allowance um, is very much about providing support for the extra costs of living with a disability. The proposal in the bill is, is for 12 months, three months prior to a claim, nine months after. Um, my proposal is, is to reduce that nine months to six months, um, and which is the current situation. And I, I, I don't understand the rationale for increasing that, that, that timeline. The costs of disability, the, the, the extra costs of disability um, are virtually immediate. Um, so why we would ask someone to to shoulder the burden of those costs um, without support from the state for a full year, um, or, or, you know, only demonstrate that they the, the, the be beyond a year um, that they would be disabled before they would get any support. Um, I, I, I fail to understand that, and um, I think retention of, of the current system in that regard would be preferable. Um, Amendments 43, um, payments in cash, and I, 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 I will. I, this is one of, again, where the petitioner concern not tabled, and, and where the assembly-minded support may need some further definition. But again, this goes back to my time working with the homeless, and I'll give an example of of, of someone in benefits um, receiving their payment. Uh, 
it has become increasingly onerous to, to, to get a bank account um, in terms of the, the, the burden of proof of address and identity. There may be good reasons, reasons for that, but it means for someone who does not have a driver's license, does not have a passport, um, as some, certainly in the case of living in a homeless hostel, does not have utility bills, um, the, 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 it can be quite difficult. Uh, and I, I, again, Mr. Begg's point on, on the, why it is preferable to have a bank account, and I completely agree with him, but for some people that is very difficult, despite um, in the circumstances I refer to, letters from the, the hostel and the organisation that I worked for, letters from social workers. Many of, of the, our residents uh, were unable to, to get bank accounts. So their situation was one where they got their check, um, and then they then, and in some cases, that was an amount of £45 a week and single £90 payment, and they went to a cash a check or some something of that nature, where they paid a premium to receive their money. So that's certainly the intention, intention of the uh, amendment, to ensure that no one should be paying to receive their benefits. No one in the, 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 who are in the lowest incomes in our society should have to pay a premium to receive that money. We each get our pay paid into our bank account, I'm sure, and there's no charge for that. Um, there should not be a charge. Uh, for, for those um, on such low incomes uh, to, to receive their benefit payment. And uh, figures I have suggest that there, the 5 per cent peop of people on the lowest incomes have no access to a bank account. So it is a real problem. It does exist. Um, and I think uh, we, we need a solution um, to it. Uh, finally, Amendment 74 um, is opposition to payment in, in, in vouchers. And I do understand that this is a, a may um, make payment in vouchers. Um, again, Mr. Beggs laid out some of the reasons why it might be preferable to, to, to make payments in, 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 in vouchers. But without any, uh, and, and the minister may, may, may come back in this in his, uh, in, in, in his contribution, but without any assurance as, as to how and when that would be used, I'd be very concerned um, about that, that, that proposal. Um, I think some of the examples have been used. For example, if uh, you're a parent with children in school, you can't use vouchers to pay for school trips. Um, and there's the potential that that very narrow view of what people need their benefits for, i.e. you need it for food and clothing, and that should be all it's for, um, I think fails to reflect the realities of the, the, the lives and the financial pressures of, of people on benefits. So without assurances um, as to how it would be used, and uh, I, I would fear that vouchers are used almost as a penalty, a, a restriction of freedom um, on those on benefits. And I do not believe people should be punished for being unemployed, for being disabled, um, or for, for the many other reasons for having mental ill health. Um, so for that reason, I, I, I would oppose the, uh, the payment and vouchers. Well, Mr. Sammy Wilson. Um, can I first of all just make a couple of general points about the importance of the bill? Um, this has been an issue which has disabled this assembly for quite some time because of the financial constraints it put on it and because of the concerns that there were then around the budgetary implications. And I think that it is important that we now have the bill on the floor of the House and hopefully that we will get it through um, today or this evening. Um, though I notice that it is still being used by those who, of course, in the past have complained about the impasse in this assembly. It is still being used as a way of simply scoring political points uh, and, and trying to make um, bogus points against um, other parties, despite the fact that when you examine their own um, role on these issues, 
it, uh, it, it hardly stands a great deal of, of, of scrutiny. And I, I, I notice the pseudo angry, uh, anger that we have had from the SDLP on this issue. They have upbraided, for example, Sinn Féin on their refusal to sign a petition of concern on the, the, um, the, the, the spare room subsidy. Ignoring, of course, that the spare room subsidy was first introduced into Northern Ireland by the SDLP. And indeed, it was introduced into Northern Ireland for those tenants who are in the most expensive sector of housing, namely the private sector. There were no concerns then, of course, no petitions of concern, no amendments being put down. Their minister simply introduced it. And now, of course, they, they try to score. And, I mean, it's, it's this kind of cheap political point, point scoring, which I think also makes the public cynical about the approach that parties have in this House to um, certain issues. The, 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 they talk about the, 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 the sanctions. Sanctions were first, first introduced by an SDLP minister. We had the pseudo rage from Mrs. Kelly about ATOS and about the, the independent bodies that made assessments. And indeed, when she was moving her amendment, she talked about it. Despite the fact that, of course, that, if you want to call it privatisation of the assessments, was introduced by an SDLP minister. So I think that when we listen to the criticisms that the SDLP level and direct Mostly, it, and I'm not, I'm not here to defend Sinn Féin, by the way, uh, just in case anyone, anyone thinks that I am, but directs mostly in, 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 in that direction there. One has to bear in mind their own record in this and then ask, how sincere are they really about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the things which they, they've said about it? And, of course, we had Mr Beggs, who, I suppose, in the other direction, tried to poke at the DUP as if somehow or other the Ulster Unionist Party were totally divorced from all of this stuff about welfare reform, despite the fact, as, as has been pointed out to him ad nauseum by other members, that his own party actually stood in the last election under the banner of the party which has introduced it. And, and indeed, his own party leader, his own, his own party leader stood as a candidate in that, in that election. Um, and, and, and I will give way, yes, certainly. Yes, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I did stand as a candidate, and I didn't get elected, and Mr. Wilson did get elected. When was the last time you had coffee or a Diet Coke for the Prime Minister? I have never had coffee or a Diet Coke for the Prime Minister. Do I look like the kind of person who drinks Diet Coke for a start? <laughs> so, you know, and all, all I'm saying. We actually support a lot of the welfare reform proposals anyway. I mean, the reason why we're supporting this bill is because we support a lot of the elements in, in welfare reform. And indeed, when it counted and when there were things that we disagreed, first of all, we went to Westminster and voted against those particular parts of the, 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 the bill. When that didn't succeed, our minister here in Northern Ireland then sought to get changes made in the bill, some of which are reflected and some of which reflect the concerns which have been expressed by parties all around here. So our record on it, I think, is consistent that where there are good parts in the bill, we'll support it. Where there are parts in the bill that we believe are disadvantageous, we have opposed them. And where we have had the ability to do something about it, we have done something about it. And I think this is as good a record as anyone can have on the, uh, the, the particular issue. Um, though I do notice, and even when it comes to applying standards, Mr. Beggs, when he was talking about his amendment, um, Amendment 1 in particular, which would have significant costs to the executive, he would not, could not give us the costing of it. And indeed, his argument was that was up for the minister <laughs> and the department to give us some of the, the, the costings. However, when challenged by Mr Agnew to support some of his amendments, we, he couldn't do it unless the member could give him costings. So, I mean, again, another example of parties wanting to have it both ways. 
Their amendments, where there's costs applied to them, somebody else should tell you what the costs are. Other people's amendments, when they are looking for support for them, they'll not do it unless they can be told what the costs are by, and, and the, the obligation is for the, the person who's moving the amendment to give the costs. And I think he wants me to give away, and I will, yes. I will give away, yes. The, the, uh, would the member not acknowledge that uh, this, this is an important area and there will, will be occasions where vulnerable individuals could be caught out if there is not such a facility, such a flexibility built in. But furthermore, has there not been some uh, uh, flexibility built in in terms of split universal credit payments? Uh, so therefore, what we're asking for, which we asked for before it was granted, uh, actually has been built into what the proposals are. Would he not acknowledge that? And we would like to have it on the face of the bill. What is wrong with that? Well, I'll, I'll come to putting that kind of issue on the face of the bill at the moment. But yes, there are financial consequences which are attached to some of the changes which have been made. And we have not sought where we have got them already costed. We have not sought, despite what Mr Alistair has said, to make them secret. In fact, we've been quite open about the costs of them. There are some where is it will require changes in regulations, and um, we, we know the areas that uh, they, they lie in, uh, but those regulations, until um, the regulations are drafted, and indeed the regulations, I suspect, may even be drafted with a, a mind to the amount of money which is available. That will show the kind of flexibility which, can be, uh, which you can uh, then attach um, with those regulations. So, you know, th this idea that um, somehow or other you sim simply put forward amendments willy-nilly without uh, costs attached to them, um, I think is, is totally irresponsible. Which of course brings me to the issue of the petition of concern. The petition of concern which in some how or other members have tried to portray is undemocratic, is seeking to railroad things through, etc. First of all, we are having a debate on this bill the public will be able to hear the arguments which people are putting forward for their amendments. So there's transparency there. A petition of concern does not stop there being a vote on the bill. So the public will know who voted for it and who didn't vote for it. But a petition of concern also has, and especially in the case of issues like this, where there are significant costs attached to some of the amendments which are being made, and where some of those amendments are being made because parties, because of the position they're in, can behave irresponsibly. Now, they might be able to behave irresponsibly individually, but if they behave irresponsibly collectively to score the points uh, that, that they, they wish to do, then, of course, there, there are implications. And that's why a petition of concern is used in a situation like that to safeguard against the kind, the kind of irresponsibility which unfortunately, and even we've even heard it today, some of the parties that signed up to an agreement at Stormont House now seem to have been prepared to ignore what they signed up to with some of the, the, the amendments which they put down, amendments which they never ever raised at the, with the other party leaders, but now because I suppose they think it's a good way of poking at their opponents, they get them down now. And the petition of concern is a perfectly relevant means to use. And I'll tell you one thing. It is far more relevant in a situation like this than in the situation which the SDLP have used a petition of concern in recent weeks to protect from sanctions the postman for letters to get murderers off the, the, the consequences of their crime or to ensure that money is irresponsibly spent on an Irish medium school in Dungiven, or to ensure that the, there, there can't be um, a, a, a union flag placed on the driving license of people in this part of the United Kingdom. If you're looking for frivolous means or frivolous uses of petitions of concern, I think you look in that direction, not in this direction. At least we have got some rationale behind it, um, and, it, and, it and it doesn't stop. Yeah, and I will give way, yes. Would, would the member explain, in terms of Amendment 1, when the language has been used, says that the claim may be considered as a claim by the other member, 
of the couple as a single person. The word is may. There is a degree of flexibility built in there. Why is there a need for a petition of concern? Again, this is an area which has been of concern to us, the units, for some time, where we had an amendment down on it. On it. it wasn't something particularly new. So why does he use a petition of concern, which is an area which we have shown an interest in for some time, and have shown flexibility to enable something practical to be delivered to meet the needs of our people? Well, any, anyhow, Mr Deputy Speaker, because you had been a bit tolerant with me anyway, um, I, had to try, I had tried to keep to at least loosely attached to the um, amendments which were before us. But let me now come to the amendments. And I am not going to speak on them all, by the way, but I do want to take up just um, some of them. And, I mean, the, 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 the Amendment 1 is a very good example of where um, there is a cost attached, and I suspect a great deal of thought has not actually gone into the amendment, because, of course, the consequences of allowing um, that kind of uh, one, per, uh, one uh, individual in the family deciding, I don't want to make a commitment, and th therefore allowing the other member of the um, uh, family to make a commitment, can have significant costs, and indeed, I think can, can lead to, in fact, I don't think, I know could lead to, irresponsible behaviour. Because, of course, the claims have always been joint claims. That's the way it's been done, for one simple reason. That Claims, when, they're, when, they're made, when somebody makes a claim, there's also, with the income-based um, with, with income uh, benefit, there's also a necessity to look at the total income of the family. Now, if we ran with the amendment that we have before us, then you could find that there are two people in the, the family, one because of savings that they have, or because they uh, have other income sources, can simply say, I don't want to make a commitment. And under this amendment, the other person could then make the claim. So that where you have people who abide by the rules and are excluded from benefit, they're disadvantaged by an amendment like this, which allows those who want to use the system and use the amendment which the member, for example, has put forward to have the best of both worlds. One partner drops out, the other person gets the benefit, there's an additional cost. And indeed, if that were widespread, right across Northern Ireland, could have cottoned on, why wouldn't people do it? Then um, you, you, the, the cost would be quite significant. Now, I would have thought if the member had thought a wee bit about his amendment, he might have seen the implications of that. And you know, he, he pulled it at the heartstrings, of course, with his amendment. And he said, yes, but what about where you have an irresponsible partner who decides I don't want to make a commitment? And that in turn then affects the benefit which is available. Um, and children suffer as a result. But there is a provision there, because of course there's the cooling off period. There's seven days for all of the implications to be uh, to be um, explained. Now, it may well be that during that period there will be a change in mind. It may well be that there will not be a change in mind. But there is every, there, there's at least an opportunity to steer people towards um, the, 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 the right decision. And anyhow, the irresponsible person who says, I don't want to make the commitment, and the benefit goes to my partner. The housing benefit still goes to them. They keep a roof over their head and everything else, and they're encouraged in their irresponsibility. Now, the whole point about welfare reform was to try and make people be more responsible. And is he really saying that he wants to introduce easements which pander to those who either are workers of the system or those people who want to abuse the system? I will give way, yes. I go back to the wording in the amendment. The claim may be considered. There is then the opportunity uh, for regulations to stipulate when it may be considered. So the member is uh, placing a very, uh, a very black and white picture when the wording in this amendment is may. You see, I think that uh, while he, he has used the term may, I would love to hear from the member, and I didn't hear it from him during the debate, 
under what circumstances he would, he would have in regulations that you can't do it. How do you make a judgment as to what people's motivation is? Because don't forget, it's, it's one thing to say may, where you can actually measure where the, 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 the problem lies. It's another where, as in a case like this, I suspect, it's what people's motivation behind the thing happens to be. And that's why I think that there, there is, within the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the way in which it's dealt with at present, there is a chance for people to understand, here are the implications of what you're going to do, here's what's going to happen to benefit, here's, here's the, the, the impact it's going to have, and to give them a chance, and with the cooling off period, they, they have the chance to do it. Um, I'm not gonna, there were a number of other um, uh, uh, Amendments which uh, the, um, the, the Ulster Unionist Party brought forward, but I'm going to deal with some of those when I come to, because they do overlap with some of the SDLP ones. And I noticed when Mr. Atwood was speaking, this is what he said. And again, it's this we want to be the champions of the poor, and anybody who else who supports this bill somehow or other wants to trample the poor into the ground. That was the implication. Despite the work which has been gone in to trying to make this, uh, th these changes more palatable. In fact, on one hand, I thought he was going to break into a sectarian, what he would describe as a sectarian tune. He said, with hand and hand and hand and heart. I thought he was going to talk about guarding old Derry's walls as well. At, at one stage, he got so passionate about this. But as we said, the purpose of our amendments is to protect the claimant through their journey of this new welfare, these new welfare changes. And let's look at some of the amendments. Is it, uh, you, as if the SDLP were the only people who were wanting to protect people. Some of the amendments certainly don't show that. Take Amendment 8, for example, about the frequency. The frequency of payment has already been established. Instead of once a month, as a result of listening and of the concerns which we had about paying people on low incomes once a month, where the difficulty would have been that maybe by the, the, the end of the month they'd spent it all because we're under such uh, great pressure. It is now down to two weeks, and indeed it's left open. And Mr O'Dowd made a very important point. When he, made, when he made the point that if we put, it, uh, uh, or put the frequency on the face of the bill like this, then you cut out the opportunity for further flexibility. Where, for example, for some people, in certain circumstances, a weekly payment might be necessary. But, you know, to say that here is an amendment to ease people's journey through the bill, or, th or through the, the changes. That, in fact, if anything, it probably makes it more difficult to have the, the, the flexibility, but it's already been considered. Another one was the amendment around the claimant commitment. That, that when, when the uh, amendment number nine, and the, the amendment there suggested that um, in preparing, reviewing, updating the claimant commitment, the department should have regard to the claimant's skills, expertise, carrying responsibilities, so as if this was something new invented by the SDLP. But the truth of the matter is, when somebody is, goes for a work-focused interview, what kind of things do they look at? What kind of work have you done in the past? What skills have you got? What caring responsibilities do you have? What training do you need? This is nothing new, but yet it's been presented by the SDLP this is our amendment because we are more concerned about um, the, 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 the people who might be affected by welfare reform, when, the, when that's already there. And um, I could go through some of the, the, the other amendments. I mean, for uh, amendment number 11 um, on um, the, the, uh, mental health, and ment mental health reports should be considered. Well, that's, oh, that already happens. And not only... The, the reports, but also the assessment of capability then based on those reports. Um, and, you know, so a lot of the amendments really are 
uh, they, they don't add anything to the bill. And indeed, I, I asked myself, as I was listening to the SDLP's case on all of these, what do, do those amendments add? If the purpose and the objective was to make it easier for people, what amendments have I heard from the SDLP that actually improve the lot of people who will be affected by welfare reform? And the answer that I think we come to is that it doesn't add anything because a lot of what they're proposing is already there, their change is already made, and uh, th therefore um, the, 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 the working that has been done um, by the parties, by the ministers, etc., have been um, dealt with. Uh, Mr. Alistair, I, don't, I wasn't actually too sure whether he was supporting the bill or opposing it. He always just likes to take a, a swipe at the dysfunctionality of this place. It actually might be more functional if we could get some constructive attitude from him on some of these things. But the problem is, of course, we don't. And so we have had secret deals, secret agreements. We don't know what's been done. That we've now got um, the, the, the um, conspiracy, conspiracy of the Stormont House Agreement. Some, I don't know what, we're actually con what was actually conspired or what people were conspiring to do at the Stormont House Agreement other than to find a way forward with a bill which, as I say, had the absence of it had crippled this assembly, to find additional money to alleviate, alleviate some of the impacts of it and to look for the longer term at how that money might be spent. Now, some people may argue, and I suspect there will be, some people argue and say there's not enough money involved in it. But again, the important thing is that we have tried to deal with And not all of it's secret, anyhow, because the minister, over a period of time, has already revealed where some of it's going anyway. Some of it will be spent on avoiding the impact until we get our housing balance and our housing stock right, the impact of the spare room subsidy or the, the bedroom tax. Some of it will be spent on the very thing which members have raised here today. What happens when people go for um, the, the, their, their assessments as to whether or not they can work or not? £6 million will go towards helping people get medical uh, reports which will, they'll be able to use. Um, at, 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 at those um, assessments. Some of it has been, will be used to replace the social fund. And some have already been attached to that. And as the First Minister pointed out in his submission, some of it has not been allocated yet because regulate, until we know what the exact form of the regulations are going to be, we'll not know what the, costs, the additional costs of those might be. And it is not unusual, despite what the member has said, it is not unusual for regulations to follow a bill, not to be published before the bill goes through. And we, do it quite, we, we examine those quite frequently um, in the, in, in the, the um, committee. I just want to come lastly then to some of the comments that Mr. Ignew made. And I must say, I, mean, I, I know that uh, and we're, we're going to even have more of this when we come to the second round of amendments. We know that the Green Party, because we've seen their manifesto recently, live in cloud cuckoo land. No bacon on a Monday. No advertising for holidays in the sun. Be able to join a terrorist organization without it being illegal. And so it goes on. And I suppose some of the amendments which he has proposed kind of reflect that out of touch with the real world and reality. The best one I thought, and in fact, I'm going to ask him for a loan, because if this is the way he operates publicly, I'd love to know what he does privately. That, you know, what was it? What was it? Amendment, um, amendment, amendment 44, that where an appeal is pending. Now, don't forget, we're talking about people who don't have a great deal of money, and people there's a more of a chance of their appeal being turned down than being approved. We should continue to pay them as if they had won the appeal. 
And presumably, at the end of the period, if they've lost the appeal, we've got to get the money back off them. Now, I'm sure the business of recouping that money is going to be extremely easy. Uh, and, you know, if, if that's the way... I can imagine somebody come up to uh, the, the member for North Down. Maybe he is flush. I think my auntie's going to die in about a year's time, and I may have a legacy from her. You wouldn't lend me 20 grand on the strength of it. He wouldn't do it. But yet he expects when it comes to state money, because it's populist, I suppose, that that's the way we should behave. And, you know, a lot of us, a lot of the other um, ones are the same. The one about vouchers. Vouchers are used, and it's made quite clear, vouchers will be used in a case where you've got someone who is dysfunctional, who is not spending their money. On the, I mean, his argument was, if you give them vouchers, they can't pay for their children to go on a school trip. If they were paying for their children to go on a school trip, they wouldn't be needing vouchers in the first place. The vouchers are because, maybe because of a, an alcohol problem or a gambling problem, or whatever, they're not even providing for their family. Yes, it will. Saying we're living in the real world, will the member show me where in the bill these assurances are made? Will the member show me how this is laid out in the bill where it says only in these specific circumstances? Will the member provide me with that? Because he's asserting it with assurance, but it's not in the bill. Well, since the default position, I mean, again, this is where um, the, the, the member strains at these things. Since the default position is that people get their benefits paid in cash or by a check or into their bank accounts, that's the default position. The default position, or indeed the normal position, is not that people get paid in vouchers. Vouchers, if that was the case, then benefits would be generally paid in vouchers. The very fact that it's, 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 it's regarded as, as, as a, 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 an additional way of, of making those payments, and right throughout the rest of the welfare payments, payments are paid in cash or paid in, in, in the bank accounts. It's, it, it's indicative that it's in exceptional circumstances. And we know the kind of exceptional circumstances in which it would be. And I must say, I would far prefer, and the voucher system I, I accept is, is not going to be immune from, um, from, from abuse. You may well find that people will be prepared to buy vouchers at a discount from some, somebody who's got an alcoholic problem. He mentioned, what if they went into Tesco's to get their messages? And when they went in, they bought alcohol. Well, that's probably easy to deal with. You simply make the voucher not redeemable for alcohol. But the, the, I accept that there are other ways in which it could be abused. But um, you know, to, 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 to actually to say that, look, even in circumstances like that, people should be paid cash, I, I do think is irresponsible. I'm not going to deal with a lot of the, the, the rest of his amendments. Um, but I, I, I think, Mr. Um, Speaker, if you look at the amendments, and I've tried to go through uh, uh, some of the amendments, if you look at some of the amendments that are here today, it is quite clear what the purpose of them is. The purpose is not to improve this situation, because some of them already refer to what is already the practice or what is already in the bill. The purpose is to be able to say, we put an amendment down, we are good, you lot didn't put an amendment down, you're bad. And that kind of cheap point scoring doesn't do anybody any good, it, and it, it, but it confirms, in my eyes anyway, why, yes, we can have a debate, yes, we can have a vote, but sometimes you have to have a petition of concern because you still have people who are totally irresponsible in this issue. Thank you. And I call Mr John McAllister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> um, I think saying at the outset, uh, Mr Speaker, that the broad principles of welfare reform, that, that work should always pay, is something that I think most of us could sign up no uh, family or, or couple should be disadvantaged if going into the employment market, back into work, and find that they're actually worse off. Um, so that, on that basis, Mr Speaker, I welcome the fact that um, after almost two years that this um, bill is now back uh, 
and we're debating the amendments before us today. It is, however, unfortunate that while we are debating the amendments, uh, there's not uh, much chance of a, a different outcome uh, to, to the bill or that any of the amendments are going to be sort of we can engage with well intentioned both in making the amendments and in debating them, but because of the petition of concern, effectively that has killed off uh, any prospect of any change. I do think it points to uh, an important thing for this executive. I've said before in this chamber, uh, Mr. Speaker, that people who signed up for things at Stormont House, who uh, go, whether it's at an agreement on the budget and on welfare reform at the castle and, and going round to Stormont House to present a united front as, as the government of Northern Ireland, and then suddenly um, you get into the new year and suddenly the shine has gone off it. Well, maybe we shouldn't have signed up to that. Maybe we should have should held out for a better deal. That is not how that our executive, this executive, um, should work, because it doesn't provide for good or stable government. So we currently, Mr Speaker, have an executive without a programme for government, any meaningful policy ideas beyond corporation tax. It has no sense of direction, and that is deeply regrettable. When we look at all of the amendments uh, in, this, in this section, Mr Speaker, we um, have now got so many petitions of concern. And just when I thought that this assembly or this executive couldn't get any worse from the debate on the education bill, when we had 10 petitions of concern, when we have something like 50-something uh, like petitions of concern from unionism, if you like, from 1998, we have almost 50 in the one day. I mean, that's even outdoing yourselves. And then, we, Mr Speaker, to, to cap it all off, we have Mr Wilson telling us effectively he's done us all a great favour. He has saved uh, the, this executive and saved the Assembly from the, the arduous task of sorting out what it might want to do. We'll save you all that bother. We'll do the petitions of concern on your behalf. I mean, what it points to, Mr Speaker, is the dysfunctionality of this executive. The First Minister, Mr Speaker, is absolutely right. And every day, this Assembly just proves how right the First Minister is. An executive that is dysfunctional and an assembly that is dysfunctional, and that is why it needs to change. There are no meaningful ideas coming through here apart from what Westminster is making this executive do. It is making it do welfare reform. It wouldn't do it without Westminster pushing it into it. It wouldn't do public sector reform in any guise without Westminster uh, uh, pushing it down that road. I have no idea, Mr Speaker, what this executive would do, what it stands for, what direction it is going to take, and therefore it is not fit for purpose. When you get an executive that two parties in it um, uh, now are in agreement on welfare reform, but the other three parties uh, uh, are, are somehow they're voting against the budget, I will say, Mr Speaker, uh, to the Alliance Party today, well done on acting like part of the government for today, I'm not sure how long it will last, but well done today on acting part uh, of uh, the government. The other parties that are in the government, why are you still there? You know, why are you tabling amendments? Why are you, you voting against something? And why so many petitions are concerned? If the DUP had the confidence of their other executive partners, particularly uh, Sinn Féin, you have the numbers. You have the majority in this House. You do not, therefore, in all of these amendments, need a petition of concern. We had a petition of concern yesterday um, against Mr Allister's amendment by Sinn Féin and the SDLP when it was voted down by something like 96 to 2. Why, why, or why are we using petition to concern in this, in this instance? In the Education Bill, we had 10 of them, even against Mr Agnew. Um, when the Assembly naturally found its place after debate, there is no need to go about our business. Even if you were petitioning concerning these amendments against all your other government colleagues, why, when the government 
of Northern Ireland has an inbuilt majority of 102. Why necessarily pick on Stephen Agnew and his amendments as one lowly uh, independent? And I know Mr Wilson gave us a brief glimpse of the Green Party manifesto, um, but I, 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 I suspect the Speaker would rule me out of order if I were to, to listen to too much uh, of, of Mr Wilson. But this, Mr Speaker, makes our executive look like a pinball machine with nobody quite sure what direction it's going in or where, what direction it's going to fire off into next. And that is why we cannot allow this uh, to continue. It is a, an anti-democratic measure with using the petition of concern. It was built in to give protection uh, uh, while we built up a, a process and moved from conflict to consensus. Um, and it is a clear abuse of that and the workings of this uh, assembly and it reflects badly on not only the executive but on each and every one of us in here. I want to speak about uh, and quicken some of the, the issues around the amendments. If we were to believe the, the uh, rhetoric of Sinn Féin, we would say that we are going to spend some £565 million pounds over the next five to six years. Um, of course, that's a huge financial burden that we are looking at um, taking on. That this executive, and we listen to the budget debate, Mr. Speaker, we listen to the finance minister who says, who constantly warns us that we are entering a very difficult budgetary period. Not only this year, but right the way down the line up to at least 2020, we will be in difficult times. So we are now taking this on with some debate as to how it's going to be paid for, where it's coming from, um, where it's going to be targeted, how it's going to be used. Is it going to mean less money for health services, for education, employment and learning? And all the departments, Mr Speaker, that actually were working tirelessly to provide the services uh, to try and get people off welfare and into work. So is there a difference in that? Are we diverging away from, from the GB model? Can we afford um, uh, to do this? Uh, and where is this going to end after five or six years? And where will that leave people? Will it leave people more trapped uh, uh, on our benefit system than in other parts of the UK? We also look, have to look, uh, Mr. Speaker, at, at this and the, the amendments tied in to this bill in light of, of what is an agreed executive policy around corporation tax. So we're, the executive is going to, uh, aims to, to get control of corporation tax and to move to cut it to maybe 12.5%, the same as, as the Republic of Ireland, or indeed maybe below in, in DUP manifesto. And the cost of the executive could be some £325 million per year. So where does this fit in? with 325 million for corporation tax, 565 million for welfare reform, and a never tightening budgetary position. That is real, uh, going to be, cause real strain on an executive um, and how they manage that. We have been told about the costs of, of not doing welfare. We've looked at the fines, that could, the penalties that could have been imposed by the Treasury. And quite rightly, we are doing this because the, the reality, Mr. Speaker, um, of us not doing welfare reform, of us not moving, is just a, a, a nonsense. To continue down the road of fines or penalties or whatever you want to call them would just be madness. You cannot continue um, uh, to do that. Uh, again, figures used were if we'd put welfare reform uh, through, we would have what a third of people better off, a third the same, and a third uh, marginally worse off. That's, those are, are very rough figures, and I suppose it depends where, uh, where everybody falls and where you're, you're, you're fighting through. Turning to some of the amendments, and um, while I, I won't speak to them all um, as uh, probably slightly pointless, given the numbers of petitioning concerned, I did think that. Um, amendment 1, uh, standing in Roy Beggs' name, I, I thought it seemed relatively sensible. Again, uh, Amendment 2 from uh, Ms Kelly and Mr Atwood, 
um, seem similar to the, the UUP uh, amendment. Um, you know, amendment uh, going to amendment eight seems sensible enough. Um, although certainly wise to question what the administrative costs associated with this would would be. Although I understood that the executive had won some provision about fortnightly payments um, anyway, both in, when uh, Mr McCausland uh, was minister. Um, other amendments, Mr Agnew's amendment 10, I would wonder as to whether that would place an unnecessary burden on the health service, um, uh, making sure that that person had to be from uh, the uh, from the, the, the health, uh, from within the, the Department of Health. Um, and working, working through, there are many amendments that we could have accepted uh, the, the principles of and worked around, and I think it would have been fair to debate uh, and uh, look, at, look at why we would want to, to, to develop those ideas and those thinking, and that thinking. And I think uh, this chamber, Mr Speaker, when it's at its best, it would be debating, listening to, working through different amendments and voting accordingly when, when the, the arguments were won. So again, you come to the point of why so many have been um, uh, one, uh, petitioned to concern. It just does not seem a sensible move forward. Again, an, uh, an SDLP amendment, Amendment 19, seems probably quite, quite sensible. Uh, to make and right through, uh, uh, there, there are many things and there are many amendments that would seem sensible and worthwhile having a genuine debate here without uh, the, uh, the, the effectively the acts of a petition of concern hanging over us. I would just also bring up, uh, Mr. Speaker, when Mr. Wilson talked about, about bedroom tax, and I know that Minister Storey will be, be aware of this. I would also question round, not only around the, the bedroom tax uh, issue, but even around the lifetime tenure of people on social housing. If we are doing anything about the principles on welfare reform, it is about making sure that people are not trapped uh, either in welfare or in social housing, and even the inappropriate that our housing stock has not been inappropriately used. And I think that's something uh, that Mr. Wilson touched on in his contribution. It's something I think we, we ought to be looking at. The, um, my other uh, comments around the amendments, Mr. Speaker, are a bit about the rhetoric of, I have to say, mainly both the SDLP and Sinn Féin, on this, is the SDLP was largely founded on the principles of social democracy, of social mobility, of helping people to better themselves. And I don't always see that in some of the opposition or some of the changes you would want to do in this welfare reform bill. Because, Mr. Speaker, if anything is about the basics of welfare reform, it is about not trapping people in either poverty or in worklessness or in social housing. It is about social mobility. And I just think some people and, and colleagues, mainly to the right of me, have lost that way, their way on social mobility. I have to say to, to colleagues in Sinn Féin that if you look at some of the areas that they have represented for many, many years now, they're some of the, the least socially mobile constituencies uh, probably in the UK, and that is something that we need to change. And I find that, Mr. Speaker, bizarre when you set it in the context of supporting corporation tax that you're then uh, in welfare reform, because you come to the point, Mr. Speaker, that it is effectively supporting trickle-down economics, and you get to the point it is a long way to trickle-down Corporation tax has a long way to trickle down to reach the very poorest uh, in the labour market, those most distant from the labour market. And that is the basis of what welfare reform is and should be about. And it is about um, pr protecting uh, the vulnerable, but uh, that's 
I don't want. I don't think those two policies sit together. Actually, from a point of view of Sinn Féin, they still. I give way to Mr. Member for giving way. But will the member accept the difference that there are people who will never be able to enter the the workforce because of their disabilities? And that's why the SDLP is putting forward amendments. That's why the SDLP and indeed others, Mr. Agnew, are advocating and championing in their cause. Uh, the, the link between corporation tax and those who are disabled, and some so severely disabled as to never be able to enter the workforce, is, is an erroneous one, to my mind. I'm, I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker, to Mr. McLone. It is the links between reforming welfare and an economic policy are well established. If you look at the work that the uh, Conservative uh, Lib Dem coalition government has been done, it is about making work pay and driving a private sector that can create jobs to take people off welfare and into work. Those are the things. Entirely accept Mr McLoone's point, uh, Mr Speaker. There will be people who will never be able to work. There will be people with disabilities so profound will not um, be able to work. But where people can work, and the, the liberating fact of getting someone into a job and getting paid and off dependency is something we, as an assembly, as an executive, should be encouraging. That is actually the more positive points about welfare reform, that we do not want to trap people in there. We want social mobility. We want, I, I will in a second, we want people uh, who have some of the, the most difficult starts in life not to be generational about um, being trapped on, on welfare and worklessness for generations and a cyclical effect. I, I, understand, your, I understand your politics and all of this here. I think that uh, listening to your debates and arguments, you've always uh, argued in the round the support for, for welfare uh, reform, regardless of the consequences. But I'm listening to, to the SDLP about the amendments. You know, a, a, a party. Uh, that entered into an agreement and then walked away from it once it got out the door. A party that, when people talk about work, work capability assessments, who initiated that, has been responsible for tens of thousands of people, of people with disabilities, both phys physical and mental, being put off it, and now they're standing here today uh, saying they're championing it. You know? uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. McCann as well. And um, the, the, point, the point that he makes uh, initially about supporting welfare reform. I think most people support the, those broad principles that we cannot trap people or should not trap people. I want to see people from his constituency of West Belfast, one of the most deprived constituencies in the United Kingdom. I want to see people socially mobile from West Belfast that can get up and get themselves through, a, get a good education and get into a good, well-paid job. The point is, when you are linking it with an economic strategy, some of the people in his constituency will be a long way off benefiting from a cut in corporation tax. That's where the trickle-down economics, but that's where you have a long way to trickle it down to get to the very poorest in his constituency. And I have to say I agree entirely with his point about agreeing to something before Christmas um, and then uh, walking out on. And if you are going to do that, Mr. Speaker, at least leave the executive. I know if, <laughs> if Mrs. Kelly had her way, she may well have been out of the executive by this stage. But that's. That, uh, that, that's uh, she's never getting to her feet now. They, Mr. Speaker, that's the reason that we need to move and we need to reform the way we are doing our business here. We cannot have an executive that functions like this, agrees a budget, then three parties vote against it, agrees welfare reform, then two parties vote against it. You need to either agree. Um, I'll, I'll give way to Mrs Kelly first. And <laughs> just want to uh, clarify for some members who don't appear to have read the Stormont House Agreement and are trying to throw a number of red herrings about in relation to what was or was not agreed. There are six lines, as I said earlier, Mr uh, Speaker, in relation to uh, welfare reform and the bill. And, the, and if I may be permitted, they are. Legislation will be brought before the Assembly in January 2015 to give effect to welfare changes alongside further work to develop and implement 
flexibilities and top-ups from the block grant as part of a package of measures to address local need. Implementation of these welfare changes will begin to take place in the financial year 2015 to 2016 and implementation will be complete by 2016-17. It would appear that the executive has already failed to implement the Stormont House Agreement because this is now the month of February, of course. And uh, uh, I, I don't see where there has been any walking away from the agreement. We are uh, debating uh, the bill here. We did not give a veto to the dictatorship that runs uh, in Sinn Féin and the DUP. I know their parties clamped down on dissidents and speakers uh, who actually have a different view from the party leadership. But, uh, you know, uh, this House has a duty to, to actually to scrutinise the Assembly, and it is a right of the Legislative Assembly to scrutinise legislation, and we are not giving up that right. Mr Speaker, and I welcome the right to champion, to scrutinise it. You just should be doing it from a position outside the executive. That's what, what, what all of the three uh, smaller parties should be doing, outside of the executive, opposing, scrutinising, tabling, tabling amendments. It is just when you get, and of course I wasn't at the Stormont House uh, agreement. I think the longer you go on, the more tenuous your uh, connection <laughs> with the motion in front of us. Would you please return to the subject matter? I will uh, just uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I was about to say on the amendments, I think Mr. Given wanted to, to bring me straight back to the amendments. If he still. The, the amendments, if the executive has handled this so badly wrong, and the SDLP and the Ulster Unions are so vociferously opposed to it, and that's an issue if they're happy to be subjected to, as they call Dolores Kelly said, a dictatorship, that's a matter for their parties to have to deal with. But could, could, could Mr. McAllister. Uh, impart to us how the executive could be more functional if he believes that needs to be the case and maybe the experience he had in NI21 and, and if there's best practice from that, if that could be shared with us to try and make us more functional. And I think could I invite you not to follow that line of inquiry and come back to the subject matter? <laughs> Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm, grateful for, I'm grateful for your guidance on, on that. And, as I'm sure there's an amendment that, that I, I can try and link it to. <laughs> um, but uh, look, the, the issue over both the functionality and these amendments, I don't think it, is, it reflects well on making amendments from various sides of, of government. It, my views, Mr. Speaker, on how we make this place better are very well known. In fact, he could come out and support my bill on reforming the Assembly and Executive, and I think that would make a huge difference to it. And on one last, one last point, at least I knew when I was in something so dysfunctional, like NI21, I knew to resign. And I call the Minister for Social Development, the very patient Minister for Social Development, Mr Mervyn Story. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, after you listen to all of that since 10 to 11 earlier on today, you just wonder where it is you're going to start. However, I'll try and make my own way through this. And uh, I suppose if I had known what awaited me on the 24th of September uh, last year, uh, it would have maybe uh, coloured my uh, answer to the question that was put to me or the situation that was put to me by the First Minister then about taking up this post. However, we are where we are and uh, we will endeavour now to work through uh, the issues that have been raised, very important issues. And, and at the outset, I want to, to have a word of thanks to all those who uh, previously have worked in regards to this bill and in particular the work that was carried out by the committee the, when they focused on the matters that were pertaining to the committee. Uh, they did sterling work in relation to much of the consultation, much of, of the organisations, and I think that that should be acknowledged. I also want to acknowledge the work of my colleague and friend uh, Nelson McCausland, the, the previous minister for DSD, who did a huge amount of work. And I don't think that uh, we will underestimate the huge amount of work that he did to bring uh, the measures that he negotiated uh, to the fore. And I want to place that on record and say a word of thanks to him and also to my own staff who have worked tirelessly over uh, the last number of, of months uh, in relation to this and continue to work. Uh, I want to pay uh, tribute to them as well. A comment was made. Uh, and I think it may have been from Mrs Kelly earlier on, uh, and it was uh, a quote really in a sense, it was 
like a summary of what it was that we should be about, and it was about meeting the needs of people. You know, as I have listened to contributions in this house today, I think sometimes that we lose sight of the reason as to why we're here is actually to ensure that we do what we were mandated to do for the people who sent us to this house. I've listened to cheap political points. I've listened to nonsense that has been spoken by members in this house who I honestly believe, if they have the convictions that they claim they have, they would walk out of the executive, they would walk out of the assembly, and they would tell the people of Northern Ireland, I don't want to be part of this dysfunctional process. I don't want to be part of this assembly that can't make a decision. Because it seems when we don't make a decision, it's a problem. When we get an agreement, oh, then it's a problem. Oh, then there's difficulties. Then there are issues. So clearly, I think there are some people in this chamber, some parties in this chamber, and it is for them, make your mind up time. And surely, if you have the convictions that you claim you have, and if you are politically postured in relation to these things as we think you are, then you will have an opportunity in a few months' time to put that to the test. Surely that is the ultimate test that we all subject ourselves to. However, I don't have that privilege or that luxury. And I have been given a task to do, a task which is underscored in legislation to ensure that I continue to deliver a safe and secure welfare system for the people of Northern Ireland. And I can assure you, I can assure you that I will not deflect from that purpose, that responsibility, even though it will be difficult, even though it is challenging. That is the purpose, that is the goal that I have been set. And, uh, Mr. Nesbitt. And I'm very grateful to the Minister for, uh, for giving way and, and I acknowledge his opening remarks. So just a couple of questions, if I may, Mr. Speaker, to, to the Minister. Has he heard anything from the Ulster Unionists today that he did not hear in a three-hour meeting yesterday in this building? And would he confirm what I believed I heard yesterday from the other parties to, who are signatories or who signed up to the Stormont House Agreement? that we were supposed to go f forward as five parties agreeing together. And can he understand the shock of the Ulster Unionist Party to discover that petitions of concern, which weren't mentioned once in the three hours yesterday, were issued within minutes of the end of that meeting? I thank the, the member for the intervention. I, I have to say that we find ourselves in a position where either we get progress because the, minister, the, the member, Mrs. Kelly, made reference to the timeline and already we're in default. Our party is party to the executive and to the processes of the executive and to the work that the executive does. And so I find it difficult then whenever we get and we bring papers to the executive and we inform the executive as to what we're doing that then that is then taken and used against us as though we are defaulting and we are not implementing what we agreed to do. I can understand the issues that uh, the, the member has raised, but I think that he equally has to understand the frustration that I have in trying to ensure that the penalties, which, and remember the penalty issue hasn't gone away, so there is a requirement on us to make progress in relation to this, and I'm trying to keep the focus in relation to that issue. And I have given commitments to ensure that we will work our way through this process. Because let me, let me make this point before I start into the, the comments that I want to make in relation to the amendments, Mr. Speaker. And that is, let's remember a lot of this wasn't about the bill whenever this all started. Because it was about the regulations, it was about the implementation, it was about how it was going to actually be implemented, which is really following on, I'm trying to answer the point that was made by Mr. Atwood earlier on when he made reference to the way in which this is chaotic in the rest of the United Kingdom. It was really for those reasons, and members know that I have repeatedly said this, that it is vitally important 
Yes, that we get the legislation, but it is more important that we get the regulations. It is more important that we have the implementation in a way that avoids all the issues that have been to the fore in other parts of the United Kingdom. And I'll come back later on to some of the comments that he's made. But I want to move, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the issues that have been raised by members. And uh, just to encourage members, you'll be delighted to know that we have five groups. And uh, this is just coming to near the end of the first group. And I will endeavour, uh, as uh, time permits us, to work our way through the comments that I want to make. Can I begin by addressing Amendment 1 and 3, which relate to the basic conditions which must be met to be entitled to universal credit. Perhaps it would assist the House if I explain firstly what universal credit is and secondly what the basic conditions are. Universal credit will be a single household benefit which will replace a number of working age benefits and is designed to simplify the existing complex benefit system, making it cheaper to administer whilst providing incentives to encourage individuals to find work to return to work and to ensure work always pays. And, and it is trying to address that issue that was referred to by uh, my colleague. Uh, and, and I think he makes many valid points in relation to that incentive, that policy intent, and ensuring that we have a, a system, a policy intent that is about taking people out of uh, the, the very sad situation. And, and we have to face up to this. And sometimes, and, and let me say this, sometimes there, there seems to be a, a, a view in this house that it's only in certain communities that there are difficulties. That it's only in certain locations in this city that have problems and challenges. Let me say I can take you to many people in my constituency that would be deemed to be affluent if you look at the noble indices, if you look at all the other indicators that tell us as to how uh, an area is judged. And let me say there are people in those communities who are dependent upon ensuring that there is a welfare system that provides for their needs. Let's not lose sight of that because I think sometimes we really do ourselves a disservice by the cheap, trivial way we, we approach problems that families that people, individual, lone parents, and a whole variety of, of people, disabled people, people who have other challenges and, 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 and difficulties. I come here today, I trust, with some heart in terms of those issues, because as a family, I know what it's like to have been there and to have seen some of the difficulties that families can face. Clause 4 of the Welfare Bill that we are considering sets out the basic conditions that must be met in order to be entitled to universal credit. The five, ba five basic conditions for entitlement to universal credit which must be met unless exceptions apply are to be aged 18 or over, to be under the qualifying age for state uh, pension credit, to be in Northern Ireland, to not be in education and to have accepted a claimant commitment. The above requirements uh, must uh, be met and must continue to be met uh, for the entitlement uh, for uh, universal credit. In the case of joint claims, both eligible claimants within a household will be required to accept uh, a an individual claimant commitment. Amendment 1 and 3 would allow, where one member of a couple does not accept their claimant commitment, the claim for benefit from the member of the couple who accepts a claimant commitment to be treated as a claim from a single person. Clause 14 introduces the claimant commitment for universal credit. Clauses 45, 55 and 60 of the bill also make accepting a claimant commitment a condition of entitlement for existing benefits such as job seekers allowance and income support and will be implemented at the same time as universal credit is implemented. Therefore, should the tabled amendment be accepted, Amendments would also have to be made to clauses 45, 55 and 60. The amendment raises a number of significant issues which I want to address. A couple will be required to make a joint claim for universal credit to ensure that both members of a couple take responsibility for the claim and obtain support to find work where appropriate. This is a principle already established 
in Job Seeker's allowance for joint claims and is being extended to universal credit so that both members of a couple should have equal opportunity to access the support. In addition to work-related uh, expectations, the claimant commitment includes other responsibilities such as the need to report a change of circumstances and is tailored to the individual circumstances of each member of the couple. It is recognised that there will be circumstances where claimants will find it difficult to be able to accept a claimant commitment. In cases where one member of a couple is incapable of claiming due to disability or health condition and has uh, an appointee acting on their behalf, the requirement to accept a claimant commitment will be wavered. Also, if the claimant is in hospital and is likely to be there for a uh, few weeks or a number of weeks, or there is a domestic emergency preventing the claimant from accepting a claimant commitment, the claim can be made by the other member of the couple singly. However, such claims will be treated as joint claims as this underpins the policy principles that universal credit is a household benefit and that, this, and that the income and capital of both members of the couple will be treated as being available to couples jointly. In those cases where the claimant is reluctant to accept the claimant commitment, a cooling off period of a minimum of seven days will be allowed for claimants to reconsider the impact on the household and to sign the claimant commitment before any decision is taken to disallow. It is not anticipated that this clause will adversely affect any claimant. We believe that once the position is explained to the claimant by their per, uh, personal advisor, that common sense will prevail. Accepting Amendment 1 or 3 would also open the door for fraudulent behaviour. Taking a scenario where a family consists of a mother, father and two children, where well, the mother is working and the father is not, if the mother decides not to sign a claimant commitment, removing this clause would mean that the father could claim as a single parent. This is not the behaviour which we wish to encourage or condone. Personal responsibility is one of the basic principles around the wider reform agenda, and this is particularly relevant for universal credit, where claims are to be assessed on the basis of joint income and savings for all members in a household. Treating a couple as a single claimant would be financially advantageous and therefore unfair to couples who both agree to sign, in, uh, to sign their claimant commitments. To accept Amendment 1 and 3 would be a clear breach of parity. There would be potential implications for North, the Northern Ireland Block Grant, and it would result in claimants in Northern Ireland being subject to preferential treatment to claimants in Great Britain. The impact of this would be difficult uh, to justify and would create the potential for wider and significant equality issues between uh, claimants here in Northern Ireland and Great Britain. For these reasons, I urge members to reject Amendments 1 and 3. Give way to the, the, the wording of Amendment 1 is that regulations shall provide in circumstances where one member of a couple does not accept a claim commitment within a prescribed period that the claim may be considered as a claim by the other member of the couple as a single person. So it empowers you to write regulations and it would be possible, surely, would the Minister not accept to write into those regulations guidance which would prevent what he is just reporting uh, could be abuse? But I think that in response to that, that the member would accept that for the reasons that I set out, I'm trying to get a rationale which I believe already exists because of the way that we have currently constructed the elements of the bill. So I don't see that, and I think I've, I've set out uh, the reasons as to why I believe in these circumstances, setting out those scenarios, that it is better and it is more preferable that we would not accept uh, Amendments 1 and 3. Moving on to Amendment 4, this amendment insists or inserts a new clause on the provision of claimant documentation when making a claim for universal credit. It provides that where a person cannot provide all the required documentation to make a claim, 
then there is provision made for third-party verification in lieu of required documentation, including identity documents, so that the claim can be made. Under the current claims and payment regulations, a person making a claim for benefit must provide certificates, documents, information and evidence as required. This provision is being carried forward into the proposed universal credit claims and payment regulations, and I underscore is being carried forward so that members are clear in relation to that particular issue. However, evidence is currently accepted uh, is stipulated in guidance, and while there is nothing specific on handling third-party evidence, in practice it is uh, in form uh, a, a reputable source, uh, sorry, it's from a reputable source. Uh, example, social services, it is accepted a kickstart and a claim form someone who is homeless or who is vulnerable. <coughs> guidance will cover, as it does currently, the continued acceptance of third party verification where appropriate. The IT identity security system, IRIS, will flag up a range of risks or concerns, including those originating from identity trust flags. In such cases, there will be an identification task generated requiring uh, resolution, including third party verification. And this would ordinarily happen through face to face contact of Social Security Agency staff in the office. There should be no difficulty for claimants without bank accounts, as a simple payment service will enable such vulnerable claimants to access their money without conventional ID documents. I am providing an assurance that the current practice allowing third-party verification for vulnerable claimants will carry forward and that such claimants will still be able to make a claim and have their money paid either via a bank account, if held, or via the simple payment service which is aimed at claimants who don't have access to a bank account. For those reasons, I would urge members to reject Amendment 4. Moving on, Mr Speaker, to Amendment 8. This amendment proposes to insert a new clause 12A in relation to the frequency of universal uh, credit payments. The amendment introduces a default position of an award of universal credit being paid twice monthly unless a claimant or joint claimant opts to be paid on a monthly basis. I have to say it's at that point, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I, I do find it somewhat uh, bizarre that we've had members in this House today claiming that we're working in the dark, as though somehow we're all living in some cauldron that we all don't know what's going on, and that this is all part of a secret deal that was done, and the public doesn't know anything about it. Well, these are things that have been agreed. These are things that are now being brought forward, and I'll say more about that uh, probably later on. And by the way things are going, it looks as though it'll be much later on. But currently in Northern Ireland, the majority, over 99% of Social Security claimants, receive their payment on a fortnightly basis with a two, -thirds of a tax credit, uh, two thirds of tax credit recipients being paid weekly. Furthermore, in Northern Ireland, 32% of employees are paid more frequently than monthly, which compares with only 18% in GB. Concerns have been raised by many stakeholders, including the voluntary sector, the executive subgroup on welfare reform, and the introduction, that the introduction of monthly payments will cause significant difficulties for some people, especially those on uh, existing social security benefits. Twice monthly payments is one of the packages of measures which my predecessor uh, had agreed with the Department of Work and Pensions to help shape how welfare reform could be implemented in Northern Ireland and to mitigate some of the negative aspects of welfare reform in Northern Ireland. As outlined in my correspondence to the church leaders in October 2014, something that's in the public domain, something that wasn't secret, something that wasn't done under some guise of uh, secrecy, uh, it was done very publicly, it was done very openly, and it was something that I was very happy to do and have continued to keep the church leaders abreast and informed of uh, what has been going on. But I outlined in my correspondence, which is on the website, which uh, is available to members to check, 
In October 2014, I informed them that I was proposing to introduce the default position in Northern Ireland that all claimants will receive twice monthly payments. This will more closely match the frequency of current uh, benefit payments. Claimants will have the option of moving to monthly payments should they decide they wish to have that method of payment. I would like to. You scared me there, but I will give way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the Minister for, for giving way. Given that he has referred to the number of occasions that this has been put in the public domain, can the Minister maybe. Um, find any um, reasoning behind the, the amendment that, that is on the, the order paper, um, does he believe that it's a lack of understanding or just political grandstanding? Well, it's always difficult to, to ascertain as to what is uh, the, behind uh, amendments. However, I, I, I don't want to in any way sound as though I'm just being totally and absolutely dismissive of, of the, the motive that's behind uh, members when they come uh, to this issue, because I, I do realise, and I have already made reference to the fact that there was a huge amount of concern that was raised by stakeholders, uh, including the voluntary sector, the, uh, and it was all relayed through the executive subgroup uh, on welfare reform. But sometimes it does bring you to the point where it is difficult to come to any other conclusion than there's politics being played with these issues, and I think that's, uh, that that is regrettable. I will, but I, I want to make progress, but. Just very briefly, uh, as has been pointed out, it's been stated publicly many times that the, the agreement's been secured that we can have uh, bi-monthly payments uh, here in respect to welfare reform. Um, can I ask why then he has not brought forward amendments today to put that on the bill? I think uh, I, if the member was listening to what I said earlier on, a lot of this was not about the difficulties in the bill. The difficulties was in the regulations. And I don't know, and I know I'm relatively, well, I was going to say relatively young to this House. I came here in 2003, and maybe uh, I'm maybe now getting <laughs> realised how many years ago that was. I am still having a challenge and a difficulty of trying to get my head around all the mechanics of the legislation. But I think that the regulation will be the way in which we want to ensure that these things are handled and these things are implemented. That the framework, uh, and, and maybe this is putting it uh, too simplistically, but the framework for the introduction of the policy intent is this bill. But there will be still a huge amount of work that will have to be done over a period of time in bringing forward the various regulations that will see enacted what it is we have agreed. And, and for members then to somehow think that that's all being done without them, it's all being done just because two parties have uh, agreed it, I think is an unfair reflection of how we are proposing to deal with these issues. Can I also say that I would also relay to the, uh, the members that uh, the bill and the proposed relevant regulations already contain flexibility to accommodate a decision on any frequency of payment. This flexibility uh, is required in the event that future policy dictates an, an alternative opinion for frequency uh, or a, an alternative option for frequency of payments. To specify in the bill that universal credit is to be paid twice monthly unless a claimant or joint claimant opt to be paid monthly would remove this flexibility. If this flexibility is removed and replaced by a specific twice monthly provision, and in the event of a new developments policy and any adjustments that would have to be done by way of primary legislation, it is uh, considered more appropriate for this to be done in regulation so that the detail can be easily amended rather than by way of primary legislation. And I can assure members that the views of the Social Development Committee will be sought on all regulations. And I think that was a point that was maybe made reference to by uh, Mr. Beggs, and I know it was a point that was made reference to by uh, um, uh, Mr. O'Dowd when he made his contribution. And uh, I almost, uh, in a sense, uh, had a sense of deja vu uh, because I know uh, the difficulties that I created for him 
uh, when he was endeavouring to bring forward legislation in relation to the establishment of a single education authority. But, and, and uh, it was made reference to by Mr. McAllister, as though somehow that despite those 10 petitions of concern and all the concerns that he had around that, I think that what we proved on that issue is that though it was difficult, though it was challenging, and though we had to keep going back, and there were many, many uh, different uh, pressures that were brought to bear on us all from other organisations and from all the particular interest groups, I think that what that process proved to us, if we keep at it, we can find a way through these issues. And so I, I think that I, I trust that that is this, the case in relation to the bill that is before us this evening. So for those reasons, uh, I uh, urge members to reject Amendment 8. Let me then move to Amendment 9, uh, which relates to Clause 14, and I will explain briefly what Clause 14 does. Clause 14 introduces the claimant commitment for universal credit. The claimant commitment is a record of a claimant's responsibility in return for receiving benefit and will be tailored for the individual. And let me stress that particular point. Will be tailored for each individual, taking into account their individual capabilities and circumstances. Clauses 45, 54 and 59 also make accepting a claimant commitment a condition of entitlement for the existing benefits and will be implemented at the same time as universal credit is implemented. The claimant commitment will determine exactly what uh, work a person is looking for, when or if a workforce interview should be taking place and the nature of any training that they will need to carry out. Interviews will be used to develop an understanding of all factors relevant to job search, their caring responsibilities, their physical and mental health, their skills and their work history, in much the same way as already happens with Job Seekers Alliance. It is expected that the discussion will be central to shaping the nature of the bike to work uh, effort. Having consulted with the claimant, the claimant commitment will take account of the claimant's skills, qualifications and circumstances, including any caring responsibilities, physical or mental disability or ill health. In addition, this will be dealt with in regulations and guidance. Requirements imposed on a claimant will take account of all relevant matters and not just at the beginning of a claim, but throughout a claimant's time and benefit. The requirements will be reviewed following any change of circumstances and should a claimant raise a particular issue or if the nature of the job search uh, changes. The claimant commitment is expected to be a living document. It will be personalised to the individual claimant and will be regularly revised to reflect the claimant's circumstances. As the claimant will take part in discussing all the factors which need to be considered when drawing up their claimant commitment, it is not considered necessary to legislate for, uh, for the department to have due regard to the claimant's skills, experience, caring responsibilities and health matters on the face of the bill, as Amendment 9 suggests. I want to pick up a point raised by uh, Mrs Kelly in relation to childcare and assure her that the current provisions which exist in GSA will be retained. In other words, where there is no affordable available childcare, no lone parent will be coerced into work or work-related activity. And I think that that should give the member an assurance in relation to that particular issue. It's for those reasons that I've outlined, Mr Speaker, that I would uh, urge members to reject Amendment number 9. Amendments number 10 and 11. These amendments relate to Clause 16, which defines the work and preparation requirement for universal credit. This is a requirement that a claimant takes actions that will increase the chances, either now or in the future, that they will get work, uh, work that is better paid, or an increase in the number of hours that they work. All claimants who are able to prepare for work should be required to do so on a condition of receiving benefit. It is likely that all but most of the work ready job seekers will have some kind of work preparation requirement placed upon them, even if 
it is just updating their CV. Those people who have been uh, uh, found through the work capability assessment to have limited capability for work, but who are capable of work-related activity, will also have work preparation requirements placed on them. The Department is committed to increasing the number of disabled people in employment. We will provide better and more intensive support to help people off benefits and to find sustainable work. In return, claimants who are capable of taking steps to prepare for such work should do so. Advisors will devise a tailored work preparation plan for each claimant, and the details of this will be included in the claimant commitment. The nature and amount of work preparation required could vary from person to person, but will always be reasonable in the claimant's circumstances. Examples might include skills training, uh, confidence building, or work experience. <clears throat> Amendment 10 changes the wording in the explanation of what a work-focused health-related assessment means. Instead of an assessment being conducted by a healthcare professional approved by the department, it would change to a healthcare professional employed by a health and social care trust or who is a general uh, practitioner. Health professionals undertaking work-focused health-related assessments will all be recruited and trained directly by the assessment provider appointed by the department, which uh, for Northern Ireland is ATOS. Health professionals must meet the following requirements. And I think it's, it's, an, it's important that we read this, in a sense, into the record, because I think it's good to have this recorded in terms of this issue, which is, for many, a very important matter. So health professionals must meet the following requirements. Be an occupational therapist, nurse, psychiatrist, uh, or a paramedic or doctor. Be fully registered with the relevant licen licensing body. Doctors must have a license to practice. Have no sanctions attached, attached to registration. Have at least two years post full registration experience, except where individually agreed by exception with the department and have passed all uh, access NI checks. Once health professionals are recruited by the assessment provider, they are required to undertake an accredited training program and upon successful completion are approved by the Social Security Agency Health Assessment Advisor. They will re uh, receive specialist training in assessing the impact of disability. Therefore, this rule differs from the therapeutic role of the health professionals in the health and social care trusts and general practitioners, whose primary role is to reach a, a, di a, a, a diagnosis and or planned treatment. Training will incorporate both e-learning and face-to-face -face modules and will be signed off by the agency health assessment advisor. Furthermore, health professionals do not need to already be employed by a health and social care trust, as they will all be employed directly by the assessment provider. Clearly, therefore, it would be inappropriate to place limitations on those who can undertake the assessments. On this basis, uh, I would urge members to reject amendment number 10. Turning to amendment number 11, which inserts an additional provision to clause 16 to ensure that any person who carries out a workforce health related assessment takes account of relevant medical evidence, including uh, evidence of mental uh, health or mental ill health, as the case may be. Medical evidence is reviewed uh, as part of the work capability assessment process. Medical evidence will also be taken into account as part of the mandatory reconsideration process of any claim where an individual decided to take an appeal against a decision of the agency. And it was a point that I think was raised by Mr. Beggs. Uh, Mr. Beggs also raised the issue of the number of appeals. And I would clarify that 67% of decisions made in ESA appeal cases are in favour of the department's original decision. 30% of those decisions are in favour of the claimant and are made for a range of factors, including fresh medical evidence being presented 
on the day of the appeal. 3% of decisions are in favour of the claimant because of incorrect decisions made by the department. And I think that that can all be verified by the President's uh, annual report of the appeal service. So the scope of the workforce, the work-focused health-related assessment is about the extent to which the person's capability for work may be improved by taking steps in relation to their physical or their mental condition. The assessment aims to support people back to work. It enables claimants to explore with a trained healthcare professional their aspirations for engaging in or returning to work, and their beliefs, perceptions and concerns about their particular condition. It is intended that a version of the work capability assessment will be used to decide the level of support a disabled person receives under universal credit. The healthcare professional will review all the evidence before them and provide advice to the decision maker on likely functional implications of any medical evidence provided. This advice helps the decision maker to reach an appropriate decision on entitlement to benefit. The proposed amendment seeks to make it a legislative requirement for healthcare professionals to take account of relative medical evidence when carrying out a work capability assessment. It is worth pointing out that the primary role of the GP or hospital doctor is to carry out a medical assessment. They do not, as a matter of course, always consider the disabling effects or the restrictions of the claimant's medical condition. The assessment carried out by the healthcare professional is a functional assessment. It is designed to assess the impact of the claimant's health condition or disability on their ability to provide for themselves through work. Amendment 11 is not required as the role of the healthcare professional is to take account of relevant medical evidence when carrying out an assessment. To specify this in the bill could suggest that this type of evidence is more important or carries more weight than other available evidence. These have been subject to independent reviews by Professor Harrington and by Dr. Paul Litchfield. These independent reviews have now come to an end, but I am conscious and hearing the concerns raised here today that further work needs to be done. And I would want to take this opportunity to assure the House that I will be examining how we can best ensure that this learning is built in uh, to the assessment process going forward. And I think that was a point that was also made reference to by Mr. Beggs. And I think it's important that uh, following on from the independent reviews that were carried out, that I uh, do take some uh, time to look at these issues and to see and to ensure that uh, we have covered this particular element in the best uh, possible way. And so I give that assurance, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the House. For those reasons, I would urge members to uh, reject Amendment No. 11. Amendments No. 12 and 13, and they relate to Clause 24 of the Bill. The bill aims to give advisers uh, broad discretion to impose requirements that they think give claimants the best chance of finding or preparing for work. However, there may be certain requirements or actions that are not and will never be appropriate. Clause 24 allows us to make regulations to put such matters beyond doubt, setting out particular circumstances when requirements or specific actions must not be imposed. There may be also circumstances that may justify claimants being exempt from having requirements imposed on them for short periods, such as if they have been bereaved or have had a domestic, domestic emergency. A specific example of this is included uh, to allow claimants who have been victims of or threatened with domestic violence to be given a 13-week exemption from any work-related requirement, and this is to carry over from existing Social Security legislation. <coughs> Amendment 12 proposes to include victims of an, uh, an incident motivated by hate in the 13-week exemption from any work-related requirement, and proposed Amendment 13 defines the meaning of an incident motivated by hate. Domestic violence and hate crimes are very different in that domestic violence is caused by a member of the household, whereas the hate crime is usually 
associated with strangers. The two are therefore correctly, in my view, treated differently in social security legislation. The universal credit regulations, which will be subject to the Assembly approval, will give work coaches the discretion to not impose or to tailor a work search or work available requirement temporarily for claimants dealing with domestic emergency or temporary circumstances. Domestic emergency or temporary circumstances are not prescribed in the guidance, and this allows a work coach to make a decision based on an individual's circumstances and whether a work search or work availability requirement would be reasonable in those circumstances. A work coach would be able to consider a racist attack under this regulation. I think that that, uh, I trust, would, would be helpful to uh, the member who raised that particular issue. And this approach will support better decision making by allowing staff to consider the merits of each individual case. It also gives flexibility on the time during which the easement on work search and work availability applies and does not tie it to the 13 weeks for victims of hate crime. In responding to the proposed amendment, can I assure the House that legal advice was sought and this confirmed that there is no legal def definition of hate crime that could be incorporated into social security legislation. I think uh, there was uh, an issue raised by a number of members in relation to that issue. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject amendments 12 and 13. Moving on then to, Mr. Speaker, to amendment 17, which proposes for my department to be provided with powers to introduce a fund to replace the current independent living fund uh, for Northern Ireland within 18 months of the commencement of the Northern Ireland w uh, Welfare Reform Act. And, and I appreciate that, that uh, my colleague, Mr. Pat Ramsey, did make reference to this issue earlier on. But if I could just make a few more comments and underpin what I said to him at that occasion in the House. It may be helpful if I provide some background to the Independent Living Fund. The fund was created in 1988 as an executive non-departmental public body of the Department for Work and Pensions to provide financial support to disabled uh, people throughout uh, the United Kingdom. In Northern Ireland, my department is only responsible for meeting the costs of Northern Ireland recipients of the fund and a share of the overall administration costs. However, the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety uh, has currently a policy interest in the fund, given that the people supported are those with severe disabilities, most of whom are in receipt of a substantial care package from their local uh, health and care trust. The fund makes direct cash payments to severely disabled people uh, with intensive care needs across the United Kingdom. The money is used to pay either for care agency staff or for the recipient to employ their own personal assistant. This support enables disabled people to choose a life in the community rather than in a residential care setting. Due to the escalating costs, the decision was taken in GB to close the fund permanently with the effect of the 30th of June 2015. Following this, the Department of Health and uh, in, here in Northern Ireland, the Department of Health and Social Services and Public Safety published a consultation document on the 4th of August 2014, seeking views on how current users of the fund in Northern Ireland can be supported from the 1st of July 2014. That public consultation, as I said earlier, ended on the 30th of November uh, of last year. And the Health Minister, I understand, plans to announce his decision early in 2014. But I did give an assurance, and I uh, reiterate that assurance, that I will have a discussion with the Minister of Health on this issue when uh, he returns, and that I will uh, convey to him, and in fact I will ensure, following on from tonight's debate, that the comments that were raised and the concerns that were raised by uh, uh, Mr. Ramsey in relation to this will be conveyed to the Health Minister and then I will, I trust, be in a better place to inform the House 
of progress in relation to this, I trust, when we come back for further consideration stage in a couple of weeks' time. So as the Department of Health will have the responsibility for the ILF users following the closure of the fund, uh, it's for those reasons uh, I would uh, urge members to reject the amendment as it's currently before us in uh, the House. Can I then move on, uh, Mr Speaker, to uh, a number of other amendments? Amendments 18 and 19. Uh, and they refer to Clause 38 of the Bill. This clause allows us to continue to use a work capability assessment when determining whether a claimant has limited capability for work and, if so, whether they also have limited capability for work-related activity. The termination of a claimant's capability for work following a work capability assessment clarifies a claimant's work-related requirements and their eligibility or not for an additional element within a universal credit award. Those who are unable to work because of the effects of a disability or health condition will be entitled to a higher amount of universal credit based on the, their capability for work. Similar to the current system, they will be allocated to their work-related activity group or the support group. The work capability assessment assesses individuals' functional ability for work rather than assuming that a health condition or disability is an automatic barrier to work. Many disabled people and others with health conditions play a full and active role in the labour market, and there is evidence that work is uh, exceptionally beneficial for people's physical and mental well-being. Whilst we remain committed to supporting those who can't work, we want to help as many people as possible to return to suitable work. But no one should be written off simply because of a disability or consigned to a life on benefits. It is intended that a version of the work capability assessment will be used to decide the level of support a disabled person receives under universal credit. This will include a work preparation requirement, which may specifically include taking part in a work-focused health-related assessment. The scope of the work-focused health-related assessment is about the extent to which the person's capability for work may be improved by taking steps in relation to their physical or their mental condition. Amendment 18 seeks to make it a legislative requirement for the healthcare professionals to take account of medical evidence when carrying out a work capability assessment. Amendment 19 mirrors this but expands it to include evidence of mental health or mental ill health. I have previously highlighted the role of the healthcare professional, which includes uh, considering the evidence when assessing the impact of the claimant's health condition or disability on their ability to provide for themselves through work. They also provide advice to the decision maker on likely functional implications of any medical evidence provided to enable the decision maker to reach an informed, appropriate decision on entitlement to benefit. I have also highlighted that the primary role of the GP or hospital doctor is to carry out a medical assessment. They do not, as a matter of course, always consider the disabling effects or the restrictions the claimant's medical condition. Amendment 18 and 19 are not required as the role of the healthcare professional is to take account of relevant medical evidence when carrying out an assessment, including any mental ill health. Roy Beggs asked for an update on discussions between my department and the Department of Health around medical evidence and GP contracts. The issue of the GP contract has been raised with the Department of Health colleagues, but we have been unable to move this issue forward due to a lack of agreement in relation to the Welfare Reform Bill. So officials will now be taking forward uh, this particular piece of work in the next number of months, and I trust that I will be in a, a better position to give a more detailed assessment as to the outcome of that particular issue. The issue of the GP contract has also been tabled uh, with Dr Litchfield, who referred to it in his most recent report on the operation of ESA in Northern Ireland. 
and that was an issue that was referred to by uh, Mr. Beggs. To amend the bill in this way could suggest that this type of evidence is more important or carries more weight than other available evidence. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject Amendment 18 and 19. Turning now to uh, Amendments uh, 35, 36, 37 and 57, and we are making slow but, I trust, steady progress as we uh, make our way through these. And I want to address uh, my comments to these particular amendments. As these all <coughs> relate to the requirements for the assessment process for personal <coughs> independent payment, as set out in clause uh, 79, and I will address them uh, together. Amendment 35 would insert a new provision into clause 79, which would provide that the department must take account of all rel relevant medical evidence when undertaking an assessment of an individual's ability to carry out daily living activities or mobility activities to determine entitlement to personal independence payment. This amendment, the Amendment 36, which I will come to shortly, murder earlier proposed amendments regarding assessments to determine entitlement to universal credit. Whilst I have argued against accepting the earlier amendments in respect of medical evidence, this was on the basis that one of the primary roles of the healthcare professional is to take account of the relevant medical evidence when carrying out an assessment, including any mental health issues. Therefore, I do not think this needed to be addressed on the face of the bill. <clears throat> However, given that the distinct purpose of PIP is to help with the extra cost of long-term illness or disability, I am content to accept Amendment 35, indeed to ensure that medical evidence is available when needed. The Executive has already agreed to establish a fund to provide additional funding for medical reports. No claimant will have an adverse decision made against their claim for uh, PIP without a report from either their GP or consultant having been considered by the decision maker. Another issue which is in the light, not in the dark. So for those reasons, I would urge acceptance. I know it's taken a long time to get to that point where you wanted to hear me saying that I was actually accepting something. But for those reasons, I would urge uh, members to accept Amendment 35. Amendment 36 would make their similar provision to Amendment 35, but with a particular emphasis on taking into account evidence of mental health. Similar to my arguments raised in respect of earlier proposed amendments, accepting Amendment 36 would give a degree of prominence to evidence of uh, mental ill health in the assessment process. Indeed, it could be argued that by making such provision in the bill, mental ill health could be given an elevated status over other medical conditions. This would go against the core principles of the foundation of PIP. Entitlement is not to be determined by a specific disability or health condition, but by the impact uh, the condition has on the individual's ability to carry out a number of uh, every key day activities. And I think of members uh, who repeatedly, and I know from personal experience in attending many DLA appeals, I think that that is an issue that we always have to uh, go back to. It is not about the condition that the person has. It is about the implications as to how that affects the individual. And I think that we need uh, to emphasise that, that entitlement is not to be determined by the specific disability or health condition, but by the impact uh, the condition has on the individual's ability to carry out a number of key everyday activities. The actual processes for how the assessment should operate in practice, including when and how additional information should be sought, will be set out by the Department in regulations and guidance. And I again uh, remind members that that will be for this Assembly to consider. I'll give way to the member. Thank you. Speaker, for giving way. Um, and, uh, in relation to guidance and uh, regulations, uh, in particular for people who have uh, a learning disability, 
uh, and perhaps uh, coupled with a severe physical disability. I do have some concerns because it's, uh, uh, I do have the experience of representing constituents and, and their carers who are elderly of having repeat calls for review and appeal, which is putting a lot of trauma and stress and anxiety on them. So I wonder, Minister, in relation to bringing forward the guidance, would you have a particular look at uh, concerns raised? And I will write to you, if you wish, in relation to this particular case, because it is bringing a huge amount of trauma uh, to the carers in particular. The member for uh, raising uh, that particular issue, and I give uh, assurance to the member that I am quite happy, either whether she writes to me on the issue or that we take uh, up the, the comments that she has made, because uh, as we prepare the regulations, as we pre prepare the guidance, I think that uh, examples like that are things that we need to be made aware of. And, and this, is, this is always going to be the challenge for us. I don't believe, and you know, I have I've said a huge amount of the 23 pages that I have gone through. And I still go back to the point that I made at the very beginning. It's about people. So if we can end the regulations, if we can end the guidance that we have to uh, bring, not we have to, we will bring, then we can incorporate those things. I give assurance to the member that that is something which I will look at and will come back to the member in relation to that. So the, the intention uh, behind the assessment is that it is more evidence-based. Therefore, additional evidence will cover a broad range of areas, including medical and other forms of evidence which may not be seen uh, as medical. For example, a care plan, a report from any other professional involved in supporting the claimant, such as social workers, uh, key workers, uh, care coordinators, or some, uh, something else which would uh, not be condition-specific, but provides relevant information to help the department determine whether the individual has the difficulty with daily living or mobility activities uh, and to what extent. And let's remember, let's go back to the issue about the 30 per cent that were then successful on the basis of additional evidence. And I think that that is always the issue that we need to uh, underscore uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes we do fail uh, our constituents when we don't give to them that, that particular uh, piece of very good advice. It is about ensuring that the evidence is there. And it's not that someone is questioning uh, an individual, but I think that when you are a decision maker, when you're going through this process, I think it is very good. In fact, I would say it's essential to ensure that that information is there and that information is given the due regard that I believe it should have. So the department or assessment providers on its behalf will seek further evidence by phone or by issuing uh, one of the standard pro forma requests in cases where they feel it is appropriate. For example, where they feel that the further evidence will allow them to offer robust advice without the need for a face-to-face -face consultation, or whether they consider that a consultation is likely to still be needed, but further evidence will improve the quality of the advice they provide the department. The important point when looking at the question of the PIP functional assessment is that the assessment is being carried out by a professional with the appropriate training to complete the assessment. I have a responsibility to ensure that the service is provided efficiently uh, and to ensure proper use of public funds. It is my view that the identity of the employer is not the primary concern in terms of the assessment. Also, health professionals undertaking PIP assessments must meet the same requirements for those undertaking the work capability assessment, which I highlighted early in the debate. For example, they must be an occupational therapist, a nurse, psychiatrist, a paramedic or doctor, and must be fully registered with the relevant licensing body. The health professionals have to complete an accredited training programme before being approved by the Social Security Agency Health Assessment Advisor and receive specialist training in assessing the impact of disability. This role differs from the therapeutic role of health professionals in the health and care trusts and the general practitioners whose primary role is to research uh, and to reach a diagnosis 
and or a planned treatment. Therefore, it clearly would be inappropriate to enable health professionals employed by the Health and Social Care Trust or general practitioners to undertake assessments in respect of the uh, personal independence payment, as for the most part they will lack the necessary training and the skills to undertake this specialised role. For these reasons, I urge members to reject uh, Amendments 36, 37 and uh, 57. Turning now, Mr uh, Speaker, and we are trying to work our way to a conclusion on these, Amendments 38 and 39, and they relate to Clause 80 and the prospective test for personal independence payment. Perhaps it would assist the House, and I'm sure you're uh, all wanting to have this information impart it to you so that you'll all be better informed on, on this issue. But if I would just take a step back and reiterate what Clause 80 does. Clause 80 is linked with clauses 67 and 79. Sorry. Clause 80 is linked with clauses 77 to 79 and makes provision uh, related to what constitutes the required period condition for entitlement to either component or personal independence payment. To qualify for help, claimants must one, have needed help for three months or more. This is known as the qualifying period. Or secondly, be likely to need help for the next nine months. This is known as the prospective test period. Member 38 proposes changing the prospective test period to six months. Amendment 39 is consequential on Amendment 38 and defines when the six-month period commences. The current mechanism in attendance allowance and DLA to establish that a condition is likely to be long-term or through the operation of a qualifying period during which no benefit can be paid and a prospective test. For attendance allowance, a person needs to meet the six-month qualifying period. For DLA, a person must meet a three-month qualifying period and a six-month prospective test. The qualifying period is passed if someone has established that they would have met the conditions of entitlement to the uh, attendance allowance or either the component part of DLA in the previous three six months, and that is measured from when the benefit can first become payable. And this prospective period is passed if someone is likely to meet those conditions for entitlement for a further six months. Although the criteria for establishing that a disability is likely to be long-term operates slightly differently from attendance allowance uh, and DLA, they both serve the same purpose, to ensure that support is focused on those who face the greatest challenge in taking part in everyday life. Key, and I would underscore this, key to the reform of DLA is that the entitlement to personal independence payment should be on an individual-based approach rather than by labelling people according to their disability or their particular impairment. The objective is to avoid the current situation where a specified impairment or diagnosis leads to automatic entitlement. In this way, we would endeavour to ensure that benefit is better targeted towards those with assessed long-term needs. In the DLA reform, consultation, the government set out its proposals to restructure the existing qualifying period and prospective tests for uh, PIP so that the overall period covered by the tests more closely align with the general definition of long-term disability used within the Disability Discrimination Act 1995 and the associated guidance. It is felt that a three-month qualifying period and a nine-month prospective test offers the fairest solution both to claimants and to the sound administration of the benefit. Therefore, to ensure support goes to those with the greatest need, the uh, personal independence payment will be available only to those with a long-term health condition or impairment rather than a short-term condition where other financial and in-kind support mechanisms already exist. The impact of most health conditions on the disabilities can fluctuate over time. Taking a view of ability over a longer period of time helps to iron out fluctuations and presents a more coherent picture of disabling effects. The consultation document 
also made clear that we will bring forward into personal independence payment the existing provisions which allow for exemption from the qualifying period and prospective tests for people who are terminally ill. This will mean that terminally ill people will be able to get immediate payment for the enhanced rate of the uh, daily living component without having to demonstrate that they have severely limited ability to carry out any daily living activities. Immediate entitlement to either rate of the mobility component will also be available, subject to someone having the necessary limitations on their ability to carry out uh, the mobility activities. To summarise, the combined effects of the three-month uh, qualifying period on the nine-month prospective test in PIP will better align the definition of long-term disability with the generally used for the Disability Discrimina uh, Discrimination Act 1995 and its associated guidance. The required period condition will therefore continue to establish long-term disability within the context of a cash benefit payment to contribute towards the extra, co the extra costs of disability. For these reasons, Members, I would urge the rejection of amendments 38 and uh, 39. I then turn to the opposition to clause uh, 99. And clause 99 clarifies that the existing power in the Social Security Administration Northern Ireland Act 1992 to decide who should be paid benefits includes the power for the department to determine which of the persons should be paid in a joint award situation. Currently, payments of benefits are normally made to the claimant for couples. Ordinarily, only one partner will make the claim, with their partner's income and the capital taken into account, and rates paid accordingly. The exception is joint claimants of job seekers' allowance, where partners can decide between them who receives the payment. Universal credit policy is that couples living in the same household will make a joint claim for benefit, with the universal credit payment normally paid into one bank account. This is the default position in the rest of, uh, of Great Britain, with any different arrangement only available in exceptional circumstances. Flexibility secured for, the Northern, for Northern Ireland will mean that no default position will be applied here. There will be several options available, including split payments paid into separate bank accounts, and I think, again, that is something which is uh, to be welcomed and something which had been raised as a concern. Clause 99 also drafted ensures enough flexibility to pay as frequently as required. Uh, opposition to Clause 99 would remove this clause from the bill, which would limit any flexibility to determine which of the persons should be paid in a joint award situation. This would reverse the flexibilities and payment options which have been secured. So, therefore, I would urge members to reject the opposition. Amendment 43, uh, which proposes to insert a new clause in 100A on payments on awards in cash. I would advise members the simple payment service, which I alluded to earlier, was introduced in October 2012 for those claimants who cannot get their benefit paid into a bank, building society or credit union or post office card account. It is provided by a city bank working in partnership with Paypoint and was a replacement for payment of benefits and pensions by cheque. Simple payment service can also be used to make emergency and one-off payments where necessary. This method of payment provides a safe, secure and efficient means of allowing people to access their payments at a convenient uh, local outlet without the need to use a pin or, and pin pads and provides the flexibility required by those who rely on someone else to collect their money for them. Currently, almost uh, 1,500 claimants are being paid by this modern, secure and efficient uh, method of payment. This new clause is therefore not required, and I would urge members uh, to reject the proposed amendment. Turning to amendment number 44, which inserts a new clause at, 10, at 101A on payments pending appeal, the amendment adds a provision to section 5, uh, Mr. Speaker, of the Social Security Administration Northern Ireland Act 1992, for regulations to provide for the making of a payment uh, pending appeal. 
Perhaps it would be helpful if I explain that Section 5 of the Administration Act contains the enabling provisions in relation to claims and the payments of benef benefits that apply generally to the majority of Social Security benefits. Other than in certain employment and support allowance cases, it has never been the case that benefits is paid pending the outcome of an appeal. The cost of paying benefits to all appellants during the appeal process would be hugely expensive and would be an additional burden to the Northern Ireland Block Grant. In addition, consideration would have to be given to recouping the amount paid during the appeal period where the Tribunal upholds the original decision, thereby in increasing my department's administrative costs. I think that was a, an issue that was alluded to by my colleague, Mr. Wilson. I'd also uh, like to reassure members that the provision in this bill uh, do not alter the position in relation to the payment of employment and support allowance at the assessment phase rate pending the outcome of an appeal in relation to the work capability assessment. For those claimants who will be in receipt of universal credit when it replaces income-related ESA, where similar circumstances apply in that a claimant does not specify the work capability assessment, provision for payment of universal credit pending appeal is not required as the claimant can continue to receive universal credit under one of the other uh, conditionality provisions. For these reasons, I would urge members to reject uh, Amendment 44. Moving to Amendment 45, uh, Mr. Speaker. Amendment 45 proposes an amendment to Clause 103, which sets out when and how overpayments of benefit payments on account and certain hardship payments can be recovered when there has been uh, no misrepresentation or failure to disclose on the part of the person from whom the recovery is being sought. Where the Department makes a mistake, Claimants should not expect to have the right to keep taxpayers' money to which they are not entitled. Although most overpayments of universal credit, job seekers' allowance and employment and support allowance will be deemed recoverable in certain circumstances, the Department may decide that the overpayment or part of it does not have to be repaid. The circumstances in which action will be taken to recover overpayments will be governed by a code of practice in order to ensure consistent and considered decision making. Members need to remember that the money being recovered is public money and is a cost to the public purse which the Department has a responsibility to protect. I therefore urge members to reject Amendment 45. In relation to opposition to Clause 129, uh, I now come to that uh, particular clause uh, which is tabled. The purpose of Clause 29 was to amend Section 165 of the Social Security Administration Northern Ireland Act 1992 to correct a flaw in the legislation. Due to the delay in the progress of this bill, the National Insurance Contributions Act 2014 carried the required amendment and corrected this flaw. Therefore, Clause 129 of the bill is no longer required. I therefore urge members to accept and this is the position. Amendment 54. This amendment proposes to insert a new clause to provide that regulations under this Act are prepared in consultation with the Northern Ireland Commission for Victims and Survivors to ensure due regard is given to survivors of the past. When considering any new social security policy or change in that policy, like any other department or public body, the department is mandated by Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 to consider uh, an equality impact assessment on the proposed policy. Minister, if it just under, did you say 54 uh, when, you, when you meant 53, just for Sorry, the benefit of the record? Mr. Speaker, 53. Thank you for paying due regard and diligence to, uh, to that, and apologies for that. Uh, 53. Section 75 requires public authorities designated for the purposes of the Act to comply with two statutory duties. One of the duties is the Equality of Opportunity Duty, which requires public authorities in carrying out their functions relating to Northern Ireland 
to have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity between the nine uh, equality categories of persons or different religious belief, political opinion, racial group, age, uh, moral status or sexual orientation, men and women generally, persons with a disability and persons without and persons with dependence and persons without. As you can see, all categories of persons accommodate not only victims and survivors, but all particular individual groups, such as uh, pa patients who uh, would be uh, cancer patients. Any proposed change in policy or new policy is subject to equality screening with the focus of identifying any adverse impact on any of the Section 75 groups with regards to equality of opportunity. The Department also considers any mitigating measures which may be necessary to alleviate that impact. In screening the proposed policy, account is taken of evidence and information obtained from relevant stakeholders where necessary. Uh, the Equality Commission, Citizens Advice Bureau, the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Victims and Survivors. And could I say, just uh, on that particular issue in relation to the Northern Ireland Commission for Victims and Survivors, and I'm very aware of uh, the particular uh, sensitivities that there are around uh, that issue. And, my department is actively working with the Commission for Victims and Survivors, in particular over the impact of the introduction of PIP that may have on the most seriously injured victims. I had what I would describe as a difficult meeting. Not difficult in the sense of those who were coming to see me were in any way awkward or in any way uh, difficult to deal with difficult to deal with in this sense. As a reminder to us all of those people who in our society still to this day bear scars that none of us, none of us can begin to comprehend or understand. And I recently met with those victims to discuss the progress and the work which has been jointly commissioned by my predecessor and the Victims Commissioner to avoid victims being further traumatised by the experience of being assessed for PIP. Officials are also working with the Commission on a range of issues, including the PIP claimant journey, and I will continue to ensure that the Commission is consulted on a wide range of welfare issues. And I know that was an issue that was raised by a number of members. I give that commitment, and I give that personal commitment to ensure that that issue is uh, looked after and is uh, dealt with in a way which I believe reflects the point that was made to me, and, and I leave it here, is that there is a sense amongst those particular, that particular group that they've been forgotten. I want to ensure that they're not forgotten. Yeah. So for those reasons, as I said out in relation to the other comments, that I would ask members to reject Amendment 53. Amendment, yes. I also acknowledge uh, a very comprehensive response to the, to the debate, uh, which I think is the right way to uh, conduct the debate. And I, I have to say that uh, some of the answers, not put it any more than that, some of the answers have been helpful certainly to us. But given uh, what you have said in respect of victims and survivors, Given the sorry tale that existed previously in respect of how the VSS was operating, uh, given that you are entitled to name in legislation categories of person in terms of them being treated with due regard, that's happening already in respect of domestic violence victims, and given what you've just said in, in the powerful narrative about the experience of victims and that they should not be let down, does that all not lend to the conclusion? that a uh, provision, even in the uh, simple terms in legislation, is actually the right response to the right needs that you identify? Well, as I said, uh, and I think that I'll take the comments that the member has made and reflect on those in conjunction with the comments that I've made following on from the discussions that I had with the, the victims and survivors. And I, I said this to them, that it wouldn't be a one-off meeting. Uh, I had, and I don't want to name the member 
uh, of my staff who was there, but it wasn't the one that was uh, named earlier. Uh, but it is someone who is highly respected for the way in which uh, they deal with these issues. And I will give consideration to the comments that the member has made in the House tonight and reflect on what I've also said in relation to how I will deal with the issues in relation to the victims and survivors. Turning, Mr Speaker, to Amendment 74, uh, which relates to paragraph 6 of Schedule 1 and gives the Department the power uh, to make regulations to pay all or part of an award uh, by uh, uh, a voucher. If a claimant finds <coughs> that they are experiencing financial difficulties and have immediate needs, as a result of a sanction, they can apply for a hardship payment. With the launch of universal credit, hardship payments will be paid as any other universal payments, uh, but in the future consideration will be given to alternative methods of payment, such as by a voucher. This means of support will ensure that payment is spent on the needs of the family. Work is ongoing on developing an approach to the use of vouchers. And I recognise the sensitivities around the provision of the use of vouchers, and I would like to assure the House that where vouchers uh, or a voucher type system are being considered, that the focus would be very much on the dignity and choice of the claimant. The Department does not issue food vouchers, and I have to say has no plans so to do, and that was an issue that was raised by, uh, I think, Mr Beggs and others. Uh, so there is ongoing work in relation to this issue, and uh, I will be open to uh, further discussion uh, with uh, be interesting to hear the comments of the committee uh, in relation to this particular issue as we do further work in regards to this. To accept Amendment 74 would result in the Department being unable to make a hardship payment by voucher, which in some limited circumstances may be the uh, optimum way uh, to meet the family's needs. And for this reason, I would urge members to reject Amendment 74. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude. Um, I want to dispel the myth and the mist that somehow there was something that took place prior to Christmas in the Stormont Castle Agreement and in the Stormont House Agreement that was done behind closed doors and people don't know all about it. I can assure you as someone who was there for a considerable part of those discussions before Christmas and saw all the media that was out uh, in the grounds of this estate, it wasn't secretive. And I have no intentions of joining any secret organisation. But there is a paper, an executive paper, and that paper sets out I believe uh, the package of measures which was previously agreed, and we have heard uh, me make reference to those. There are the issues around the frequency of the universal credit payment, we have made reference to that. The split universal credit payments, we have made reference to that. The direct payments, uh, and you know, we could go down a list of things that uh, have been address and are in the public domain, the issues in relation to the social size criteria. And so there is still further work to be done. There is still further papers to be brought to the executive. But I have to say that I have been disappointed when I have seen, and with this point I will conclude, headlines in uh, the uh, newspapers which somehow allude to no one will be uh, out of pocket over a new welfare system pledge as minister, and then goes on to give a narrative which is based on one element of the welfare system, which is universal credit. So what we are introducing here is, I believe, GP, GB plus. But remember, we are, as an executive, making the decision that to have that done, we will be taking and funding that out of the block grant and not using our annual managed expenditure. That's a decision that the executive has made. That's the agreement that we have come to. And I think that it is time 
that collectively we ensure that that agreement is implemented. Because remember, there are many people who are watching this debate who are wanting simply to know are we making progress and that we don't have a situation which has been referred to. And I take the point that the member makes uh, in relation to how this has been rolled out in the rest of the United Kingdom. I do not want to be the minister who oversees something that is shambolic and something that is dysfunctional. I give it a commitment that I want to do it in a way that keeps people at the centre of what it is we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And I call Mr. Roy Beggs to wind. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is very significant legislation that will affect uh, individuals and families for perhaps decades to come. So it is right that we have spent the time that we have on it, even in this first group of amendments. But the abuse of the petition of concern, which was uh, widely recognised by all speakers other than those from the DUP and Sinn Féin is something that really shouldn't have happened. Alex Massey, Chair of the Social Development Committee, referred to the Stormont House Agreement and uh, a recent briefing uh, to the committee by the department and explained that a result of time and recent agreements that the collective committee opposition to many clauses uh, in the bill no longer stood. He then wrongly accused the Ulster Unionist Party of uh, failing to make any commitment to alter the bill over two years ago. Uh, he did not acknowledge that it was the Ulster Unionist Party that put several amendments over two years ago and uh, affecting issues such as uh, joint claims, frequency of payments, bedroom tax, medical uh, in investigations. And I would refer him to the Assembly website, Primary Legislation, Current Bills, where he will see the clear evidence that that occurred. I certainly will. Will the member also admit that he didn't acknowledge the commitment from the Ulster Unionist Party in creating the ad hoc committee into the human rights and equality requirements for the welfare reform bill, which if it hadn't been for this party, wouldn't have passed through the House at that time. And the rule that we actually paid in bringing forward that report, which his party actually voted against. Yeah. <coughs> I thank the member for, for reminding us all of that. It's, 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 it's right that that should be... Uh, uh, held on record. Paula Bradley argued that uh, amendments were not needed as change could be made through uh, regulations. Uh, I I'm pleased that the Minister uh, has accepted at least one amendment that is, has a constructive role, even though she would appear to have disagreed. However, she, on the issue of frequency of payments uh, and the issue of uh, um, she indicated her support for uh, twice monthly payments uh, as a default mechanism. She also pointed out that some individuals may require weekly payments uh, because of personal circumstances. Now, that, I have to admit that that did struck me by that important point that you, she made. And uh, I have to acknowledge it, that that is valid. And as a result, uh, I would not intend moving amendment number eight. Dolores Kelly Explain, sorry, that along with the Minister's uh, commitment to go for twice monthly payments, but to leave open the option that some people may actually require more frequent payments. Dolores Kelly explained her wish uh, to deliver a wide range of additional proposals uh, to augment the bill. However, what I did not hear was how additional payments will be funded, uh, what other public services uh, would have to be cut in order to, to fund them. When you add and change the legislation, there will be undoubted cuts. So that, that would be of a concern to myself. Stuart Dixon criticised the delays of, of over two years, commented on the agreement made at Stormont House, and suggested that well reform, welfare reform should be enacted with the uh, mitigating proposals that have been uh, included. And I think most people would agree that is, is a sensible way forward. Turning to Peter Robinson, speaking as leader of the DUP, he expressed opposition uh, to almost every amendment, that, uh, certainly any amendment that might cost uh, uh, any additional money at all. And uh, uh, <clears throat> he was satisfied with the, uh, the multiple misuse of the petition of concerned. He did not seem to recognise that uh, some of the amendments 
might have no or minimal cost implication, nor in fact that costs have been built in for some of those amendments. Uh, and he seemed to have also taken exception to myself, referring to almost 50 petitions of concern, uh, rather than, was it the 48? Somehow this was a very important issue. I'm afraid I failed to get it. I, almost 50 petitions of concern, I believe, to be abusive of this Assembly and the process, and it certainly wasn't designed to operate like that. And I almost I certainly will. I thank the member for giving way. Would the member be surprised to hear that the, the First Minister gave me the very clear impression yesterday he had no difficulty with how we intended to handle our amendments in this debate today, before he surprised us with the petitions of concern? Nothing would surprise me. Um, I, I, I almost thought that he wanted me to thank him for permitting this the Assembly to decide on the two issues where he decided not to put a petition of concern. I have to say I detected an arrogance from the, the, uh, uh, the leader of the DUP. What is wrong with this Assembly deciding on issues, uh, especially when, as I have said, uh, some of the amendments, uh, certainly I believe there are not cost implications, certainly no cost implications that have not already been catered for. Uh, and, and uh, in terms of that, I refer to, to Amendment Number 1, and I'll come back to that later, and also to Amendment 35. And I am pleased that the, uh, the Minister has, has uh, uh, indicated his uh, uh, support for Amendment 35. I think it's right that there should be a clear mechanism of providing me medical evidence. And as I've said over two years ago, this is an issue that's flagged up. When it comes to personal independence payments, uh, the bottom line is clear medical evidence must be provided, and when it is, it is usually the clinching factor in determining whether an application or appeal is won or lost. And if we allow a process to continue uh, um, with only that medical evidence coming in right at the very, very end, there is cost involved, of, of course. Um, so I think it is right that this. Uh, issue of medical evidence should be on the face of the bill, and I'm, I'm pleased that others have seen uh, fit to, to support that. Alex Atwood highlighted that he had never seen such abuse of a petition of concern before, uh, and rightly so. He highlighted this is uh, an abuse of this assembly. Um, he, he found it unacceptable that Peter Robinson expected that no amendments should be made unless approved in Room 106. And I have to say, this is a democratic assembly. Uh, we all have responsibilities for what we do, but we all should have freedom of thought uh, and be accountable for our actions. Uh, so I, I would concur with, his, with uh, 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 Mr. Atwood's thinking. Jim uh, Alistair criticised the secret agreement uh, and uh, the failure of the First Minister to publish the Stormont House uh, agreement, or was it the Stormont Castle? He, he, agreed with my view that the, the DUP petition of concern was designed actually perhaps to help his partners. A uh, bit of joint working going on here, I suspect. He highlighted the importance of the welfare uh, uh, cap to encourage some back to work and to energ help energise the local economy and sought clarity on the forthcoming regulations. He, I mean, he highlighted all of us uh, will have to scrutinise this issue. This is only the start of it. There will be much more work to be done, and that aspect is right. Uh, there will be much detailed work to be done, and as a recent appoint, uh, appointee to the Social Development Committee, I hope to pay my part in that. John O'Dowd highlighted the, that uh, welfare reform almost brought this assembly down, and that should not be forgotten. Certainly will. Will the member not uh, share my astonishment of the selective amnesia which seems to have befallen Ms Rodow today, given that he failed to mention the 40,000 letters issued in East Belfast, which led to flag protests, which led to uh, controversy on the streets and public order disputes, which actually caused strained relationships? Would he not also acknowledge, uh, and, and has Ms Rodow forgotten, that the ongoing uh, disgrace of the OTR letters of comfort uh, also had a role to play in, in, in the strained relationships, in Mr O'Dowd's words, between himself and his partners in the DUP? 
the member has strayed much away from the, the legislation, I, and I do not wish to be dr drawn to attention by the, by the deputy speaker and, and, and uh, following her lead. Uh, I will try to concentrate on, on, on the bill. Um, anyway, uh, uh, Mr. O'Dowd highlighted the continuing role, like, like others, of, of the, the committee, uh, the assembly, uh, and the executive. I have certainly no uh, disagreement with that. Pat, Pat Ramsey spoke of the importance of the Independent Livings Fund, and there was good dialogue uh, on that issue and how uh, it is it that has enabled many to continue to live in, in their homes. And with it coming to an end, there is real concern among some individuals and families that, uh, of what will come of them in the future, and they, they may, uh, unless something is put in place, be forced to leave their home and into residential homes or nursing homes. And I believe that that dialogue has occurred and will continue to occur uh, uh, and address that issue. Turning to Stephen Agnew, whilst I had referred to the uh, former Eastern European country, the D German Democratic Republic. He uh, added to the, the, the titles by the Democratic Republic of Korea and the Democratic Republic of Congo on top of the Democratic Unionist Party. And he agreed with my view that care should be taken when the word democratic is first in any, any title uh, because of what we've seen here today in terms of the, the abuse of the uh, petition of concern. He spoke against uh, much of the welfare reform and supported many what I would concern, have concerns about as being costly proposals. I have to remind member there are choices to be made and if we add additional costs that are not built in, it will have to come out of the block grant. It will have to uh, result in additional uh, reduced public services. If it was simply top slice, perhaps half that additional money would be taken away from our health department, which is already struggling. So, so I, I would have to uh, have that at the back of my mind when deciding with some of uh, his, his ideas, and I would not be able to, to support them. Sammy Wilson highlighted the bedroom tax that had been introduced several years ago, along with private sector uh, involvement in, in, in assessment. Um, but he defended the DUP abuse of the petition of concerned, and he failed to acknowledge uh, my, the Ulster Unis uh, Amendment Number One that it would be possible. Uh, I, may, I want to continue just to finish this. That it would be possible for the department to determine the regulations. And, and I noticed that when I did press the minister, he did use the term a, a preference that it would be dealt with in regulation. Uh, but that did not preclude uh, Amendment Number One. Uh, amendment number one would empower him to make such regulations. So therefore, I, I think it's uh, just a, a, a difference of opinion as how it uh, should arise. And again, I refer back to the, the important fact that the Ulster Unionists two years ago put down an amendment on this issue. This is not something that we came to lately as a result of the uh, uh, Stormont discussions, Stormont Castle discussions, Stormont House discussions. This is something that was identified two years ago as a key issue and what was being uh, worked on. Somebody will certainly. To Mr. Wilson's contribution was the member. Uh, uh, I'm also going to refer to his staunch su uh, support and defence of uh, Sinn Féin's position. I know that love is in the air and Valentine's Day approaches, but it is somewhat of an unusual courtship uh, to be had in this House today. <clears throat> I think we will all await uh, the, the various votes on amendments and see what way the petition of concern works out. Uh, and, and everyone may have a better understanding of what is occurring at that point. Um, Mr Wilson also uh, uh, supported my view on Amendment uh, 74 that the, the voucher system should be retained as an option. Obviously, uh, guidance will need to be developed and, and, and regulation uh, around it, but I think it would be premature uh, to exclude the possible use of voucher system uh, without at least investigating it further and considering it. Yes, I acknowledge that guidance will be required so that there is not, a, not abuse of it. So I'm, I definitely cannot support uh, Mr. Agnew's amendment number 79. John McCaster then supported the general principles that work should pay. I would hope that all of us will agree with that and would acknowledge that that is one of the factors that should come out of this welfare reform process. I hope that it does. Uh, he, he questioned why the DEP and Sinn Féin, with their members 
needed the petition of concern. I suspect he, he needs to just watch what will perhaps uncover and unfold uh, 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 in, in the, the minutes following the, the closure of this debate and the votes occurring. Minister uh, Story then uh, um, indicated he was tasked to deliver a safe and secure welfare system for Northern Ireland, and, and that's important that we do uh, provide it. And he did also highlight this still ongoing penalty that hangs over us if we fail to implement it and incur additional costs that are not being uh, incurred elsewhere. Uh, I, again, I have said earlier, uh, in terms of amendment number one, I, I did pick up that he, he seemed to uh, express a preference for his way of doing it with his officials through, through regulation rather than having amendment one on the face of the bill. But having had an amendment for over two years, uh, I and my colleagues uh, would disagree and uh, we believe that that could be in, uh, implemented in a reasonable way, fashion. Uh, let's just allow the democratic process to uh, continue and to, to decide. There were accusations that, that Ulster units were, were grandstanding. Um, and again, just to remind members again, on the 10th of April 2013, a wide range of amendments were placed by my colleague Robin Swan and Michael Copeland, covering split payments, um, the frequency of payments, uh, the relevance of medical e evidence and, and, and bedroom ta tax. And these have turned out to be the key issues. I have to give them credit of the foresight of having identified those issues two years ago. And I think if we look as an assembly as to how these issues are being dealt with, they are being dealt with differently uh, than what was originally proposed. And I am pleased for the progress that we are making. Um, the, the, uh, where will I go from here? The, uh, in, in, in coming to my close, um, I have indicated that uh, one of the, the amendments in my name, amendment number, uh, if I can pull it up here, amendment, it is gone. The uh, amendment number eight, I believe, amendment number eight, the frequency of payments, I, I would intend not moving. Uh, also, explanation from the Minister regarding Amendment No. 18. Um, I would have viewed it as a, prob a probing amendment. Uh, I, I think it is worthwhile to have the openness and the discussion around it. Uh, it would not, also not be my intention to move Amendment No. 18. However, uh, Amendment 1 and uh, Amendment uh, 35 in my name and that of Robin Swan uh, we would be intending to continue to, uh, to uh, support them, and I hope that other members uh, uh, in the Assembly will also see uh, the validity with these amendments and will also be able to uh, uh, support us to try and bring about improvements to the Bill and to ensure that we do deliver uh, the best form of welfare uh, reform legislation that we are able to do so within the financial means that are available to us. Thank you. Order. Amendment 1 proposed to clause 4, page 3, line 5, at end insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. Before I put the question, I would remind members that Amendment 1 requires cross-community support due to a valid petition of concern. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
order. Members will resume their seats, please. Members will resume their seats. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. Sorry, silence, please. So I could ask for silence before about the question. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Country no. no. Do we have tellers? Order, please. Sorry, could members please resume their seats and could we have some silence? <laughs> You're a terrible noisy lot. Tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Robin Swan and Roy Beggs. Tellers for the nose are Adrian McQuillan and George Robison. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, <coughs> nose to my left.
Carry the doors.
order. Members will resume their seats. Order. Members will resume their seats, and that means members sit down. Order, please. Clark, read the result. 98 members voted, of which 27 voted aye, 27.6%. 40 nationalists voted, of which 12 voted aye, 30%. 51 unionists voted, of which 14 voted aye, 27.5%. Seven others voted, of which one voted aye, 14.3%. The amendment falls. The amendment falls. Unfasten the doors. <coughs> Order, please. I really do need silence. We now come to the second group of amendments for debate, which contains 14 amendments and oppositions to nine clauses. These amendments deal with entitlement to benefit, including the housing and child care components, the benefit cap and housing size criteria. <laughs> Members will note that Amendment 48 is mutually exclusive with Amendment 50. Amendment 52 is consequential to Amendment 51. Members will also note that valid petitions of concern have been received in relation to amendments 2, 5 to 7, 27 to 29, 42, 48, 50, 73 and 75. Therefore, they will require cross-community support. I call the Chairperson for Social Development, Mr Alex Maskey, to address the Committee's oppositions and to address the other amendments and oppositions in the group. Mr Maskey. Good afternoon, Mr. Um, speaking obviously as the chair of the Social uh, Development Committee, I just want to uh, remind the House of the, uh, the fact that the committee did, uh, of course, express opposition to a number of clauses in this particular uh, group, uh, clauses 4, 10, 12, 52, 54 and 69. And I would like to just outline... Uh, order, please. Uh, those members leaving, will you please leave quietly so that we can hear what the chairperson is saying? As I said earlier on this morning, that uh, it was not my intention on behalf of the committee to uh, move any of the uh, opposition to any of the particular clauses, but I do think it's important to remind the House what the concerns actually were, and that's in appreciation of all of the members who participated in the discussions and the deliberations on the bill, and of course, equally importantly, all of those stakeholders who very uh, generously of their time. Uh, contributed to the discussion and the debate within the chamber and within the, uh, the committee's deliberations. And I want to again place on record my thanks on behalf of the committee to the, the staff and to the clerks, to the members of the committee and to all of those people who did come uh, to the committee and uh, express their concerns and their views entirely on the bill itself. And I want to thank them all for that. Uh, the committee originally had uh, some serious concerns regarding Clause 4. And this specifically related to the situation where one partner in a relationship was prepared to sign a claimant commitment, but the other person wasn't, and as a result, neither would receive a payment. This was a result of the requirement for joint claims to be made, and the committee believed this to be unfair. The committee was also concerned with the removal of the severe disability premium under Clause 12, and therefore sought to oppose it. Uh, the Last concluded, the Clause 52 refers to the period of entitlement uh, for contributory allowance. In its report, the committee asked the Minister uh, to explore the possibility of extending this period for more than 12 months. I would also note that in the recent discussions, it became clear that some 80 per cent of people uh, returned to work within a year of making, uh, first making a claim, so the costs associated with a longer period would not be as great as first envisaged. And that's, that's good news. Um, uh, the committee noted in its report that until Clause 54 came into operation, there was provision under Paragraph 4 of Schedule 1 of the Welfare Reform Act 2007 for claimants on the basis of youth to qualify for contributory ESA without having to meet the paid national insurance contributions. And at the time, the committee noted no new claims would be allowed when this clause came into operation. 
The committee, therefore, was particularly concerned about the impact this would have on young people with disabilities. At the time, the Department noted that almost 97 per cent of those people to whom this provision currently applies would not be affected by the change and that new claimants may qualify for income-related ESA. However, given the comparative low, comparatively low cost of maintaining the current provision, some groups in fact, estimate this was around £390,000 per year at the time. The Committee recommended that the Minister discuss this issue at the Executive Committee with a view to making funds available to maintain the current arrangements. And last on Corley Housing benefit in terms of clause 69, the determination of appropriate maximum as it was described as, generated considerable debate at committee during our consideration of the bill as it has often been in the media ever since. The size criteria and under occupancy in particular have raised serious concerns and this issue has become better known as the bedroom tax. In a nutshell, where a property is deemed to have one extra bedroom, the housing benefit would be reduced by 14 per cent. Where there are two extra bedrooms deemed, this will be reduced by 25 per cent. And the committee heard that upwards of 32,500 tenants in the social housing sector will be deemed as under-occupying and therefore subject to a reduction in benefits, as I have outlined. Uh, last and call again. Uh, thankfully, as a result of ongoing negotiations over the last couple of years, including and in particular the Stormont House Agreement and within the new arrangements under that, then we have been able to put in place uh, arrangements uh, that will ensure that no one will be subject to a reduction in their housing benefit. Of course, last and call, as I said this morning, it will be a matter for each individual member of the committee and indeed their parties to take their own views or that of their party on these matters. And I hope that I would be able to adequately reflect those views when I wind on the debate to, on Group 2 amendments later on this evening. And as I say, just that, uh, to formally re re repeat that uh, as the Chair of the Social Development Committee, I will not be uh, expressing opposition to any of the above clauses. Order, please. I am reluctant to point out that there are members who are engaged in continuous conversations, and that is discourteous to the uh, members who are speaking. It also makes life difficult for me because I may not hear what is being said. So can I appeal to those who want to have a long conversation, there are plenty of other places in the building to do it. I call Mrs Dolores Kelly. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And again, in moving the amendments as tabled on behalf of the SDLP, uh, we will take account of uh, the Minister's um, contribution at the end of the debate. Some of them are indeed probing amendments, and we will uh, look to see uh, what assurances he can give in allowing some of the concerns which I will be raising on behalf of the party uh, in relation to these particular amendments. So, Amendment 2, uh, Mr Speaker, reduce, uh, is a proposal to reduce the waiting day provision from a maximum of seven days to three days. We believe seven days is too long and seven waiting days at the start of a claim is currently the practice for Job Seekers Alliance and ESA. And I believe this is an opportunity uh, to rectify that. Um, if I might also refer to Amendment 27, which has uh, been tabled by Mr Stephen Agnew and signed by our by us, uh, that, which deals with removing uh, the time limiting aspect for ASA youth claimants. And we need, uh, we believe, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, to protect young people. Contribution based ASA should be afforded to young people as well as uh, to adults to ensure protections for them and their households. We are advised by DSD that Department is to bring an amendment to afford this protection. Uh, but we don't see it here today. Uh, we will therefore be awaiting with interest what the Minister uh, commits to uh, this evening. In Amendment uh, 28, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this uh, is unless uh, the claimant, uh, we're, we're adding in the words, unless the claimant had made contributions before the commencement of this Act. Uh, the Department is claiming this is unnecessary, but the intention is the same as the above, and it's again an attempt to find a workable solution to protect sick young persons. Uh, again, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we will await to hear uh, the Minister's response in relation to uh, that amendment. Uh, and there's opposition, uh, Mr Speaker, for, in, to uh, amendments 61 and 63, and these, uh, this clause ensures that claimants can only receive contributory JSA, ASA, maternity allowance or statutory payments if they're entitled to employment. Um, th this, uh, 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, has been brought uh, forward by ourselves because of concerns that have been articulated to uh, us and to others in relation to the rights of migrant workers in particular. And, uh, we, we believe uh, that the social security measures, which is uh, coordinated by EU member states on the basis of established principles of the EU law, including free movement of workers and equal treatment. Uh, during the committee stage, there were some concerns that these clauses may not comply uh, with EU law. Uh, and again, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we will be keen to hear what the Minister has to say and the assurances that we can get in relation to uh, this aspect of uh, the bill. I then, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, turn my attention to our opposition to Clause 69, which is known uh, as uh, the bedroom tax under occupancy rule. And, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you will know that we have signed our, our signal to opposition and indeed signed a petition as has uh, Stephen Agnew signed the SDLP Petition of Concern. Uh, we believe uh, it is um, regrettable that Sinn Féin uh, no longer can support the view of their own um, Deputy First Minister when he gave a commitment at Sinn Féin's Ardesh in April 2013 that they in fact would deploy uh, a Petition of Concern in relation to this. I did hear what uh, the Chair of the committee did say in relation to uh, some of the assurances that we have been given and how some of the um, migrate, uh, uh, mitigation factors will provide comfort and no one will lose out on housing benefit over the um, next five years. But we are concerned, Mr Deputy Speaker, what would happen beyond that. And uh, other uh, devolved assemblies, most notably the Scottish Assembly, has also uh, abolished uh, this bedroom tax clause. We, we know it was a model put forward by the Tories to deal with the uh, South East England, and it has, severe, has had severe repercussions right across uh, GB. Uh, we also uh, note that the Labour Party, if uh, uh, the win, uh, the election in May have given a commitment that they too would abolish the bedroom tax. Uh, well, give way, yes. Time we're giving way. Well, maybe, because uh, I'm sure many people, in fact thousands of people in the private sector who do not get rent or uh, housing benefit for the additional room which they have in their properties, uh, will be puzzled that the SDLP are actually the people they have to thank for that reduction in their housing benefit, and yet uh, now the SDLP are the champions of those who are in the public sector. Maybe you should explain to them why there has been this vote face by the um, SDLP on this particular issue. Um, <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe if there has been any uh, vote face, as Mr Wilson would say, is by, is by none other than his good self, because he voted against the Welfare Reform Bill in another place, but yet he is uh, the champion from the back bench here in relation to the Welfare Reform uh, Bill. And I am sure I do not need any member of this House need to spell out to them the particular needs of Northern Ireland and the communities that we serve in relation to the difficulties uh, of finding alternative accommodation. One, it does not exist. Two, where it does, uh, if any does exist, it is in areas where people do not feel safe to live. And because of, we have not yet dealt with building reconciliation on this island and between our two communities, particularly here in Northern Ireland, uh, it is a sad reflection that people cannot. Uh, live where they may wish to live uh, because of a fear of intimidation and threat. So um, the bedroom tax has a, a particular resonance uh, for uh, the public here in Northern Ireland and uh, as Mr Wilson and others will know it is something that many people are very concerned about. People talk when they own their own homes about downsizing when their family uh, grows up and leaves the home but you know for many people particularly people as they uh, are living longer and growing older it is the support network of neighbours and friends which is actually saving arguably the health service and other uh, public health public sector services a lot of money by that good neighbour support that we often find within our local communities. So we, we know that uh, the Stormont House Agreement did brought forward uh, uh, commitments to uh, mitigating against uh, the ravages of uh, the bedroom tax, but um, th we do not see anything here. And again, it is in the absence of uh, a final uh, executive approval in relation to all of the flexibilities and mitigating factors. And I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a well-known uh, phrase or... Uh, uh, um, 
uh, whatever it is, that uh, success has many authors. And I note uh, that uh, mem many members, particularly of the DUP, paid um, tribute to uh, the previous minister in relation to uh, his development and gaining of a number of uh, mitigating factors and flexibilities. But I think uh, it would be remiss uh, of me if I did not pay tribute to my own party colleagues, the former ministers Margaret Ritchie and Alex Atwood, who led the charge at uh, DWP in actually, in actually securing, securing uh, those commitments and the ability to have the flexibilities. I do hear something from the back benches to my right. I'm glad they've actually decided to say something to make a contribution in this particular debate. I will give way. Could I suggest, Mr. Speaker, to the member that if, come the elections next year, her political career comes to an end, she should certainly have a career in fiction. Because, in terms of writing fiction, the reality is that all the hard work in relation to DWP was done by the department, by myself, and by this party, and the input from her party was zero. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, uh, I heard what the member said. I, uh, he will forgive me for not accepting uh, what he has said uh, because uh, that particular member was too busy fighting fires created by himself and his party right across the department and has enmeshed uh, the uh, committee in, in having to. Uh, complete inquiry report after inquiry report into allegations against his behaviour as Minister. Order, please. I, I, um, I, I hope the member has picked up that I do need her to, go, to move back to the debate. And once again, I have to appeal to a small number of members who want to ignore me. They are continually in conversation that is discourteous to the people uh, who are making the contribution to the debate, and it is making life for me very difficult when the conversation I hear is the one to my right rather than Mrs Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, so we have today again honoured our commitment to the people that we gave over two years ago in standing against uh, the bedroom tax. And we are pleased that the Green Party has stood with us. And it is uh, also a matter of regret that the Alliance Party, who have proved themselves worthy poodles of the DUP Sinn Féin diktat, uh, who have not actually submitted any amendments nor spoken in relation to this. No, I want to move on as the Deputy Speaker. But I will, I will, I will give, will I give way, of course. Can I thank the member for giving me, because I know she has a lot to be covering, but the member is referring uh, a few minutes ago, well, actually, on the, the question of the bedroom tax, and seems to suggest she heard it was that was in the, in the Stormont House Agreement, but doesn't see anything in front of us. But was the member who is a deputy leader of her own party not accepted her party signed on to the uh, Stormont House Agreement, and in particular, the first bullet point was the tenants and social housing will be protected from the bedroom tax. Now, does the member who is a deputy leader of the SDLP not accepted her party leader, Alison Macdonald, signed on that commitment. It's in black and white in the Storm and House Agreement. So how can the member suggest that she's not quite sure what was agreed? I don't believe, uh, Deputy Speaker, that I did suggest, because I actually have the Storm and House Agreement on the table before me, and I read out the six lines that, within the agreement that deals with uh, the uh, Welfare Reform Bill. And I do accept, and I did say, that there have been mitigating factors already agreed and flexibilities put into the budget that will actually mitigate against the bedroom tax. It's not abolished, and that's what we would want to see uh, from our party's perspective. And we do acknowledge that this, uh, the agreement as, we, as I understand it, uh, is uh, only for five years. We would want to see it abolished forever. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Speaker, if I then, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I then move on to Amendment uh, 42 and deal with the benefit cap. Um, uh, this is something uh, which we are very concerned about. We know uh, that already uh, the uh, benefit cap uh, proposal is being. Uh, uh, capped uh, at 26,000, but the Tories have only in the last few weeks said that their first action of re-elected would be to reduce this to 23,000, which would affect thousands of families in Northern Ireland. £26,000 cap does not uh, affect uh, huge numbers. It affects about 600 families, I understand, in relation to Northern Ireland. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, in case people are wondering 
just you know who, who actually is getting £26,000. I think, as Mr Alistair said in his earlier contribution, that would you know equate to a salary of uh, in, in the about £33,000 uh, before you'd have that sort of take-home pay. But I, in my constituency, Mr Deputy Speaker, have families who have four and more disabled children in the house, and they are uh, they are providing care at home uh, for their children. And I think there should be an acknowledgement that there are some exceptional circumstances that people find themselves in. And some of that does actually mean that they do have bigger houses and bigger homes. But that's usually because of the adaptations that are required for uh, physical mobility and, uh, and personal care assistance. So uh, I, I um, am very worried on behalf of those individuals who are some of the most vulnerable. And these people, again, Mr Deputy Speaker, are saving the state, if you like, huge sums of money for but because they choose to care for their children at home. And not only have the Tories said they might go to 23,000 in terms of a cap, there's even some suggestion that it might go down to 18,000. And as I said in my earlier contribution, Mr Deputy Speaker, you know, uh, it, it's all right to say about people going back to work and getting good contracts. But as we know, a lot of the jobs on offer are low pay, uh, short hours, temporary contracts, very little in the way of protections or rights, and many of them have zero based our contracts. So, you know, set that against the backdrop of what the Tories are doing and who the Tories' friends are and what motivates the Tories. You know, the, the motivation of the Tories is to attack the public sector and to attack the welfare state, and indeed, many might say, the health service. So, I think this is a stand that we should make and take the opportunity to speak out. Uh, against uh, the, 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 the worst ravishes of a Tory-led government. If I move on, then, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to Amendment 50 and, indeed, Amendment 48 uh, in relation to uh, independent advice. The Amendment 48 has been tabled uh, by the Ulster Unionist Party. Again, we will uh, listen to what the Minister has to say in relation to this amendment and the commitments given. But uh, we do believe that uh, there has to be uh, strong, impartial, independent advice that puts the needs of uh, the service user at the forefront. And I was very encouraged uh, by uh, the humanity and compassion shown by the Minister as he fully appreciates that behind each of these uh, uh, measures, there are people and individuals and families who are suffering. And I, I do accept the good faith of the Minister in, in his um, commitment to actually putting people first and at the heart and centre of this legislation. However, Mr Speaker, there are uh, stories emerging from GB and England in particular that some Social Security Agency staff have been put under pressure by the Tory paymasters and actually uh, 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 taken people off benefit and we don't uh, uh, want to have that sort of situation arising here and we do want to hear uh, that there will be good solid advocacy services available uh, to people who are finding themselves uh, within uh, the uh, welfare system. So uh, Mr Speaker, if I then, uh, Deputy Speaker, if I then turn to um, uh, some of uh, Mr Agnew's amendments, just to, to touch on them, uh, and we will also uh, hear closely what he has to say and listen closely to what he has to say, uh, but we welcome in general his amendments which aim to provide the most protection possible for claimants, and that's what we hear is at the heart of his policy uh, proposals in relation to these clauses. So uh, I understand that Amendment 5 seeks to maintain the current system that exists under tax credits in which the the disabled child element of benefits equates to two-thirds of the severely disabled child element. Amendment 6 gives claimants a transition period of a year in which benefits for a young person are supposed to be reduced because the young person has become too old or maintained at the current rate, and this gives claimants a uh, better time for uh, transition. Amendment 7, amendments to have housing cost element of universal credit to continue for four weeks after a claimant starts employment, again to ease the transition period. And people do not tend to get a wage uh, the moment uh, they get a new job. And I'm sure that's something that there could be some uh, cognizance given off and some flexibilities within uh, the guidance or regulations in terms of the imposition or, or, or withdrawal of entitlement, Mr Deputy Speaker. So uh, with that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I finish my contribution. Call Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. 
The uh, amendments in regards to entitlements before us relate to some of the most contentious parts of the welfare reform bill, notably the so-called bedroom tax. This is perhaps the most well-known and indeed galvanising element of this bill. The removal of the spare room subsidy is one of the most cynical reforms made by a Conservative-led government. The policy cited as a means of dealing with the under-occupation of social housing. I will. Would he accept that, first of all, all of us recognise the difficulties with the spare room subsidy being removed, but would he also accept that it was not just a cynical exercise by the Conservative government, but indeed an SDLP minister has already imposed it on tens of thousands of tenants in the private sector, which is the most costly sector here in Northern Ireland. And not a word about it. I agree. The policy cited as a means of dealing with under-occupation of social housing has resulted in the demonisation of those in receipt of housing benefits, 500,000 of whom across the UK are actually in work. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the tax has been a failure in England, with only 6% of those affected moving to a smaller home. In the meantime, a huge amount of undue distress, debt and punitive measures have been levied upon the most vulnerable in society, alongside the extra cost to local authorities uh, charged with housing. Rent arrears are up by 26% as a result of this policy, alongside fuel and food poverty. The policy also ignored the need by many people with disabilities to have that extra space, that extra room, whether to store medical equipment for their care or for their carers to sleep, or for households reduced in size as a result of separation. Furthermore, housing associations in England have reported that many people wish to downsize, but to put it simply, smaller homes aren't there. To illustrate that, 180,000 tenants were judged to be under-occupying two-bedroom homes, yet only in the rest of the UK 85,000 smaller houses were available. This reflects the very crux of the matter. For years, governments have sold off social housing stock, but failed to reinvest the revenue in the construction of new social housing to replace that moving into the private sector. To penalise the poorest in our society for the lack of long-term planning at the highest level of government is indeed perverse. For Northern Ireland, however, the size, distribution and organisation of our housing stock only makes this policy, designed for larger cities in the south of England, even more unworkable. It is fortunate, therefore, uh, Deputy Speaker, that we are able to implement meaningful mitigation measures in regards to this policy. Again, we have agreed these special measures with Treasury, we cannot and should not go back on those agreements, undermining concessions are gained. Interesting, in response to Mr Wilson, it's a pity those concessions weren't gained earlier on in all of these processes. That would be a betrayal of those who would otherwise be affected by these punitive measures. I believe it is important that we allow the Department the flexibility to alleviate the effects of the bedroom tax in the context of the wider departmental resources, as agreed by and it bears repeating again all of the executive parties. The one size fits all implementation in Britain is unsustainable. I'm nearly finished. The, the one size fits all implementation in Britain is unsustainable, unjust and irrational. And therefore I do support the amendments brought forward by the Department with regards to the mitigation policy. Deputy Speaker, ultimately the decision on the continuation or the abolition of the veteran tax will be made at Westminster. That's where those decisions will be made. And I hope that a future government will reverse that. The Alliance Party and our MP, Naomi Long, fought this unjust policy on the floor of the House of Commons, while others shirked their representative role and stood shouting from the sidelines. In regards, they're sitting to my right. In regards to the general issue of entitlements in this bill, I think it's important that we have a clear vision of Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland that we are seeking to build. A competitive Northern Ireland, less dependent on welfare, with investments in skills, education, infrastructure and attraction for the jobs of the future. 
a more just Northern Ireland where a fair day's, pay, fair day's work returns a fair day's pay and where the state is no longer required to subsidise poverty wages and people are better off in work than they are on benefits. Nonetheless, in Northern Ireland, where the social security net supports victims of circumstances and vitally breaks the cycle of poverty in which so many find themselves trapped, this crucially involves the provision of good quality social housing. In concluding, Deputy Speaker, I am content that these concessions that have been negotiated and agreed will ensure that Northern Ireland will not have the worst effects of this poorly thought out and mean-spirited policy. I would therefore support the amendments that have been agreed and brought forward by the Minister. But I wish to place on record again my previous point with regards to skills, education and infrastructure. As representatives and legislators, we need to and must now get down to the job of building a united, shared and prosperous Northern mm -hmm. Ireland fit for the 21st century that will deliver for everyone and protect the most vulnerable. Thank you. Well, Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I welcome this opportunity to speak on the second group. Uh, despite the sheer arrogance demonstrated by the DUP in effectively potentially killing off 12 of the 14 possible amendments in this group, Amendment number 2 seeks to reduce the prescribed period from seven days to three. I am not convinced on the merits for such a change, not least uh, having a period of seven days. Uh, will have in many circumstances, it, it will make sense. I do understand that for some claimants this week-long hiatus may cause some difficulty, but wages and salaries are normally paid uh, monthly or perhaps weekly, so there can be a delay uh, from uh, when you work and when you receive uh, payment. However, we must be conscious of implications where we propose uh, uh, reducing it to only a few days. There would be an immediate additional administrative burden on the department who are forced into the position of having to process a greater number of very short-term claims. It would also have financial implications for the executive, as I very much doubt if DFP will simply foot the bill for us issuing additional short-term claims. What will be the additional administrative costs? What will be the additional cost in, in benefits? Um, of course, these additional costs we could expect to come off the block grant. What will be the cost of the services that will be lost uh, in return? Mr. Ignews, in Amendment No. 5, is again touching on an issue which I feel the Social Development Committee has spent a great deal of time considering. By moving to a two-tier system as opposed to a three-tier, it is likely that some families with a disabled child will see a reduction in their support. That is of concern. However, there are a number of points to uh, make in respect of this. Firstly, I would expect that families would be fully protected within the transitional support for the universal uh, uh, credit. Uh, so they would, in actual fact, see no reduction. And I would ask the Minister if he could confirm that that, in fact, would be the case due to that protection. Importantly, however, as has been said, whilst families uh, such as those with a new claims would be worth less off, many would also see increase through the higher rate child addition. I understand that the universal credit rate payment to severely disabled children will be very slightly higher than the current child tax credit equivalent, and that has to be welcome. I am aware that the previous high-level exercises carried out by the Department has indicated that there uh, have been more losers and winners, with 6,000 children likely to receive more, but with 7,500 who would have received less but for the built-in protection. So if we take those 7,500 young people and carry out over future claims some, some point in the future, I, I would estimate this might well be seven or eight million pounds. Uh, that is something that has to be calculated into any decision. It may well be more than that, and again, it would uh, be welcome if someone could put some degree of estimate and costs on that. And of course, there will be additional associated costs for administration, which uh, would also have to be catered for. So the Ulster Unionist Party will not subsequently uh, be able to support this amendment, uh, a huge unknown cost. Uh, uh, and 
lack of clarity as to what would be lost as a result. <coughs> uh, and again, if we were to look at the overall budget, and if top slicing were to occur, we'd expect half that cost to come off the health budget, potentially. It has to come from somewhere. Um, <coughs> I believe that the battle for this issue should be at Westminster. Uh, uh, and if it were changed at a national UK level, uh, there would not be corresponding implications uh, for, for our limited budget here. Moving on to Amendments 6 and 7 from Mr. New, both relate to uh, the housing element of universal credit. The first suggests that people be afforded a year's grace before any reduction. Uh, we will be opposing this, not least on the grounds that contributing to right rent uh, uh, is, is appropriate when one can afford it if someone uh, 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 finds new employment is uh, appropriate that they should be contributing to it. Um, the other housing related uh, amendment number seven allows people to continue to claim their housing element for a period of up to four weeks uh, after they, they, they find employment. I will listen to what a uh, member has to say. However, I must tell him at this moment in time it would be my intention to oppose it. Uh, I note that he has passed the powers to the department and it is a may instead of a shall. Nevertheless, if a claimant starts taking home an income which lifts them out of the category requiring support, then I believe that a person will in most circumstances understand why they have had an element of support removed from them. Uh, <coughs> again, uh, I would uh, highlight that this additional cost were it to be uh, borne would have to be coming out from our limited funds. Uh, and that, is that really where we wish to uh, spend some of our, our limited funds? Uh, we have choices to, be, to, to make, uh, and I would question this as such a choice. Yes, I will. Thank the member for giving way, and, and I'll give him credit. I think he, he, he's given each of the amendments the, the time they deserve. But he keeps coming back to where we would put our money. And, it, it, it just seems strange for me that a party that's willing to uh, support proposals to reduce well or reduce corporation tax at a cost of up around, in around three hundred and thirty million pounds per year is struggling over something that will help uh, in, in the case of the the housing benefit uh, grace period of four weeks people get back into work um, it just seems to be in Congress that that small amount of money can't be supported. Um, and we're talking about making work pay. Well, this is an amendment to help do exactly that. The, the member raises uh, an interesting dilemma. But the choice we have today is do we take money out of other departments from the health budget or somewhere else today in order to carry out uh, the member's proposed amendments? Uh, certainly, uh, from my own personal perspective, I think it's good uh, if we can achieve the ability uh, to determine uh, uh, corporation tax levels at some point in the future. That is something which should be grasped uh, and cherished because it could bring about significant benefit. However, as of yet, I'm not aware of discussions as to timing and amounts and commitments. And when it comes to that, equally, we will all have to carefully assess what the costs would be and what the benefits would be. At present, I am looking at this legislation. I am looking at the amendments that the member is proposing and what the costs would be and what the benefit would be. Uh, and I am fearful, particularly uh, as a former member of the Health Committee, of uh, more and more uh, uh, additional costs which will have to be held uh, from our limited block grant and which would badly impinge some of the most vulnerable in our society who are uh, ill or needing treatment from our health service. Yes, I will. You also accept that if the principle that once someone is in work, they should make a contribution to the rent in a property where they're living, whether it's with their parents or their friend or whatever. If that principle is accepted, then it has to be accepted across the range of everybody who is earning money. Um, so, th therefore, this four-week uh, period seems to be a rather odd proposal um, because you're going to treat people who are in permanent or who have been worked for a longer time differently. And would you also accept if the argument is that you've got to make work pay, that then you extend that forever? 
um, I mean, if that's, if that's the argument that by taking housing benefit off people, um, then you, you're, you're not making work pay, then you would, you would continue it indefinitely. One of the core principles that I understand with the, the universal credit process is that work will pay. So even someone who has started work immediately, they should be financially better off than where they were uh, in uh, receiving benefits. So even though they will be required to make a contribution towards their housing costs, they should nevertheless still be significantly, certainly will be better off than they would have been uh, had they not commenced employment. Um, I thank the member for giving way. I don't want to detain the member, but um, this is uh, a, an important point. The whole thrust of um, thinking in relation to welfare reform is to get people back into work. Uh, and if somebody is going back into work but sees that uh, part of the obstacle of getting back into work is, for example, waiting until the expiration of one month uh, to get paid, then in those circumstances, is it not reasonable to allow a period of grace of four weeks so that that person can actually get into a position where he will be able or she will be able uh, to pay uh, that additional burden in terms of rent? It would be uh, very nice if we had uh, a pot of funding that we could set aside and, and do that. But that is not my experience of how public service expenditure is currently operating. I understand every department is under severe pressure. And if additional money is to be made available for this, much as I can have sympathy, I can see benefit of, of it. But if additional money is to be made available for this, money will be having, having to be taken away. And I think it would be very helpful if we could have some idea of what the cost would be, so we can put a number on it and then uh, 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 perhaps uh, a more accurate assessment made of the cost side of it in terms of loss of other services. And as I say, I am just so aware of how much uh, our health service is struggling at the moment. Uh, and I am fearful of some sort of top slicing. Already there, there is huge pressures, uh, particularly in health, but also there are pressures on other, a range of other departments. Let's acknowledge there are a wide range of pressures on virtually every, de every department where uh, quite significant cuts uh, have had to be implemented. Uh, and the outworkings of that is yet really to be fully seen. So where the challenge to yourselves, those who wish to support this amendment, is where do you believe and how much money will be required to fund this and where will it come from? I can give the where. The where is the top-up fund that's been set aside for the amendments, the proposed changes to the welfare reform bill. £70 million. I propose it's taken out a lot. Top-up fund is a wonderful line, but you'll find that there are many calls on the top-up fund, and I am fearful that there may not be enough money left. It, probably if you were to add all the members' own individual amendments, it may well exceed the top-up fund, so perhaps the members should carry out that exercise. But maybe the minister could, could tell us in this debate, I, I wish to pro progress some, please, what level of support will be offered uh, uh, to people uh, affected by time-limiting ESA? Will support to be offered to former claimants who then do not qualify for income-related ESA? What, what level of support will be available to them? Will it be 100%, 75%, 50%? Nevertheless, and even in the absence of this crucial information from the Department, the Ulster Unionist Party will not be in a position to support this, this amendment from the, from the SDLP. As I said, what will be the cost be and where will the money come from? There are other amendments, uh, and I look at number, uh, amendment number 28, with regard to ESA youth claimants. Uh, it certainly was a much more affordable proposal, especially after the Department had previously told the Assembly of a scan of ESA live loads two years ago revealed that of the 28 contribution-based ESA youth cases, 16 were in support group, and therefore uh, would be, uh, many would be unaffected by, by, by the changes. There is a wider fairness issue, however, not least consideration of the fact that, as far as uh, I know of, no other contributory benefit forfeits its criteria based on the age of claimants. Number, uh, amendment number 29 re requires uh, some clarification. I believe limited work, limited capability for work, 
is already a key criterion for each ESA. And I trust that Mr Agnew will detail what exactly his proposed amendment would do to either supplement or improve what is already the case. Amendment number 42 from the SDLB is, I believe, a very genuine attempt to try and retain some influence to what we can all accept is an important matter, but which, what is, but which at present we have limited local feed-in. The benefit cap was a key DFP policy, and one which my party has on the whole generally supported. Nevertheless, I do think that the SDLP's proposal of exempting some of the key supports especially child benefit and carers allowance, uh, that, that, they, that they mean well with it. It is my own uh, opinion that carers already uh, facing financial hardship and difficulties, not least um, um, what happens to when they reach pensionable age and that caring a component uh, uh, comes to an end. However, this is not the place to try and make these changes, and I would argue that it should be at Westminster. And if we try to start moving benefits in or out of the overall cap, it will inevitably lead to an unequal system between ourselves and the rest of the UK. And if the cap needs changed, it should be changed for the entire UK. Again, the amendment here today would have a clear and not insignificant financial implications, i.e. additional cost to our limited block grant and the additional loss of public services. I am aware that Amendment Number 48 from the Ulster Unionist Party has generated quite a bit of interest, not least in the independent advice sector itself. But let me uh, make it clear that I understand that the Department, on the whole, does supply, provide support to the independent advice sector. However, that is because uh, it is absolutely essential that it does. Without independent advice, there would be fewer people claiming their fair entitlement. There would be more people submitting inaccurate or erroneous claims. Many may be unable to claim their entitlement, and quite possibly there would be gridlock within the system and there would be severe hardship with many. Our independent advice centre, and we can all think of our local offices in our local towns, and I myself think of the Citizens Advice Bureau in, in Carrick, Fergus, Larne and, and, and Newton Abbey, how they contribute and help the system run smoothly. And I certainly don't believe that they in any way undermine the work already carried out by the uh, Social Security Agency offices. It often complements them. Our amendment would simply give it a statutory footing. It wouldn't necessarily mean more money. It may mean some. It wouldn't mean more bureaucracy. I expect, in fact, the only difference that our amendment, uh, if it is supported and, and, and approved, would be that it would uh, help focus minds in the department to ensure that there are no blind spots in terms of advice, either by them or the independent sector across Northern Ireland. With that statutory requirement, they would have to do that. He has already accepted that uh, there is considerable investment goes into advice uh, giving. Uh, across the board, and you know, a lot of us very professional. But would you accept that once you put anything on a statutory footing, it is not correct to say there will be not costs involved in that? Because once it's in a statutory footing, you've got to make sure that it is done. You've got to monitor how it's done. You've got to ensure that since there is now a legal requirement that people get advice, that they are getting advice, and we all know that once you put things on that kind of footing, a whole raft of bureaucracy builds around it, and indeed, instead of having money spent on giving advice, we have money sp spent on making sure that the statutory duty is met. Well, I actually think that it would be useful if there was a requirement for the department to monitor what is being done and to ensure that that support is being delivered on the wide range of, of subjects. Uh, and therefore, uh, I believe there is merit uh, in the proposal. Um, uh, there didn't, needn't necessarily be huge additional costs, but what there does need to be is someone spend some time to look very carefully at what level of advice and support is available 
uh, to claimants and to ensure that all areas are covered. I'm not entirely sure why the DUP are so threatened by this proposal that they felt necessary to table a petition of concern to kill it. Uh, one thing for sure is uh, it's not the confident boost from the department that many advice organisations were hoping to see today. Again, I will stress that the tabling of the petition of concern is particularly bad-mannered after what was discussed at yesterday's meeting with the five parties. Before determining uh, uh, whether we move on Amendment No. 48, um, I will listen carefully to what the Minister has to say. We are, we are, yes, I will. Is it not also the case that this uh, chamber, this assembly in 2010, put into law the statutory right to advice in, to people in situations where there was a risk of and there, or there was homelessness. This assembly has already, in particular circumstances, and I'm sure it was a DSD minister who did that, put into law a statutory requirement to receive advice in respect of the issue of homelessness. Every citizen in Northern Ireland under PACE law is entitled to legal advice in the event that they are arrested further to a claim of criminal conduct. So it is not a matter of principle in terms of the life of this part of the world. It's not even a matter of principle when it comes to the law in respect of particular matters in this part of the world. Is that not a, a catalyst for the minister to respond positively to these amendments? I, I thank the member for drawing uh, the, that previous requirement uh, to members' attention. I think that's been very uh, helpful. Um, but moving on, we're satisfied with amendments number 51 and 52 from the minister, in which she proposes to replace the old discretionary elements of the social fund, such as the crisis loan and community care grants, with a new discretionary support scheme. It is essential that uh, this new scheme works effectively and efficiently that the people that it will support uh, and, and are likely to be some of the, most, the poorest and most vulnerable on, on our society find that help and support on a timely basis. Teething problems with the new system must be avoided as far as possible. People looking to avail of this scheme will often not be able to wait around for decisions. They, they will be in crisis within their lives. So prompt resolutions are absolutely essential and we hope that the new Commissioner will recognise uh, the urgency of the environment in which the new scheme will be operating, and we trust that this will be kept under review. Finally, the last two amendments to this group in relation to uh, number uh, 73. Uh, we have no hesitation whatsoever in opposing this, and I do wonder if the full range of potential consequences of this amendment were considered before it was tabled. A strap line built up around the early discussions of welfare reform is that people should always be better off in work than on benefits. As a broad policy priority, we agree. For too long, people were trapped in a system of welfare dependency, which did not benefit them financially to go out and find a job. The danger is, of course, that a culture of worklessness, worklessness can, can quickly build up uh, in, in homes. And that huge danger of it being passed to, from generation to generation. Universal Credit is at least trying to rectify this. However, what Amendment No. 73 would do is to take away the incentive for people who are declaring to be self-employed to try and increase their paid income. Yes, I can see why initially there may be concerns about setting a minimum income floor, but we need to be pragmatic about it. Claimants should not be encouraged to undertake work. Or, sorry, claimants should be encouraged to undertake work, which makes them money, not which only keeps them occupied from day to day. Similarly, we'll, we will be opposing Amendment Number 75. This has been a live issue right from the moment the Assembly started considering the first draft bill in 2012. We have listened to the concerns of how. Uh, uh, EEA nationals, including those with disabilities, will be subject to work-related tests, when in some circumstances British nationals in the same situations will not. First of all, we need to remember that 
that this paragraph 7 in Schedule 1 has been lifted entirely from uh, the, the bill applying to the, the Great Britain and the rest of the United Kingdom. So it is wrong in principle anyone here sh uh, to claim that this assembly is seeking to license to discriminate. More importantly, however, we need to remember that our social security system is already not fully open to immigrants coming from other EU states. Instead, entitlement is very often based on whether or not they have a right to reside here. And this is assessed through the habitual residency test. I would be fearful of the consequences of the amendment were it to be accepted. Very quickly, we would put our entitlement uh, for support on a different footing in the eyes of the EU nationals than with the rest of the UK. EU citizens who come to Northern Ireland to work, uh, we all must welcome them uh, here so long as they strive to provide for themselves and their families, frequently contributing to the uh, local economy, filling many jobs that there may not be otherwise uh, filled by, by, by local employers. But we do not want to become a magnet for those who come to the UK not to work, but for benefits. If, this, if Northern Ireland has this variation, we would risk becoming a gateway uh, in terms of the United Kingdom for those who wish to enter the benefits system. And there is a potential of us attracting many more claimants who may come uh, to uh, join the benefits system. But of course, uh, we, we then risk uh, uh, much of the cost that will flow from their uh, 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 living in Northern Ireland, pressures on housing, uh, pressures on a whole range of services, and it's for that reason we need to think carefully, uh, and I would argue that we should be retaining the same levels uh, and guidance that is existing elsewhere, uh, so that those who want to work are attracted to Northern Ireland, not those who might want to join the benefit system. Thank you. Paul, Mr Mickey Brady. Last Concordia, um, I've sat here for nearly six hours. I've heard people preaching, I've heard people pontificating, and I've heard people, in some cases, talking absolute nonsense. But what I would ask, and I know Mrs. Kelly has come back into the chamber, I'm glad to see, and I would ask her and her colleagues, could they explain to me why, on the 17th of December, they signed up to an agreement with three other parties? not including Sinn Féin, I might add. That agreement, and I have it here, contained no protection for children with disabilities, contained no protection for adults with severe disabilities, contained a two-year two loss of benefit sanctions, and contained no supplementary payments fund in that agreement. Sinn Féin negotiated and had a detailed negotiation with the DUP and an agreement including five parties was signed on the 19th of the 12th. So after listening to Mr Atwood, um, and I have to say, him and Mrs Kelly and their party colleagues seem to have assumed the high moral ground. Well, all I can say is your view from that must be very, very blinkered, because we would like an explanation. And maybe you could explain to the House why you were prepared to sign such an agreement. You talk about protecting the most vulnerable. I would have thought children with disabilities, adults with severe disabilities, people who are going to be sanctioned for two years, they are not vulnerable. So uh, just maybe uh, at some stage we could get an answer to that particular question. Um, I mean, we, we should look forward to that. And if you want to give it now, I'm quite happy to give away. Because that's okay, right? You obviously, you need to think about it and, and consult and discuss. I can, I can understand that. Order, please. You know, just yeah. have to remind members that the chair is still here despite the lateness of the night, and all the remarks will be through the chair. Uh, certainly, last Concordia. Uh, in terms of that particular agreement, as I said, it contained a very little protection for vulnerable people. I move on to talk about the uh, particular uh, clauses and amendments. First of all, in, uh, dealing, and the other thing too, I just mentioned before, if you get, there's been a lot of talk about uh, petitions of concern. Now, if my memory serves me right, Mark Durkin, who's sitting here, who did sit on the DSD committee with us, a couple of years ago, he wanted to introduce a petition of concern. And the petition of concern would have killed the bill 
When we had bilateral meetings with his party, they wanted to kill the bill. Mr Ramsey in particular, kill the bill. What would that have meant? Direct rule, possibly? The introduction of the full implementation of welfare reform, student fees, water charges, prescription charges, and all the other attend ills and woes that come from a Tory government. Those are the people that are sitting pontificating and preaching to us today because th the reality of this is we would not have introduced a bill like this. But we are certainly, and I would say, and I'd say, and my colleague Fran McCann sitting beside me, we have been in the DSD committee since 2007, and our defence, we have stood resolute against the swinging cuts of welfare reform, so called. We have been resolute in that, and I'd challenge anybody to say that we haven't. No, I won't give you. No, you'll, you'll have your chance. Obviously, obviously, you're more prepared to talk than Mrs. Kelly at this particular moment in time, or Mr. Adwood. No, the member won't give way. You had your chance. You had your chance. Order, please. The, 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 member right. will, the member will resume his seat for a moment. Uh, can I repeat what I said a few minutes ago? The deputy chair is still here, and all remarks will be through the chair. Now, Mr. Brady, will you continue, please? Or am I got uh, last concordia? Yeah. <laughs> Order, please. I'm going to insist that this is done properly. You do not address anyone as you. You address your remark through the chair. I hope now the member is not challenging the chair. I'm sure he's not. Continue. Now that uh, the, Mrs Kelly seems to have got her story, uh, well, we think maybe she's got her story as to why they signed up to an agreement which doesn't offer the protections which the bill does now and the arrangements do now, maybe he would be generous enough to let her give the explanation to the House, because we're all waiting to hear it. I thank the Minister for his intervention. I think Mrs Kelly had her chance, and I'm sure she'll compose, or be composed and she'll have a long night to think about it. <laughs> Um, and I'm sure, no doubt, she'll come up with some sort of an answer. But the reality is that agreement was signed by the party on our left, which did not protect vulnerable people. And that message needs to go out for all their preaching and all their pontificating and all their attacks. That's, that's the reality. And I think we need to get that message out to people. Just uh, last Concordia to address uh, some of the clauses in terms of clause 52, which is dealing with the um, contributory ESA. Now, that uh, initially under the proposed welfare reform bill was only going to last for a year. People who worked for 30, 35, 40 years who became ill through no fault of their own were going to lose in terms of only getting one year's contributory benefit. My colleague, uh, the chairperson of the um, Social Development Committee has said that 80 per cent of people return to work within a year. But there are a lot of cancer patients, unfortunately, who have been working, who again, through no fault of their own, become ill, have to give up work for a limited period and obviously go through very traumatic treatment, etc., and may well need that extra time to get themselves back to where they can return to work. And I think that's essential. And I think that is something, because it's interesting, all the people who put in amendments and criticise today various aspects. None of them uh, were prepared not to admit that there was um, some good coming out of all of this and that there was uh, concessions, mitigation that had been obtained. And it's interesting in Mr Allister's uh, weird world, I have to say, in his utopia, nobody would be in benefit. Everybody would be out working, according to him. And his attack on vulnerable families is an absolute disgrace and he should be totally ashamed of himself. Nobody, in my experience, working with people in benefits for many, many years, nobody has ever come in on a Monday morning and said, I love being in income support. It doesn't work like that. People do not want to be in benefit. There are many, many reasons why people are in benefit. Historically, even Lord Freud, the inimitable Lord Freud when he was here, uh, agreed that we had higher rates of disability in the North. We have uh, a society that's coming out of conflict. There are many, many reasons why people are in benefit. And I don't think it's incumbent upon any of us to stand up here and criticise them for no good reason. So I would, I would argue that the Clause 52 in relation, which the, I think the Minister has introduced, um, 
is, is a good clause in the sense that it extends the period that a person can get contributory ESA. In terms of the bedroom tax, the bedroom tax has been much talked about. It doesn't work. It's been proven in Scotland where uh, housing associations have built loads of houses with three, bedroom, uh, with three bedrooms. People won't move in them because of the bedroom tax. So um, housing associations cannot service their loans. They're left with empty houses. Some of them will probably end up going to the wall. That's the reality of the bedroom tax. Historically, we have had three and four bedroom houses built over many years. When the Housing Executive came in to brief us initially in the committee about the bedroom tax, they admitted that if the bedroom tax had been introduced the next day, it would take at least six years, at least six years, for the, the um, proper houses to be built. We also live in a society that, unfortunately, has housing segregation. I mean, there are people, I'm sure, in North Belfast who could probably move into other areas in North Belfast, but because of the society we live in, it becomes next to impossible for them. So the bedroom tax, and in terms of, of the mitigation, I think that has succeeded because there is a supplementary payment fund, which my friends on the left here signed up not to have initially. Um, so, um, no, the member won't give away. And in, term, in terms of the um, bedroom tax, I think that has been neutralised. That has been neutralised and will continue to be neutralised so I think that is a very, very good thing for those vulnerable people that we've all been talking about today. In terms of um, Clause 51 and 52, the discretionary payments, basically the social fund has been abolished. It's been abolished in Britain. What has happened has gone to local authorities. Some of them uh, service it in a good way. Some of them don't bother. Some of the money that is uh, set aside for that purpose goes to other things. So I think it's a good thing that we had an opportunity to be innovative about and have a discretionary fund and also to have a discretionary uh, fund commissioner. And I think that is a very, very good thing because it gives that independence, much the same as a social fund commissioner. Because when people actually started to take um, community care grant disallowances to the second and third stage in terms of social fund commissioner, up to 49% of decisions at local offices were overturned. So that can only be a good thing. So, yeah, but there, there, there are many areas in, in this bill um, that obviously, as I said before, we would not, it's not a bill we would have taken. But the point is there has been progress, there has been good progress in many areas. And what I would say is the other thing that has been um, looked at in terms of not just people who are unemployed, because we mentioned contributory ESA, but also those who are termed as a working poor, approximately 90,000 here in the north, they are going to be um, helped as well in terms of discretionary fund people in low incomes. Because one of the things I would say in finishing, there are no benefits that we are in control of where people will be worse off. And I think that's true to say. There are other areas like that HRMRC uh, control, like tax credits, child tax credits and child benefit and areas like that. But where we have control over benefits, nobody will lose out. And I want to make that point. Gornemila Call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Uh, or Deputy Speaker, and maybe if I could just deal with some of the um, points which have been raised, because most of the amendments we have been dealing with so far and, uh, uh, have been those amendments put forward by the SDLP. And I think, as the previous speaker has pointed out, there is a degree of grandstanding here by the SDLP, and especially in relation to some of the issues which they are responsible f have been responsible for themselves, and uh, which uh, now suddenly they have had a conversion on, uh, either because of the opposition which there has been, or I think maybe more because there is simply the unprincipled uh, stance which they have taken, namely they see a chance to have a poke at um, Sinn Féin. Uh, on some of these issues and uh, are, are taking it now, despite the fact that it's totally irrational, uh, given their previous stance. And I want to start off with Clause 69, because we, have, we didn't get an explanation from the SDLP on this. That, I mean, first of all, Clause 69 and their desire to have it removed from this bill has already been dealt with. I mean, it couldn't be clearer. There is a commitment by the minister 
There's a commitment by the executive, and furthermore, the executive has already earmarked all of the funds which are required to make sure that anyone in the public sector who falls foul of the loss of the spare room subsidy, that they will be recompensed for that. They will not be forced to move. And I'll give, I will give way, yes. And if you listened to Mrs Kelly earlier on, it not only became uh, the, the problem that it hasn't uh, been removed, but even the mitigation, because it only lasts five or six years, that's become the problem for her now also. Yeah, well, you know, of course, there was no mitigation. And here's the point. There was no mitigation, nor indeed because I don't suspect that Mrs Kelly wants to remind the people who live in the private sector. So there's no proposals from her to mitigate against the effect of the introduction of the spare room subsidy by her colleague who is sitting beside her when he was quite happy to introduce it in this assembly for a sector where the rents are higher, where people are equally under pressure, and yet the, 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 the subsidy that they lose there is much bigger than the subsidy that will be lost in the, the, the private sector. But no call for mitigation there. In fact, let's quickly move on and forget about that. Because our involvement, or the SDLP's involvement, in that sordid little exercise where they claim the Tories have done this on the poor people of Northern Ireland, well, the Green Tories did that on them some time ago in the private sector when they introduced that, and not a whimper about it now. And indeed, when she, she, when she was given the opportunity to explain it, she didn't explain it. And if she wants me to give way now, I will give way now. But I suspect that I'll get no more of an explanation this time than I got the last time uh, from her. So, you know, let's, let, let's not have this nonsense peddled. I mean, the previous speaker was right. We're preached at by these sanctimonious braggarts on the other side, that we would not have done that. You are the bad people. We have actually provided a way out. It's only for five years, she says. Well, we, it, it may well extend for more than five years. That will be a choice for a future executive. The, 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 uh, yes, I will give way, yes, because I know he's been for some time now. And I would love to hear his words of wisdom. And maybe the explanation we'll have him receive from Mrs. Kelly, we're now going to receive from Mr. Durkin. Unlike uh, the members on my right, Ms. Kelly doesn't jump to the UP uh, demands. Uh, the, the, the member has said that the issue around Clause 69 couldn't be clearer. He refers to the mitigation measures that we have received commitments on. And I welcome the mitigation measures that we have received commitments on. However, they are not clear in what we are here to debate today. We are here today to debate legislation and to shape legislation. And those mitigation measures aren't clear in that. How could they be any clearer? Then, first of all, no one. I mean, this is this is not a commitment which was whispered in some corner, or part of some secret talks uh, uh, between the five party leaders. This is a commitment which has been made time and time again on the floor of this assembly, namely that those who are affected by the removal of the, bed, the, 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 the spare bedroom subsidy will have the the money paid to their housing benefit. Furthermore, not that we will do it if we can find the funds, but a commitment has been made to provide the, I can't remember what the figure was now, but I think it was £17 million um, in the, the, the first year, that that money has been committed um, and has been publicly committed here in the Assembly, time and time again. The Finance Minister said it, the Social Development Minister said it, the First Minister has said it, the Deputy First Minister has said it. So, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult to say there's been no commitment given um, on it. The, and, and, well, let me just finish the point. There is no provision, and you would not expect provision in this bill, on the face of this bill, 
to make a statement uh, about that. The commitment has been given, the money has been given, and the reason why it was for five years has also been given. Namely, that the whole idea is to try and, over that period, to build up a stock of houses which allow for the movement of people. Um, from uh, property which perhaps uh, uh, ha they, uh, they don't need to have as large as that and to give them the opportunity. But that can't be done at present, hence the reason why we had to mitigate against um, a change in welfare reform which was going to have uh, that particular impact. So, uh, you know, so uh, well, all I, would, uh, and I hope that we will then get from the SDLP some explanation as to why with all of that, they still feel a necessity to remove Clause 69 from the bill when that commitment has been given, and indeed when they are making no effort, giving no indication as to what they would do to help those people who are the victims of, of the measures introduced by their own minister. And maybe he will. I'll, I'll, I'll give way, and then I'll give way. And, and I, I thank the member for giving way. The member, should, the member who has asked the question in relation to uh, the, the issue and is supporting the amendment to remove Clause 69 will be aware that I have given the commitment to the executive that we will bring forward the scheme which will go to the executive, but listen, it's going to go further because it will then be going out to public consultation. So it won't be something that's done in the dark. It won't be something that is some way clouded in secrecy. And the public will see. But there seems to be a failure in this House today to understand the reasons as to why we had to do things in the way that we're doing them. I go back to the point that I made earlier. There was, a, and I think the member has alluded to it earlier on, there was an attempt to kill off the bill at the very start. And if that had happened, then all of this would not, well, this place wouldn't be here, I think that's one. But then, secondly, you would have had welfare without any changes, any modifications, and any help. I thank the member for, for uh, the minister for that information, and uh, I'll, I will give way to the. I uh, thank the member for giving way, and again, I welcome the commitment from the minister. But will the member accept? That people have had commitments before and people have heard commitments before. He referred, in fact, obviously to commitments from his own party colleagues on the issue of bedroom tax and then indeed the commitment from the Deputy First Minister on bedroom tax. Would the member agree that this isn't the first commitment that the Deputy First Minister has given on bedroom tax, given that at his Ardesh in 2013 he gave a commitment to deploy a petition of concern to block the bedroom tax? Well, I, I, I don't know when the date of that uh, particular meeting was, but all I can say is that it has been, if, if such a commitment, and he, he can answer for himself rather than me answer, rather than me answer for him, but the one point we'd make is this, that there is no need for a petition of concern against this, for the simple reason that the impact of it has been removed. It's been removed by the commitment of resources, by the promise of the minister, and by the, 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 the fact that um, the executive collectively, and indeed the five party leaders, have agreed uh, this particular issue. Let me come to the. Uh, just, uh, just a, 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 well, I, I will give way on the understanding that, mis, that Mr. Atwood is now going to either repent of his former sins against the tenants in the private sector or give us an explanation as to why he believes that the treatment of the private sector tenants was, should be different from the, 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 the um, tenants in the public sector. And I hope I'm, I'm giving way on that basis, though I suspect, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I am wasting my time. <laughs> The, uh, could I th thank the member for, um, for giving way, and in order to prove his worst fears true, could you confirm something? You and I sat around the executive table for a period, and you and some of your colleagues were the most insistent, the most insistent, that the welfare reform bill was brought through the executive onto the floor of this, uh, this chamber. 
and I never heard once from you, Mr. Wilson. In all Our order, sorry. please. Through the chair and no finger pointing. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I didn't hear from the member opposite once in endless meetings of the executive, week after week after week, when he and his DUP colleagues were saying, get this bill on the table uh, into the chamber and through the legislative processes. And not once did Mr. Wilson say there was any need or any reason or any money to mitigate the bedroom tax. Not once. And now he makes a virtue tonight yeah. to quote the, the former minister to mitigate what that was that was going to have to mitigate what was going to have that impact in his reference to the bedroom tax. Not once, Mr. Wilson, did you ever make that argument in all your time when you were DFP Order, minister? Please. Well, for the record, so it is on the record. First of all, not only did I make the point here, I also made the point during debates at Westminster. I signed early day motions to the effect at Westminster. And indeed, if the member remembers rightly, I was actually finance minister when the 70, 17 million pounds was made available to the executive for the mitigation of the, 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 uh, the, the bedroom tax, as he calls it. So, you know, he's wrong in all of those accounts, but we still have total silence from him as to why he introduced this tax on the private rented sector tenants of Northern Ireland. He has not repented of it. He has not explained it. He is not prepared to do anything about it. He has not put any amendments down to alleviate it. Because, and I think that that's perhaps the more telling, um, the more telling issue. Oh, well, give away, yes, because I'm sure you want to have we go at him. I was, I was, <laughs> given the number of times a member has given away, I had fairly good confidence that he would actually give away once more, even though we're coming to the close of the debate for this evening. But would the member agree with me that it's actually quite interesting I'm not ludicrous that we listen to the SDLP here talking today about the need to have a debate, which is obviously in, uh, very important to do that, but to talk about the need to tease this out, need to probe that out. But in actual fact, when Mrs Ritchie, who was a then minister in June 2007, rushed the first welfare reform bill through this House by way of accelerated passage on the basis of the need to protect parity. So there was no mitigating measures there but parity. There was no opportunity for anybody to put an amendment or nobody, no opportunity for anybody there to seek clarification. So there was a bill rushed through here, the first welfare reform bill, which is um, causing people to suffer today as we speak, never mind the latest one, was introduced by an SDLP minister by way of accelerated passage with no mitigation measures whatsoever. Well, I remember because I, had, I hadn't quite uh, remembered that point. It's not very often that he and I do a double act. It's usually head to head stuff, you know. But, but he, has, he, has, he has made a very, very important point there. And I suppose once again, it torpedoes the, uh, the, 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 the case which the SDLP are making um, under the waterline. Uh, let me just come to a couple of other amendments because there, there were a number of other amendments which the, uh, Mrs. Kelly uh, brought forward. And she. She told us what the amendment said, which we could have all read anyway, but gave no explanation as to why she believed that the amendments were justified. The three days extended to seven days. There was no mention there as to why she believed it was essential. It is no different, actually, than people, um, as the, the, um, the, the, the member, uh, Mr. Beggs pointed out, no different, actually, from people who go into work for the first week and sometimes even have to do a lying week. Um, that, 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 you know, yet she, um, <coughs> she wanted to introduce a, a, a costly measure which would have added significantly to, to bureaucracy um, to deal with people and make a, a benefits available to them after three days. Also an amendment at 27, and I don't understand this one, why she believes young people should be treated differently from any other people. And indeed, this is true of some of Mr. Um, Mr. Igmew's amendments, which I'm sure he's going to come on to um, later on. I thought the whole idea was to ensure that young people did not, at an early stage, get into a culture of benefits, 
where we got generational unemployment. And yet it seems there are a number of amendments here that want to see young people treated even uh, more generously than people who are, who are older when it comes to the benefit system. And I'm not going to go through all Mr Agnew's amendments, but there's a common thread running through here. And, you know, if we, we, we're wanting to encourage people into work, it is easier to encourage people into work before they get into the inertia of long-term unemployment. And yet it seems that a number of these uh, um, amendments for entitlements are designed just to do that, to be more generous. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to get away on, on uh, these points uh, because I think we're going to finish fairly, uh, fairly soon. The, the other amendment, um, again, no explanation was given. Her um, opposition to Clause 61, SDLP's opposition to Clause 61, and of course, Mr. News in the same boat here, where, um, the, where the, 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 the ability because this is what the, the clause actually does. It gives the ability for the department to find out whether anyone has a right to reside because they are actively seeking work. Now, that's the, that's the, the requirement that there would be for a citizen living in this country. If you're not actively seeking work, then you'll not be entitled to benefit. Yet, the effect of the change would be to remove the ability of the department to do that for people who come from outside the United Kingdom. And we already know the, 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 the anger that there is, that some people, and in many cases are wrong, but they believe that people from outside Northern Ireland are treated differently <coughs> um, from people who live within Northern Ireland and who are, are, are treated more generously. This, th th this amendment actually would have that effect. And uh, again, no explanation was given. Um, to, uh, other than it was, in, it was introduced um, by, the, um, by um, uh, uh, Mrs. Kelly. The, 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 well, I think that since the member is going to have an opportunity and hopefully will have an opportunity at, uh, later on in the debate to give the explanation, and since we're going to finish fairly soon, I, I don't think that I, I want to give way on, um, on, on that one. Uh, the, the, the other one, and I, again, I've got to say, I don't have a great deal of sympathy for the, uh, the, the, the cap, um, or for, for, for um, uh, lifting the cap on, on benefits. I do think that if we're, if we're going to um, encourage people into work, <coughs> then we must make work pay. And the, the fact that uh, I, I know that uh, the SDLP um, voted against <coughs> the, um, the, the, the uh, the tightening of the cap when it came to uh, at Westminster. I didn't understand their explanation then. I don't understand their explanation now. But the removal of, for example, carers allowance and child benefit, which really is an additional source of income <coughs> to people um, because they are caring for um, a, a, a child or a parent or whatever, and <coughs> child benefit. Um, to, to remove them from the, the, the benefit when calculating the cap is removing a source of income. And you know, I think that many people query uh, just whether or not that there, it, it is right that someone on benefits should be earning or should, uh, should have the, the, the possibility of getting more than um, someone who is in a job um, and earning not even the, the average wage. Um, in Northern Ireland, and for that reason, I, I can't under. And again, no explanation was to given was given as to why those particular issues should be um, removed from benefit when calculating the, the, the cap. I believe that it is important that we get this into perspective where there is genuine need. Of course, even the government's own proposals, um, where there's genuine disability, the, gen the government's own proposals allow people to have benefits beyond the cap level. Um, and I think that's right, but it has to be in very specific circumstances and uh, very controlled circumstances. Um, Mr. Beggs uh, talked about Amendment 48 and why we, he used the rather dramatic uh, um, uh, 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 words, why did we find the need to kill it? Well, it wasn't a case of killing it, it was simply a case, was, we, we have made our, our, our position clear on Amendment 48. Of course, there needs to be advice. Considerable money is spent by the department already for advice-giving uh, institutions, but I still maintain that once you make something statutory, then a whole industry grows up around, first of all, ensuring it's in place, 
monitoring it, measuring it, ensuring that uh, the, the, the right quality is, is there and everything else. I believe that the independent uh, way in which it's done at present, and of course, this is the other point. Once you make it statutory and the money comes from the department, the real danger is it's no longer seen as independent. It's seen as an extension of the department. At least the advice giving that we have at the moment is seen as independent from the department, albeit the money comes from the department, but since it's not a statutory obligation, and there, there, there is not the, um, the, the uh, statutory link between the advice givers and the department, uh, therefore it, it is seen as, as more independent. For that reason, it's not a case of killing it, it's simply a case of using um, common sense that, yes, we have to give advice, but let's keep it in a way where the money goes to the advice givers and not to, the, to uh, setting up a new set of bureaucracy. Order. The Business Committee agreed that the House would not sit later than 10 o'clock this evening and would resume at 10.30 tomorrow morning. This would seem to be a convenient moment at which to suspend. The sitting is therefore suspended until 10.30 tomorrow.